Chapter One of the Red Room. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Peck. The Red Room by August Strindberg. Translated by Ellie Schlissner. Chapter One A Bird's Eye View of Stockholm. It was an evening in the beginning of May. The little garden on Moses Height, on the south side of the town, had not yet been thrown open to the public, and the flower beds were still unturned. The snowdrops had worked through the accumulations of last year's dead leaves, and were on the point of closing their short career, and making room for the crocuses, which had found shelter under a barren pear tree. The elder was waiting for a southerly wind before bursting into bloom but the tightly closed buds of the limes still offered cover for love-making to the chaffinches, busily employed in building their lichen-covered nest between trunk and branch. No human foot had trod the gravel path since last winter's snow had melted, and the free and easy life of beasts and flowers was left undisturbed. The sparrows industriously collected all manner of rubbish and stowed it away under the tiles of the navigation school. They burdened themselves with scraps of the rocket cases of last autumn's fireworks, and picked the straw covers off the young trees transplanted from the nursery in the deer park only a year ago. Nothing escaped them. They discovered shreds of muslin in the summer arbors. The splintered leg of a seat supplied them with tufts of hair left on the battlefield by dogs which had not been fighting there since Josephine's day. What a life it was! The sun was standing over the Lilia home, throwing sheaves of rays towards the east. The rays pierced the calms of smoke at Bergson, flashed across the Ritterford, climbed to the cross of the Ritterholm's church, flung themselves onto the steep roof of the German church opposite, toyed with the bunting displayed by the boats on the pontoon bridge, sparkled in the windows of the chief custom house, illuminated the woods of the lighting island, and died away in a rosy cloud far, far away in the distance where the sea was. And from thence the wind came, and traveled back by the same way, over Vaxholm, past the fortress, past the custom house, and along Sickler Island, forcing its way in behind the Haster home, glancing at the summer resorts, then out again and on, on to the hospital Danakin. There it took fright, and dashed away in a headlong career along the southern shore, noticing the smell of coal, tar, and fish oil came dead against the city quay, rushed up to the Moses height, and swept into the garden, and buffeted against the wall. The wall was opened by a maidservant, who, at the very moment, was engaged in peeling off the paper pasted over the chinks of the double windows. A terrible smell of dripping, beer drags, pine needles, and sawdust poured out, and was carried away by the wind, while the maid stood breathing the fresh air through her nostrils. The wind plucked the cut and wool, strewn with barberry berries, tinsel, and rose leaves from the space between the windows, and danced it along the paths, joined by sparrows and chaffinches, who saw here the solution of their greater part of their housing problem. Meanwhile, the maid continued her work at the double windows. In a few minutes, the door leading from the restaurant stood open, and a man, well but plainly dressed, stepped out into the garden. There was nothing striking about his face beyond a slight expression of care and worry, which disappeared as soon as he had emerged from the stuffy room and caught sight of the wide horizon. He turned to the side from whence the wind came, opened his overcoat, and repeatedly drew a deep breath, which seemed to relieve his heart and lungs. Then he began to stroll up and down the barrier, which separated the garden from the cliffs in the direction of the sea. Far below him lay the noisy, reawakening town. The steam cranes whirred in the harbor. The iron bars rattled in the iron weighing machine. The whistles of the lock keeper shrilled. The steamers at the pontoon bridge smoked. The omnibuses rumbled over the uneven paving stones. Noise and uproar in the fish market. Sails and flags on the water outside. The screams of the seagulls. Bugle calls from the dockyard the turning out of the guard, the clattering of the wooden shoes of the working men. All this produced an impression of life and bustle, 
which seemed to rouse the young man's energy. His face assumed an expression of defiance, cheerfulness, and resolution, and, as he leaned over the barrier and looked at the town below, he seemed to be watching an enemy. His nostrils expanded, his eyes flashed, and he raised his clenched fist as if he were challenging or threatening the poor town. The bells of St. Catherine's chimed seven. The splenetic treble of St. Mary seconded. The basses of the great church and the German church joined in, and soon the air was vibrating with the sound made by the seven bells of the town. Then, one after the other, relapsed into silence, until far away in the distance only the last one of them could be heard, singing its peaceful, even song. It had a higher note, a purer tone, and a quicker tempo than the others. Yes, it had. He listened and wondered whence the sound came, for it seemed to stir up vague memories in him. All of a sudden his face relaxed, and his features expressed the misery of a forsaken child, and he was forsaken. His father and mother were lying in the churchyard of St. Clara's, from whence the bell could still be heard. And he was a child. He still believed in everything, truth and fairy tales alike. The bell of St. Clara's went silent, and the sound of footsteps on the gravel path roused him from his reverie. A short man with side whiskers came towards him from the veranda. He wore spectacles, apparently more for the sake of protecting his glances than his eyes, and his malicious mouth was generally twisted into a kindly, almost benevolent expression. He was dressed in a neat overcoat with defective buttons, a somewhat battered hat, and trousers hoisted at half-mass. His walk indicated assurance as well as timidity. His whole appearance was so indefinite that it was impossible to guess at his age or social position. He might just as well have been an artisan as a government official. His age was anything between twenty-nine and forty-five years. He was obviously flattered to find himself in the company of the man whom he come to meet, for he raised his bulging hat with unusual ceremony and smiled his kindest smile. "'I hope you haven't been waiting, Assessor.' "'Not for a second. It's only just struck seven. Thank you for coming. I must confess this meeting is of the greatest importance to me.' I might almost say it concerns my whole future, Mr. Struve. Bless me. Do you mean it? Mr. Struve blinked. He had come to drink a glass of toddy, and was very little inclined for a serious conversation. He had his reasons for that. We shall be more undisturbed if we have our toddy outside, if you don't mind, continued the assessor. Mr. Struve stroked his right whisker, put his hat carefully on his head, and thanked the assessor for his invitation, but he looked uneasy. To begin with, I must ask you to drop the assessor, began the young man. I've never been more than a regular assistant, and I cease to be even that from today. I'm Mr. Falk, nothing else. What? Mr. Struve looked as if he had lost a distinguished friend, but he kept his temper. You're a man with liberal tendencies, Mr. Struve tried to explain himself, but Falk continued. I ask you to meet me here in your character of contributor to the liberal red cap. Good heavens, I'm such a very unimportant contributor. I've read your thundering articles on the working man's question and all other questions which nearly concern us. We're in the year three in Roman figures, for it is now the third year of the new parliament and soon our hopes will have become realities. I've read your excellent biographies of our leading politicians in The Peasant's Friend, the lives of those men of the people who have at last been allowed to voice what oppressed them for so long. You're a man of progress, and I've a great respect for you. Struve, whose eyes had grown dull, instead of kindling at the fervent words, seized with pleasure the proffered safety valve. I must admit, he said eagerly, that I am immensely pleased to find myself appreciated by a young and, I must say it, excellent man like you, assessor. But, on the other hand, why talk of such grave, not to say sad things, 
when we're sitting here in the lap of nature on the first day of spring while all the buds are bursting and the sun is pouring his warmth on the whole creation let's snap our fingers at care and drink our glass in peace excuse me i believe i'm your senior and i venture to propose therefore falk who like a flint had gone out in search of steel realized that he had struck wood he accepted the proposal without eagerness and the new brothers sat side by side and all they had to tell each other was the disappointment expressed in their faces i mentioned a little while ago falk resumed that i've broken today with my past life and thrown up my career as a government employee i'll only add that i intend taking up literature literature good heavens why oh but that is a pity it isn't but i want you to tell me how to set about finding work hmm that's really difficult to say the profession is crowded with so many people of all sorts but you mustn't think of it it really is a pity to spoil your career the literary profession is a bad one struve looked sorry but he could not hide a certain satisfaction at having met a friend in misfortune but tell me he continued why are you throwing up a career which promises a man honors as well as influence honors to those who have usurped the power and influence to the most unscrupulous stuff it isn't as bad as all that isn't it well then i must speak more plainly i'll show you the inner working of one of the six departments for which i had put down the first five i left at once for the very simple reason that there was no room for me whenever i went and asked whether there was anything for me to do i was told no and i never saw anybody doing anything and that was in the busy departments like the committee on brandy distilleries the direct taxation office and the board of administration of employees pensions but when i noticed the swarming crowd of officials the idea struck me that the department which had to pay out all the salaries must surely be very busy indeed i therefore put my name down for the board of payment of employees salaries and did you go there asked struve beginning to feel interested yes i shall never forget the great impression made on me by my visit to this thoroughly well-organized department i went there at eleven o'clock one morning because this is supposed to be the time when the office is open in the waiting room i found two young messengers sprawling on a table on their stomachs reading the fatherland the fatherland struve who had up to the present been feeding the sparrows with sugar pricked up his ears yes i said good morning a feeble wrangling of the gentlemen's backs indicated that they accepted my good morning without any decided displeasure one of them even went to the length of waggling the heel of his right foot which might have been intended as a substitute for a handshake i asked whether either of the gentlemen were disengaged and could show me the offices both of them declared that they were unable to do so because their orders were not to leave the waiting room i inquired whether there were any other messengers yes there were others but the chief messenger was away on a holiday the first messenger was on leave the second was not on duty the third had gone to the post the fourth was ill the fifth had gone to fetch some drinking water the sixth was in the yard where he remained all day long moreover no official ever arrived before one o'clock this was a hint to me that my early inconvenient visit was not good form and at the same time a reminder that the messengers also were government employees but when i stated that i was firmly resolved on seeing the offices so as to gain an idea of the division of labor in so important and comprehensive a department the younger of the two consented to come with me when he opened the door i had a magnificent view of a suite of sixteen rooms of various sizes there must be work here i thought congratulating myself on my happy idea of coming the crackling of sixteen birchwood fires in sixteen tiled stoves interrupted 
in the pleasantest manner the solitude of the place. Struve, who had become more and more interested, fumbled for a pencil between the material and lining of his waistcoat, and wrote sixteen on his left cuff. This is the adjunct's room, explained the messenger. I see. Are there many adjuncts in this department? I asked. Oh, yes, more than enough. What do they do all day long? Oh, they write, of course, a little. He was speaking familiarly, so that I thought it time to interrupt him. After wandering through the copyists, the notaries, the clerks, the controllers and his secretaries, the revisers and his secretaries, the public prosecutors, the registrar of exchequers, the master of the rolls and the librarians, the treasurers, the cashiers, the procurators, the protonotaries, the keeper of the minutes, the actuaries, the keeper of the records, the secretaries, the first clerks, and the head of the department's rooms, we came to a door which bore in gilt letters the words, The President. I was going to open the door, but the messenger stopped me, genuinely uneasy. He seized my arm and whispered, Shush! Is he asleep? I asked, my thoughts busy with an old rumor. For God's sakes, be quiet, the messenger replied. No one may enter here unless the President rings the bell. Does he often ring? I asked. No, I've never heard him ringing in my time, and I've been here twelve months. He was again inclined to be familiar, so I said no more. About noon the adjuncts began to arrive, and to my amazement I found in them nothing but old friends from the Committee on Brandy Distilleries and the Board of Administration of Employees' Pensions. My amazement grew when the register from the Inland Revenue Office strolled into the actuary's room and made himself as comfortable in his easy chair as he used to do in the Inland Revenue Office. I took one of the young men aside and asked him whether it would not be advisable for me to call on the President. Shush! was his mysterious reply while he took me into room number eight. Again this mysterious shush! The room which we had just entered was quite as dark as the rest of them, but it was much dirtier. The horsehair stuffing was bursting through the leather covering of the furniture. Thick dust lay on the writing table. By the side of an inkstand, in which the ink had dried long ago, lay an unused stick of sealing wax, with the former owner's name marked on it in Anglo-Saxon letters. In addition, there was a pair of paper shears, whose blades were held together by rust a date rack which had not been turned since midsummer five years ago, a state directory five years old, a sheet of blotting paper with Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar written all over it, a hundred times at least, alternating with as many Father Noahs. This is the office of the master of the rolls. We shall be undisturbed here, said my friend. Doesn't the master of the rolls come here then? I asked. He hasn't been here these five years, and now he's ashamed to turn up. But who does his work? The librarian. But what is his work in a department like the Board of Payment of Employees' Salaries? The messengers sort the three seats, chronologically and alphabetically, and send them to the bookbinders. The librarian supervises their being placed on shelves, specially adapted for the purpose. The conversation now seemed to amuse Struve. He scribbled a word every now and then on his cuff, and, as Falk paused, he thought it incumbent on him to ask an important question. But how did the master of the rolls get his salary? It was sent to his private address. Wasn't that simple enough? However, my young friend advised me to present myself to the actuary, and to ask him to introduce me to the other employees, who were now dropping in to poke the fires in their tiled stoves and to enjoy the last glimmer of the glowing wood. My friend told me that the actuary was an influential and good-natured individual, very susceptible to little courtesies. I, who had come across him in his character as registrar of the exchequer, had formed a different opinion of him, but believing that my friend knew better, I went to see him. The redoubtable actuary sat in a capacious easy chair, with his feet on a reindeer skin. 
he was engaged in seasoning a real maraschon pipe sewn up in soft leather so as not to appear idle he was glancing at yesterday's post acquainting himself in this way with the wishes of the government my entrance seemed to annoy him he pushed his spectacles on to his bald head hiding his right eye behind the edge of the newspaper he shot a conical bullet at me with the left i proffered my request he took the mouthpiece of his meerschaum into his right hand and examined it to find out how far he had covered it the dreadful silence which followed confirmed my apprehensions he cleared his throat there was a loud hissing noise in the heap of glowing coal then he remembered the newspaper and continued his perusal of it i judged it wise to repeat my request in a different form he lost his temper what the devil do you want what are you doing in my room can't i have peace in my own quarters what get out get out get out sir i say can't you see that i'm busy go to the proto-notary if you want anything don't come here bothering me i went to the proto-notary the committee of supplies was sitting it had been sitting for three weeks already the proto-notary was in the chair and three clerks were keeping the minutes the samples sent in by the purveyors lay scattered about on the tables around which all disengaged clerks copyists and notaries were assembled in spite of much diversity of opinion it had been agreed upon to order twenty reams of lacebo paper and after repeatedly testing their cutty capacity the purchase of forty-eight pairs of grand torp scissors which had been awarded a prize had been decided on the actuary held twenty-five shares in this concern the test writing with the steel nibs had taken a whole week and the minutes concerning it had taken up two reams of paper it was now the turn of the pen knives and the committee was intent on testing them on the leaves of the black table i propose ordering sheffield double blades number four without a corkscrew said the proto-notary cutting a splinter off the table large enough to light a fire with what does the first notary say he said the first notary who had cupped too deeply into the table had come across a nail and damaged an eskil stuna number two with three blades suggested buying the latter after everybody had given his opinion and alleged reasons for holding it adding practical tests the chairman suggested buying two gross of sheffields but the first notary protested and delivered a long speech which was taken down on record copied out twice registered sorted alphabetically and chronologically bound and placed by the messenger under the librarian's supervision on a specially adapted shelf this protest displayed a warm patriotic feeling its principal object was the demonstration of the necessity of encouraging home industries but this being equivalent to a charge brought against the government seeing that it was brought against one of its employees the proto-notary felt it his duty to meet it he started with a historical digression on the origin of the discount on manufactured goods at the word discount all the adjuncts pricked up their ears the proto-notary touched on the economic developments of the country during the last twenty years and went into such minute details that the clock on the Ritterholm's church struck two before he had arrived at his subject at the fatal stroke of the clock the whole assembly rushed from their places as if a fire had broken out when i asked a colleague what it all meant the old notary who had heard my question replied the primary duty of a government employee is punctuality sir at two minutes past two not a soul was left in one of the rooms we shall have a hot day tomorrow whispered a colleague as we went downstairs what in the name of fortune is going to happen i asked uneasily lead pencils he replied there were hot days in store for us sealing wax envelopes paper knives blotting paper string still it might all be allowed to pass for every one was occupied but a day came when there was nothing to do i took my courage in my hands and asked for work i was given seven reams of paper for making fair copies at home a feat by which i should deserve well of my country i did my work in a very short time but instead of receiving appreciation and encouragement i was treated with suspicion 
industrious people were not in favor. Since then, I've had no work. I'll spare you the tedious recital of a year's humiliations, the countless taunts, the endless bitterness. Everything which appeared small and ridiculous to me was treated with grave solemnity, and everything which I considered great and praiseworthy was scoffed at. The people were called the mob, and their only use was to be shot at by the army, if occasion should arise. The new form of government was openly reviled, and the peasants were called traitors. As a footnote, it should be noted, since the great reorganization of the public offices, this description is no longer true to life. Falk continued, I had to listen to this sort of thing for seven months. They began to suspect me, because I didn't join in their laughter and challenge me. Next time the opposition dogs were attacked, I exploded and made a speech, the result of which was that they knew where I stood, and that I was henceforth impossible. And now I shall do what so many other shipwrecks have done. I shall throw myself into the arms of literature. Struve, who seemed dissatisfied with the truncated ending, put the pencil back, sipped his toddy, and looked absent-minded. Nevertheless, he thought he ought to say something. My dear fellow, he remarked at last, you haven't yet learned the art of living. You will find out how difficult it is to earn bread and butter, and how it gradually becomes the main interest. One works to eat, and eats to be able to work. Believe me, who have wife and child, that I know what I'm talking about. You must cut your coat according to your cloth, you see, according to your cloth, and you've no idea what the position of a writer is. He stands outside society. His punishment for aspiring to stand above it, Falk replied. Moreover, I detest society, for it is not founded on a voluntary basis. It's a web of lies. I renounce it with pleasure. It's beginning to grow chilly, said Struve. Yes, shall we go? Perhaps we better. The flame of conversation had flickered out. Meanwhile, the sun had set, the half-moon had risen, and hung over the fields to the north of the town. Star after star struggled with the daylight, which still lingered in the sky. The gas lamps were being lighted in the town. The noise and uproar was beginning to die away. Falk and Struve walked together in the direction of the north, talking of commerce, navigation, the crafts, everything, in fact, which did not interest them. Finally, to each other's relief, they parted. Falk strolled down River Street towards the dockyard, his brain pregnant with new thoughts. He felt like a bird which had flown against a window pane and now lay bruised on the ground at the very moment when it had spread its wings to fly towards freedom. He sat down on a seat, listening to the splashing of the waves. A light breeze had sprung up and rustled through the flowering maple trees, and the faint light of the half-moon shone on the black water. Twenty, thirty boats lay moored on the quay. They tore at their chains for a moment, raised their heads one after the other, and dived down again underneath the water. Wind and waves seemed to drive them onward. They made little runs towards the bridge like a pack of hounds, but the chain held them in leash and left them kicking and stamping as if they were eager to break their loose. He remained in his seat till midnight. The wind fell asleep. The waves went to rest. The fettered boats ceased tugging at their chains. The maples stopped rustling, and the dew was beginning to fall. Then he rose and strolled home, dreaming to his lonely attic in the northeastern part of the town. That is what young Falk did. But old Struve, who on the same day had become a member of the staff of the Grey Bonnet, because the red cap had sacked him, went home and wrote an article for the notorious People's Flag, on the board of payment of employees' salaries, four columns at five crowns a column. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of the Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, Between Brothers. 
The flax merchant, Charles Nicholas Falk, son of the late flax merchant, one of the fifty elders of the Burgesses, captain of the infantry of militia, vestryman, and member of the board of administration of the Stockholm Fire Insurance, Charles John Falk, and brother of the former assessor and present writer, Arvid Falk, had a business, or as his enemies preferred to call it, a shop in Long Street East, nearly opposite Pig Street, so that the young man, who sat behind the counter, surreptitiously reading a novel, could see a piece of a steamer, the paddle box, perhaps, or the jib boom, and the crown of a tree on Shep's home, with a patch of sky above it, whenever he raised his eyes from his book. The shop assistant, who answered to the not unusual name of Anderson, and he had learnt to answer to it, had just, it was early in the morning, opened the shop, hung up outside the door a flax truss, a fish and an eel basket, a bundle of fishing rods, and a craw of unstripped quills. This done, he had swept the shop, strewn the floor with sawdust, and sat down behind the counter. He had converted an empty candle box into kind of a mouse trap, which he set with a hooked stick. Immediately on the appearance of his principal, or any of the latter's friends, the novel on which Anderson was intent dropped into the box. He did not seem afraid of customers. For one thing, it was early in the morning, and for another, he was not used to very many customers. The business had been established in the days of the late King Frederick. Charles Nicholas Falk had inherited this statement from his father, to whom it had descended from his grandfather. It had flourished and earned a good deal of money until a few years ago. But the disastrous chamber system killed trade, ruined all prospects, impeded all enterprise, and threatened all citizens with bankruptcy. So, at least, Falk said, others were inclined to believe that the business was mismanaged, to say nothing of the fact that a dangerous competitor had established himself close to the lock. Falk never talked of the decline of the business, if he could help it, and he was shrewd enough to carefully choose occasion and audience whenever he touched upon that string. If an old business connection expressed surprise in a friendly way at the reduced trade, he told him that his principal business was a wholesale trade in the provinces, and that he was looking upon the shop merely in the light of a signboard. Nobody doubted this, for he had behind the shop a small counting house, where he generally could be found when he was not in town or at the exchange. But it was quite another tale if any of his acquaintances, such as the notary or the schoolmaster, for instance, expressed the same unfriendly easiness. Then he blamed the bad times. The result of the new chamber system, this alone was to blame for the stagnation of trade. Anderson was disturbed in his reading by two or three boys who were standing in the doorway asking the price of the fishing rods. Looking out into the street, he caught sight of our Mr. Arvid Falk. Falk had lent him the book so that it could safely be left on the counter, and as his former playfellow entered the shop, he greeted him familiarly with a knowing look. Is he upstairs? asked Falk, not without a certain uneasiness. He's at breakfast, replied Anderson, pointing to the ceiling. A chair was pushed back on the floor above their heads. He's got up from the table now, Mr. Arvid. Both young men seemed familiar with the noise and its purport. Heavy creaking footsteps crossed the floor, apparently in all directions, and a subdued murmur penetrated through the ceiling to the listeners below. Was he at home last night? asked Falk. No, he was out. With friends or acquaintances? Acquaintances. Did he come home late? Very late. Do you think he'll be coming down soon, Anderson? I don't want to go upstairs on account of my sister-in-law. He'll be here directly. I can tell by his footsteps. A door slammed upstairs. They looked at each other significantly. Arvid made a movement toward the door, but pulled himself together. A few moments later, they heard sounds in the counting house. A violent cough shook the little room, and then came the well-known footsteps saying, Stamp, stamp! Stamp, stamp! Arvid went behind the counter and knocked at the door of the counting house. Come in! He stood before his brother, a man of forty who looked his age. He was fifteen years older than Arvid, and for that and other reasons he had accustomed himself to look upon his younger brother as a boy, towards whom he acted as a father. 
He had fair hair, a fair mustache, fair eyebrows, and eyelashes. He was rather stout, and that was the reason why his boots always creaked. They groaned under the weight of his thick-set figure. "'Oh, it's only you,' he said with good-natured contempt. This attitude of mine was typical of the man. He was never angry with those who, for some reason or other, could be considered his inferiors. He despised them. But his face expressed disappointment. He had expected a more satisfactory subject for an outburst. His brother was shy and modest, and never offered resistance, if he could possibly help it. "'I hope I'm not inconveniencing you, Brother Charles,' asked Arvid, standing on the threshold. This humble question disposed the brother to show benevolence. He helped himself to a cigar from his big, embroidered leather cigar case, offering his brother a smoke from a box which stood near the fireplace. That boxful, visitor cigars, as he frankly called them, and he was of a candid disposition, had been through a shipwreck, which made them interesting but did not improve them, and a sale by auction on the strand which had made them very cheap. "'Well, what is it you want?' asked Charles Nicholas, lighting his cigar and absentmindedly putting the match into his pocket. He could only concentrate his thoughts on one spot inside a not a very large circumference. His tailor could have expressed the size of it in inches after measuring him around the stomach. "'I want to talk business with you,' answered Arvid, fingering his unlighted cigar. "'Sit down,' commanded the brother." It was customary with him to ask people to sit down whenever he intended to take them to task. He had them under him, and it was more easy to crush them if necessary. "'Business? Are we doing business together?' he began. "'I don't know anything about it. Are you doing business? Are you?' "'I only meant to say that I should like to know whether there's anything more coming to me.' "'What, may I ask? Do you mean money?' said Charles Nicholas, jessingly, allowing his brother to enjoy the scent of his good cigar. As the reply, which he did not want, was not forthcoming, he went on. Coming to you? Haven't you received everything due to you? Haven't you yourself receded the account for the court of wards? Haven't I kept and clothed you since? To be strictly correct, haven't I made you a loan, according to your own wish, to be paid back when you are able to do so? I've put it all down in readiness for the day when you will be earning your livelihood, a thing which you've not done yet. I'm going to do it now, and that's why I'm here. I wanted to know whether there's still anything owing to me or whether I am in debt. The brother cast a penetrating look at his victim, wondering whether he had any mental reservations. His creaking boots began stamping the floor on a diagonal line between spittoon and umbrella stand. The trinkets on his watch chain tinkled, a warning to people not to cross his way. The smoke of his cigar rose and lay in long, ominous clouds, portentous of a thunderstorm, between tiled stove and door. He paced up and down the room furiously, his head bowed, his shoulders rounded, as if he were rehearsing a part. When he thought he knew it, he stopped short before his brother, gazed into his eyes with a long, glinting, deceitful look, intended to express both confidence and sorrow, and said, in a voice, meant to sound as if it came from the family grave in the churchyard of St. Clara's. You're not straight, Arvid. You're not straight. Who, with the exception of Anderson, who was standing behind the door listening, would not have been touched by those words spoken by a brother to a brother, fraught with the deepest brotherly sorrow. Even Arvid, accustomed from his childhood to believe all men perfect and himself alone unworthy, wondered for a moment whether he was straight or not. And as his education, by efficacious means, had provided him with a highly sensitive conscience, he found that he really had not been quite straight, or at least quite frank. When he asked his brother the not altogether candid question as to whether he wasn't a scoundrel, I've come to the conclusion, he said, that you cheated me out of a part of my inheritance. I've calculated that you charged too much for your inferior board and your cast-off clothes. I know that I didn't spend all my fortune during my terrible college days, and I believe that you owe me a fairly big sum. 
I want it now, and I request you to hand it over to me. A smile illuminated the brother's fair face, and with an expression so calm and a gesture so steady that he might have been rehearsing them for years, so as to be in readiness when his cue was given to him, he put his hand in his trousers pocket, rattled his bunch of keys before taking it out, threw it up and dexterously caught it again, and walked solemnly to his safe. He opened it more quickly than he intended, and perhaps than the sacredness of the spot justified took out a paper, lying ready to his hand, and evidently also waiting for its cue, and handed it to his brother. "'Did you write this? Answer me. Did you write it?' "'Yes.' Arvid rose and turned towards the door. "'Don't go. Sit down. Sit down.' If a dog had been present, it would have sat down at once. "'What's written here? Read it.' I, Arvid Falk, acknowledge and testify that I have received from my brother, Charles Nicholas Falk, who was appointed my guardian, my inheritance in full, amounting to, and so on. He was ashamed to mention the sum. You have acknowledged and testified a fact which you did not believe. Is that straight? No. Answer my question. Is that straight? No. Therefore, you have borne false witness. Ergo, you're a blackguard. Yes, that's what you are. Am I right? The part was too excellent, and the triumph too great, to be enjoyed without an audience. The innocently accused must have witnesses. He opened the door leading into the shop. Anderson, he shouted, answer this question. Listen to me. If I bear false witness, am I a blackguard or not? Of course you're a blackguard, sir, Anderson answered, unhesitatingly and with warmth. Do you hear? He says I'm a blackguard if I put my signature to a false receipt. What did I say? You're not straight, Arvid. You're not straight. Good-natured people often are blackguards. You have always been good-natured and yielding but I've always been aware that in your secret heart you harbored very different thoughts. You're a blackguard. Your father always said so. I say said, for he always said what he thought, and he was a straight man, Arvid, and that you are not. And you may be sure that if he were still alive, he would say, with grief and pain, You're not straight, Arvid. You are not straight. He did a few more diagonal lines, and it sounded as if he were applauding the scene with his feet. He rattled his bunch of keys as if he were giving the signal for the curtain to rise. His closing remarks had been so rounded off that the smallest addition would have spoilt the whole. In spite of the heavy charge which he had actually expected for years, for he had always believed his brother to be acting a part, he was very glad that it was over, happily over, well and cleverly over so that he almost felt gay, and even a little grateful. Moreover, he had a splendid chance of venting the wrath which had been kindled upstairs in his family on someone. To vent it on Anderson had lost its charm, and he knew better than to vent it on his wife. Arvard was silent. The education he had received had so intimidated him that he always believed himself to be in the wrong. Since his childhood, the great words upright, honest, sincere, true, had daily and hourly been drummed into his ears, so that they stood before him like a judge, continuously saying, Guilty! For a moment he thought that he must have been mistaken in his calculations, that his brother must be innocent, and he himself a scoundrel. But immediately after he realized that his brother was a cheat, deceiving him by a simple lawyer's trick. He felt prompted to run away fearful of being drawn into a quarrel, to run away without making his request number two, and confessing that he was on the point of changing his profession. There was a long pause. Charles Nicholas had plenty of time to recapitulate his triumph in his memory. That little word, blackguard, had done his tongue good. It had been as pleasant as if he had said, Get out! And the opening of the door, Anderson's reply, and the production of the paper, Everything 
had passed off splendidly. He had not forgotten the bunch of keys on his night table. He had turned the key in the lock without any difficulty. His proof was binding as a rope. The conclusion he had drawn had been the baited hook by which the fish had been caught. He had regained his good temper. He had forgiven, nay, he had forgotten, and as he slammed the door of the safe, he shut away the disagreeable story forever. But he did not want to part from his brother in this mood. He wanted to talk to him on other subjects, throw a few shovelfuls of gossip on the unpleasant affair, see him under commonplace circumstances, sitting at his table, for instance, and why not, eating and drinking? People always looked happy and content when they were eating and drinking. He wanted so to see him happy and content. He wanted to see his face calm, listen to his voice speaking without a tremor, and he resolved to ask him to luncheon. But he felt puzzled how to lead up to it, find a suitable bridge across the gulf. He searched his brain, but found nothing. He searched his pockets and found the match. Hang it all! You've never lit your cigar, old boy! he exclaimed with genuine, but not feigned, warmth. But the old boy had crushed his cigar during the conversation so that it would not draw. Look here, take another, and he pulled out his big leather case. Here, take one of these. They are good ones. Arvid, who unfortunately could not bear to hurt anybody's feelings, accepted it gratefully, like a hand offered in reconciliation. Now, old boy, continued Charles Nicholas, talking lightly and pleasantly, an accomplishment at which he was an expert. Let's go to the nearest restaurant and have lunch. Come along. Arvid, unused to friendliness, was so touched by these advances that he hastily pressed his brother's hand and hurried away through the shop without taking any notice of Anderson and out into the street. The brother felt embarrassed. He could not understand it. To run away when he had been asked to lunch? To run away when he was not in the least angry with him? To run away? No dog would have run away, if a piece of meat had been thrown to him. He's a queer chap, he muttered, stamping the floor. Then he went to his desk, screwed up the seat of his chair as high as it would go, and climbed up. From this raised position he was in the habit of contemplating men and circumstances, as from a higher point of view, and he found them small, yet not so small that he could not use them for his purposes. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Red Room by August Strindberg Translated by Ellie Schlesner Recording by William Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The Artist's Colony It was between 8 and 9 o'clock on the same beautiful May morning. Harvard Falk, after the scene with his brother, was strolling through the streets dissatisfied with himself, his brother, and the whole world. He would have preferred to see the sky overcast to be in bad company. He did not believe that he was a blackguard, but he was disappointed with the part he had played. He was accustomed to be severe on himself, and it had always been drummed into him that his brother was a kind of stepfather, to whom he owed great respect, not to say reverence. But he was worried and depressed by other thoughts as well. He had neither money nor prospect of work. The last contingency was perhaps the worst of the two, for to him, with his exuberant imagination, idleness was a dangerous enemy. Brooding over these disagreeable facts, he had reached Little Garden Street. He sauntered along on the left pavement past the dramatic theater and soon reached High Street North. He walked on aimlessly. The pavement became uneven. Wooden cottages took the place of stone houses. Badly dressed men and women were throwing suspicious glances at the well-dressed stranger, who was visiting their quarter at such an early hour. Famished dogs growled threateningly at him. He hastened past groups of gunners, laborers, brewers' men, laundresses, and apprentices, and finally came to Great Hop Garden Street. He entered the Hop Garden. The cows, belonging to the Inspector General of Ordnance, were grazing in the fields. The old bare apple trees were making the first efforts to put forth buds, but the lime trees were already in leaf, and squirrels were playing up and down the branches. He passed the merry-go-round and came to the avenue leading to the theater. Here he met some truant schoolboys engaged in a game of buttons. 
a little further, a painter's apprentice was lying in the grass on his back, staring at the clouds through the dome of the foliage. He was whistling carelessly, indifferent to the fact that master and men were waiting for him, while flies and other insects had drowned themselves in his paint pots. Falk had walked to the top of the hill and had come to the duck pond. He stood still for a while, studying the metamorphoses of the frogs, watching the leeches, catching a water spider. Then he began to throw stones. The exercise brought his blood into circulation. He felt rejuvenated, a schoolboy playing truant, free, defiantly free. It was freedom brought by great self-sacrifice. The thought of being able to commune with nature freely and at will made him glad. He understood nature better than men who had only ill-treated and slandered him. His unrest disappeared. He rose and continued his way further into the country. Walking through the cross, he came into Hop Garden Street North. Some of the boards were missing in the fence facing him, and there was a very plainly marked footpath on the other side. He crept through the hole, disturbing an old woman who was gathering nettles, crossed the large tobacco field, where a colony of villas had now sprung up, and found himself at the gate of Lillian's. There was no doubt of its being spring in the little settlement, consisting of three cottages, snugly nestling among elders and apple trees, and sheltered from the north wind by the pine wood on the other side of the high road. The visitor was regaled with a perfect little idol. A cock, perched on the shafts of a water cart, was basking in the sun and catching flies. The bees hung in a cloud round the beehives. The gardener was kneeling by the hotbeds, sorting radishes. The warblers and brantails were singing in the gooseberry bushes, while lightly clad children chased the fowls, bent on examining the germinative capacity of various newly sown seeds. A brilliant blue sky spanned the scene, and the dark forest framed the background. Two men were sitting close to the hotbeds, in the shelter of the fence. One of them, wearing a tall, black hat and a threadbare black suit, had a long, narrow, pale face, and looked like a clergyman. With his stout but deformed body, drooping eyelids, and Mongolian mustache, the other one belonged to the type of civilized peasant. He was very badly dressed, and might have been many things a vagabond, an artisan, or an artist. He looked seedy, but seedy in an original way. The lean man, who obviously felt chilly, although he sat right in the sun, was reading to his friend from a book. The latter looked as though he had tried all the climates of the earth, and was able to stand them all equally well. As Falk entered a garden gate from the high road, he could distinctly hear the reader's words through the fence, and he thought it no breach of confidence to stand still for a while and listen. The lean man was reading in a dry, monotonous voice, a voice without resonance, and his stout friend, every now and then, acknowledged his appreciation by a snort, which changed occasionally into a grunt and became a splutter whenever the words of wisdom to which he was listening surpassed ordinary human understanding. The highest principles are, as already stated, three, one, absolutely unconditioned, and two, relatively unconditioned ones, pro primo, the absolutely first, purely unconditioned principle would express the action underlying all consciousness, and without which consciousness cannot exist. This principle is the identity A is A. It endures and cannot be disposed of by thought when all empirical definitions of consciousness are presented. It is the original fact of consciousness and must therefore of necessity be acknowledged. Moreover, it is not conditioned like every other empirical fact, but as consequence and substance of a voluntary act entirely unconditioned. Do you follow, Ali? asked the reader, interrupting himself. It's amazing. It's not conditioned like every other empirical fact. Oh, what a man! Go on, go on! If it is maintained, continued the reader, that this proposition without any further proof be true, oh, I say, what a rascal! Without any further proof be true! repeated the grateful listener, bent on dissipating all suspicion that he had not grasped what had been read. Without any further reason, how subtle, how subtle of him to say that instead of simply saying, without any reason, am I to continue, or do you intend to go on interrupting me? asked the offended reader. 
I won't interrupt again. Go on, go on. Well, now he draws a conclusion really excellent if one ascribes to oneself the ability to state a proposition. Ollie snorted. One does not propose thereby A, capital A, but merely that A is A, if and in so far as A exists at all. It is not a question of the essence of an assertion, but only of its form. The proposition A is A is therefore conditioned hypothetically as far as its essence is concerned, and unconditioned only as far as its form goes. Have you noticed the capital A? Falk had heard enough. This was the terribly profound philosophy of Uppsala, which had strayed to Stockholm, to conquer and subdue the coarse instincts of the capital. He looked at the fowls to see whether they had not tumbled off their roost, at the parsley, whether it had not stopped growing, while made to listen to the profoundest wisdom ever proclaimed by human voice at Lillian's. He was surprised to find that the sky had not fallen, after witnessing such a feat of mental strength. At the same time, his base human nature clamored for attention. His throat was parched, and he decided to ask for a glass of water at one of the cottages. Turning back, he strolled towards the hut on the right-hand side of the road, coming from town. The door, leading into a large room, once a bakery, from an entrance hall the size of a traveling trunk, stood open. The room contained a bed sofa, a broken chair, an easel, and two men. One of them, wearing only a shirt and a pair of trousers, kept up by a leather belt, was standing before the easel. He looked like a journeyman, but he was an artist making a sketch for an altarpiece. The other man was a youth with clear-cut features and, considering his environment, well-made clothes. He had taken off his coat, turned back his shirt, and was serving as the artist's model. His handsome, noble face showed traces of a night of dissipation, and every now and then he dozed, each time reprimanded by the master who seemed to have taken him under his protection. As Falk was entering the room, he heard the burden of one of these reprimands. That you should make such a hog of yourself and spend the night drinking with that loafer Selen, and now be standing here wasting your time instead of being at the commercial school? The right shoulder, a little higher, please. That's better. Is it true that you spent all the money for your rent and dare not go home? Have you nothing left? Not one farthing? I still have some, but it won't go far. The young man pulled a scrap of paper out of his trousers pocket and straightening it out produced two notes for a crown each. Give them to me. I'll take care of them for you, exclaimed the master, seizing them with fatherly solicitude. Falk, who had vainly tried to attract their attention, thought it best to depart as quietly as he had come. Once more, passing the manure heap and the two philosophers, he turned to the left. He had not gone far when he caught sight of a young man who put up his easel at the edge of the little bog, planted with alder trees, close to the wood. He had a graceful, slight, almost elegant figure, and a thin, dark face. He seemed to scintillate life as he stood before his easel, working at a fine picture. He had taken off his coat and hat and appeared to be in excellent health and spirits, alternately talking to himself and whistling or humming snatches of song. When Falk was near enough to have him in profile, he turned around. Sowen, good morning, old chap. Falk, fancy meeting you out here in the wood. What the deuce does it mean? Oughtn't you to be at your office at this time of day? No, but are you living out here? Yes, I came here on the 1st of April with some pals. Found life in town too expensive. And moreover, landlords are so particular. A sly smile played about one of the corners of his mouth, and his brown eyes flashed. I see, Falk began again. Then perhaps you know the two individuals who were sitting by the hotbeds just now, reading. The philosophers? Of course I do. The tall one is an assistant at the public sales office at a salary of 80 crowns per annum. And the short one, Ali Montanus, ought to be at home at his sculpture. But since he and Yigberg have taken up philosophy, he has left off working and is fast going downhill. He has discovered that there is something central in art. What's he living on? On uh, nothing at all. Occasionally he sits at the practical Lundell. Then he gets a piece of black pudding. This lasts him for about a day. In the winter, Lundell lets him lie on his floor. 
He helps him to warm the room, he says, and wood is very dear. It was very cold here in April. How can he be a model? He looks such a God-help-me sort of chap. He poses for one of the thieves in Lundell's Descent from the Cross, the one whose bones are already broken. The poor devil's suffering from hip disease. He does splendidly when he leans across the back of a chair. Sometimes the artist makes him turn his back to him. Then he represents the other thief. But why doesn't he work himself? Has he no talent? Ali Montanus, my dear fellow, is a genius, but he won't work. He's a philosopher and would have become a great man if he could have gone to college. It's really extraordinary to listen to him and Yigberg talking philosophy. It's true, Yigberg has read more, but in spite of that, Montanus, with his subtle brain, succeeds in cornering him every now and again. Then Yigberg goes away and reads some more, but he never lends the book to Montanus. I see. And you like Yigberg's philosophy? asked Falk. Oh, it's subtle, wonderfully subtle. You like Fichte, don't you? I say, what a man. Who were the two individuals in the cottage? asked Falk, who did not like Fichte. Oh, you saw them too? One of them was the practical Lundell, a painter of figures, or rather, sacred subjects. The other one was my friend Renhelm. He pronounced the last few words with the utmost indifference, so as to heighten their effect as much as possible. Renhelm? Yes, he's a very nice fellow. He was acting as Lundell's model. Was he? That's like Lundell. He knows how to make use of people. He is extraordinarily practical. But come along. Let's worry him. It's the only fun I have out here. Then perhaps you'll hear Montana speaking, and that's really worthwhile. Less for the sake of hearing Montana speaking than for the sake of obtaining a glass of water, Falk followed Sullen, helping him to carry easel and paint box. The scene in the cottage was slightly changed. The model was now sitting on the broken chair, and Montanus and Yigberg on the bed sofa. Lundell was standing at his easel, smoking. His seedy friends watched him, and his old snoring cherry wood pipe, the very presence of a pipe and tobacco, raised their spirits. Falk was introduced, and immediately Lundell monopolized him, asking him for his opinion of the picture he was painting. It was a Rubens, at least as far as the subject went, though anything but a Rubens in color and drawing. Thereupon Lundell, dilated on the hard times and difficulties of an artist, severely criticized the Academy, and censured the government for neglecting native art. He was engaged in sketching an altarpiece, although he was convinced that it would be refused for nobody could succeed without intrigues and connections, and he scrutinized Falk's clothes, wondering whether he might be a useful connection. Falk's appearance had produced a different effect on the two philosophers. They scented a man of letters in him, and hated him because he might rob them of the reputation they enjoyed in the small circle. They exchanged significant glances, immediately understood by Sowen, who found it impossible to resist the temptation of showing off his friends in their glory, and, if possible, bring about an encounter. He soon found an apple of discord aimed through and hit. "'What do you say to Lundell's picture, Yigberg?' Yigberg, not expecting to be called upon to speak so soon, had to consider his answer for a few seconds. Then he made his reply raising his voice, while Ollie rubbed his back to make him hold himself straight. A work of art may, in my opinion, be divided into two categories, subject and form. With regard to the subject in this work of art, there is no denying that it is profound and universally human. The motive, properly speaking, is in itself fertile and contains all the potentialities of artistic work with regard to the form which of itself shall de facto manifest the idea that is to say the absolute identity the being the ego i cannot help saying that i find it less adequate lundell was obviously flattered always smiled his sunniest smiles if he were contemplating the heavenly host the model was asleep and Sowen found that yigberg had scored a complete success all eyes were turned on Falk, who was compelled to take up the gauntlet, for no one doubted that Yigberg's criticism was a challenge. Falk was both amused and annoyed. He was searching the limbo of memory for philosophical air guns when he caught sight of Ali Montanas, whose convulsed face betrayed his desire to speak. Falk loaded his gun at random with Aristotle and fired. 
What do you mean by adequate? I cannot recollect that Aristotle made use of that word in his metaphysics. Absolute silence fell on the room. Everybody felt that a fight between the artist colony and the University of Uppsala was imminent. The interval was longer than was desirable, for Yigberg was unacquainted with Aristotle and would have died sooner than have admitted it. As he was not quick at repartee, he failed to discover the breach which Falk had left open, but all he did caught Aristotle with both hands and flung him back at his opponent. "'Although I'm not a learned man, I venture to question whether you, Mr. Falk, have upset your opponent's argument. In my opinion, adequate may be used and accepted as a definition in a logical conclusion, in spite of Aristotle not having mentioned the word in his metaphysics. Am I right, gentlemen? I don't know. I'm not a learned man, and Mr. Falk has made a study of these things.' He had spoken with half-closed eyelids. Now he closed them entirely and looked impudently shy. There was a general murmur of, Ollie is right. Falk realized that this was a matter to be handled without mittens. If the honor of Uppsala was to be safeguarded, he made a pass with the philosophical pack of cards and threw up an ace. Mr. Montanus has denied the antecedent or said simply, Nego Mayorum. Very well. I, on my part, declare that he has been guilty of posterius Prius. When he found himself on the horns of a dilemma, he went astray and made a syllogism, after Fidoque instead of Barbara. He has forgotten the golden rule. Cesare Camstras festino barocco secundo, and therefore his conclusion became weakened. Am I right, gentlemen? Quite right. Absolutely right replied everybody, except the two philosophers who had never held a book of logic in their hands. Yigberg looked as if he had bitten on a nail, and Ollie grinned as if a handful of snuff had been thrown into his eyes, but his native shrewdness had discovered the tactical method of his opponent. He resolved not to stick to the point, but to talk of something else. He bought out everything he had learned and everything he had heard beginning with the criticism of Fichte's philosophy to which Falk had been listening a little while ago from behind the fence. The discussion went on until the morning was nearly spent. In the meantime, Lundell went on painting, his foul pipe snoring loudly. The model had fallen asleep on the broken chair, his head sinking deeper and deeper until about noon it hung between his knees. A mathematician could have calculated the time when it would reach the center of the earth. Selwyn was sitting at the open window enjoying himself, but poor Falk, who had been under the impression that this terrible philosophy was a thing of the past, was compelled to continue throwing fistfuls of philosophic snuff into the eyes of his antagonist. The torture would never have come to an end if the model's center of gravity had not gradually shifted to one of the most delicate parts of the chair. It gave way and the baron fell on the floor. Lundell seized the opportunity to inveigh against the vice of drunkenness and its miserable consequences for the victim, as well as for others. By others he meant, of course, himself. Falk, anxious to come to the assistance of the embarrassed youth, eagerly asked a question bound to be of general interest. Where are the gentlemen going to dine? The room grew silent, so silent that the buzzing of the flies was plainly audible. Falk was quite unconscious of the fact that he had stepped on five corns at one and the same moment. It was Lundell who broke the silence. He and Renhelm were going to dine at the Saucepan, their usual restaurant, for they had credit there. Sullen objected to the place because he did not like the cooking and had not yet decided on another establishment. He looked at the model with an anxious, inquiring glance. Yigberg and Montanus were too busy, and not going to cut up their working day by dressing and going up to town. They were going to get something out here, but they did not say what. A general dressing began, principally consisting of a wash at the old garden pump. Sullen, who was a dandy, had a hidden parcel wrapped in a newspaper underneath the bed sofa, from which he produced collar, cuffs, and shirt front, made of paper. He knelt for a long time before the pump, gazing into the trowel, while he put on a brownish-green tie, a present from a lady, and arranged his hair in a particular style. When he had rubbed his shoes with a burr leaf, brushed his hat with his coat sleeve, 
put a great hyacinth in his buttonhole and seized his cinnamon cane, he was ready to go. To his question whether Renhelm would be ready soon, Lundell replied that he would be hours yet, as he required his assistance in drawing. Lundell always devoted the time from twelve to two to drawing. Renhelm submitted and obeyed, although he found it hard to part with Sullen, of whom he was fond, and stay with Lundell, whom he disliked. "'We shall meet tonight at the Red Room,' said Sullen, comforting him, and all agreed, even the philosophers and the moral Lundell. On their way to town, Sullen initiated his friend Falk into some of the secrets of the colonists. As for himself, he had broken with the academy, because his views on art differed from theirs. He knew that he had talent and would eventually be successful, although success might be long in coming. It was, of course, frightfully difficult to make a name without the royal medal. There were also natural obstacles in his way. He was a native of the barren coast of Holland and loved grandeur and simplicity. But critics and public demanded detail and trifles. Therefore his pictures did not sell. He could have painted what everybody else painted, but he scorned to do so. Lundell, on the other hand, was a practical man. Sullen always pronounced the word practical with a certain contempt. He painted to please the public. He never suffered from indisposition. It was true he had left the academy, but for secret practical reasons. Moreover, in spite of his assertion, he had not broken with it entirely. He made a good income out of his illustrations for magazines, and, although he had little talent, he was bound to make his fortune some day not only because of the number of his connections, but also because of his intrigues. It was Montanus who had put him up to those. He was the originator of more than one plan, which Lundell had successfully carried out. Montanus was a genius, although he was terribly unpractical. Renhelm was a native of Norland. His father had been a wealthy man. He had owned a large estate, which was now the property of his former inspector. The old aristocrat was comparatively poor, he hoped that his son would learn a lesson from the past, take an inspector's post, and eventually restore the family to its former position by the acquisition of a new estate. Buoyed up with this hope, he had sent him to the commercial school to study agricultural bookkeeping, an accomplishment which the youth detested. He was a good fellow, but a little weak, and allowing himself to be influenced by Lundell, who did not scorn to take the fee for his preaching and patronage in Natura. In the meantime, Lundell and Baron had started work. The Baron was drawing, while the master lay on the sofa, supervising the work, in other words, smoking. If you'll put your back into your work, you shall come to dinner with me at the Brass Button, promised Lundell, feeling rich with the two crowns which he had saved from destruction. Yigberg and Montanus had sauntered up the wooded eminence, intending to sleep away the dinner hour. Owie beamed after his victories, but Yigberg was depressed. His pupil had surpassed him. Moreover, his feet were cold, and he was unusually hungry, for the eager discussion of dinner had awakened in him slumbering feelings successfully suppressed for the last twelve months. They threw themselves under a pine tree. Yigberg hid the precious, carefully wrapped up book, which he always refused to lend to Owie, under his head, and stretched himself full length on the ground. He looked deadly pale, cold and calm like a corpse which had abandoned all hope of resurrection. He watched some little birds above his head picking out the pine seed and letting the husk fall down on him. He watched the cow, the picture of robust health, grazing among the alders. He saw the smoke rising from the gardener's kitchen chimney. Are you hungry, Ollie? He asked in a feeble voice. No, replied Ollie, casting covetous looks at the wonderful book. Oh, to be a cow sighed Yigberg, crossing his hands on his chest and giving himself up to all merciful sleep. When his low breathing had become regular, the waking friend gently pulled the book from its hiding place, without disturbing the sleeper. Then he turned over and, lying on his stomach, he began to devour the precious contents, forgetting all about the saucepan and the brass button. End of chapter 3《ヴァイオーガス・ストリンバーグ》translated by translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Master and Dogs Two or three days had passed. Mrs. Charles Nicholas Falk, a lady of twenty-two years of age, had just finished her breakfast in bed, the colossal mahogany bed in the large bedroom. It was only ten o'clock. Her husband had been away since seven, taking up flax on the shore, but the young wife had not stayed in bed, a thing she knew to be contrary to the rules of the house, because she counted on his absence. She had only been married for two years, but during that period she had found abundant time to introduce sweeping reforms in the old, conservative, middle-class household, where everything was old, even the servants. He had invested her with the necessary power on the day in which he had confessed his love to her, and she had graciously consented to become his wife, that is to say, permitted him to deliver her from the hated bondage of her parental roof, where she had been compelled to get up every morning at six o'clock and work all day long. She had made good use of the period of her engagement, for it was then that she had collected a number of guarantees promising her a free, independent life, unmolested by any interference on the part of her husband. Of course, these guarantees consisted merely of verbal assurances made by a lovesick man, but she, who had never allowed her emotion to get the better of her, had carefully noted them down on the tablets of her memory. After two years of matrimony, unredeemed by the promise of a child, the husband showed a decided inclination to set aside all these guarantees, and question her right to sleep as long as she liked, for instance, to have breakfast in bed, etc., etc. He had even been so indelicate as to remind her that he had pulled her out of the mire, had delivered her from a hell, thereby sacrificing himself. The marriage had been a misalliance, her father being one of the crew of the flagship. As she lay there, she was concocting replies to these and similar reproaches and as her common sense during the long period of their mutual acquaintance had never been clouded by any intoxication of the senses, she had it well in hand and knew how to use it. The sounds of her husband's return filled her with unalloyed pleasure. Presently the dining-room door was slammed. A tremendous bellowing became audible. She pushed her head underneath the bedclothes to smother her laughter. Heavy footsteps crossed the adjacent room, and the angry husband appeared on the threshold, hat on head. His wife, who was turning her back to him, called out in her most dulcet tones, "'Is that you, little lubber? Come in, come in!' The little lubber? This was a pet name, and husband and wife frequently used others, even more original ones, showed no inclination to accept her invitation, but remained standing in the doorway and shouted, why isn't the table laid for lunch? Ask the girls. It isn't my business to lay the table, but it's customary to take off one's hat on coming into the room, sir. What have you done with my cap? Burn it. It was so greasy, you ought to have been ashamed to wear it. You burn it? We'll talk about that later on. Why are you lying in bed until all hours of the morning instead of supervising the girls? Because... I like it. Do you think I married a wife to have her refusing to look after her house? What? You did. But why do you think I married you? I've told you a thousand times so that I shouldn't have to work, and you promised me I shouldn't. Didn't you? Can you swear, on your word of honor, that you did not promise? That's the kind of man you are. You are just like all the rest. It was long ago. Long ago? When was long ago? Is a promise not binding for all times, or must it be made in any particular season? The husband knew this unanswerable logic only too well, and his wife's good temper had the same effect as her tears. He gave in. I'm going to have visitors tonight, he stated. Oh, indeed. Gentlemen? Of course. I detest women. Well, I suppose you've ordered what you want. No, I want you to do that. I? I've no money for entertaining. I shall certainly not spend my housekeeping money on your visitors. 
No, you prefer spending it on dress and other useless things. Do you call the things I make for you useless? Is a smoking cap useless? Are slippers useless? Tell me, tell me candidly. She was an adept in formulating her questions in such a way that the reply was bound to be crushing for the person who had to answer them. She was merely copying her husband's method. If he wanted to avoid being crushed, he was compelled to keep changing the subject of conversation. "'But I really have a very good reason for entertaining a few guests tonight,' he said with a show of emotion. "'My old friend Fritz Levin of the post office has been promoted after nineteen years of service. I read it in the Postal Gazette last night, but as you disapprove and as I always give way to you, I shall let the matter drop and shall merely ask Levin and Schoolmaster Nystrom to a little supper in the counting-house. So that loafer Levin has been promoted. I never. Perhaps now he'll pay back all the money he owes you. I hope so. I can't understand how on earth you can have anything to do with that man and the schoolmaster. Beggars, both of them, who hardly own the clothes they wear. I say, old girl, I never interfere in your affairs. Leave my business alone. If you have guests downstairs, I don't see why I shouldn't have friends up here. Well, why don't you? All right, little lubber. Give me some money, then. The little lubber, in every respect pleased with the turn matters had taken, obeyed with pleasure. How much? I've very little cash today. Oh, fifty will do. Are you mad? Mad? Give me what I asked for. Why should I starve when you feast? Peace was established, and the party separated with mutual satisfaction. There was no need for him to lunch badly at home. He was compelled to go out. No necessity to eat a poor dinner and be made uncomfortable by the presence of ladies. He was embarrassed in the company of women, for he had been a bachelor too long. No reason to be troubled by his conscience, for his wife would not be alone at home. As it happened, she wanted to invite her own friends and be rid of him. It was worth fifty crowns. As soon as her husband had gone, Mrs. Falk rang the bell. She had stayed in bed all morning to punish the housemaid, for the girl had remarked that in the old days everybody used to be up at seven. She asked for paper and ink and scribbled a note to Mrs. Homan, the controller's wife who lived in the house opposite. Dear Evelyn, the letter ran, Come in this evening and have a cup of tea with me. We can then discuss the statues of the Association for the Rights of Women. Possibly a bazaar or amateur theatricals would help us on. I am longing to set the association going. It is an urgent need, as you so often said. I feel it very deeply when I think about it. Do you think that her ladyship would honor my house at the same time? Perhaps I ought to call on her first. Come and fetch me at twelve, and we'll have a cup of chocolate at a confectioner's. My husband is away. Yours affectionately, Eugenia. P.S. My husband is away. When she had dispatched the letter, she got up and dressed, so as to be ready at twelve. It was evening. The eastern end of Long Street was already plunged in twilight, when the clock of the German church struck seven. Only a faint ray of light from Pig Street fell into Falk's flax shop, as Anderson made ready to close it for the night. The shutters in the counting-house had already been fastened, and the gas was lighted. The place had been swept and straightened. Two hampers with protruding necks of bottles, sealed red and yellow, some covered with tinfoil, others wrapped in pink tissue paper, were standing close to the door. The center of the room was taken up by a table covered with a white cloth. On it stood an Indian bowl and heavy silver candelabrum. Nicholas Falk paced up and down. He was wearing a black frock coat and had a respectable as well as a festive air. He had a right to look forward to a pleasant evening. He had arranged it. He had paid for it. He was in his own house and at his ease, for there were no ladies present and his invited guests were of caliber, which justified him in expecting from them not only attention and civility, but a little more. They were only two, but he did not like many people. They were his friends, reliable, devoted as dogs, 
submissive, agreeable, always flattering, and never contradicting him. Being a man of means, he could have moved in better circles. He might have associated with his father's friends, and he did so twice a year, but he was of too despotic a nature to get on with them. It was three minutes past seven, and still the guests had not arrived. Falk began to show signs of impatience. When he invited his henchmen, he expected them to be punctual to the minute. The thought of the unusually sumptuous arrangement, however, and the paralyzing impression it was bound to make, helped him to control his temper a little longer. At the lapse of a few more moments, Fritz Levin, the post office official, put in an appearance. "'Good evening, brother. Oh, I say.' He paused in the action of divesting himself of his overcoat, and feigned surprise at the magnificent preparations, he almost seemed in danger of falling on his back with sheer amazement. "'The seven-armed candlestick in the tabernacle, good Lord!' he ejaculated, catching sight of the hampers. The individual who delivered this well-rehearsed witticisms while taking off his overcoat was a middle-aged man of the type of the government official of twenty years ago. His whiskers joined his mustache, his hair was parted at the side and arranged in a coupe de vent. He was extremely pale and as thin as a shroud. In spite of being well-dressed, he was shivering with cold and seemed to have secret traffic with poverty. Falk's manner in welcoming him was both rude and patronizing. It was partly intended to express his scorn of flattery, more particularly from an individual like the newcomer, and partly to intimate that the newcomer enjoyed the privilege of his friendship. By way of congratulation, he began to draw a parallel between Levin's promotion and his own father's receiving a commission in the militia. "'Well, it's a grand thing to have the royal mandate in one's pocket, isn't it? My father, too, received the royal mandate.' "'Pardon me, dear brother, but I've only been appointed.' "'Appointed or royal mandate, it comes to the same thing. Don't teach me. My father, too, had a royal mandate. I assure you.' "'Assure me? What do you mean by that? Do you mean to imply that I'm standing here telling lies?' Tell me, do you mean to say that I'm lying? Of course not. There's no need to lose your temper like that. Very well. You're admitting that I'm not telling lies. Consequently, you have a royal mandate. Why do you talk such nonsense? My father, the pale man, in whose wake a drove of fury seemed to have entered the counting house, for he trembled in every limb, now rushed at his patron, firmly resolved to get over with his business before the feast began so that nothing should afterwards disturb the general enjoyment. "'Help me,' he groaned with despair of a drowning man taking a bill out of his pocket. Falk sat down on the sofa, shouted for Anderson, ordered him to open the bottles, and began to mix the bowl. "'Help you? Haven't I helped you before?' he replied. "'Haven't you borrowed from me again and again without paying me back? Answer me. What have you got to say?' "'I know, brother.' that you have always been kindness itself to me. And now you've been promoted, haven't you? Everything was to be all right now. All debts were to be paid. A new life was to begin. I've listened to this kind of talk for eighteen years. What salary do you draw now? Twelve hundred crowns instead of eight hundred as before. But now think of this. The cost of the mandate was one hundred and twenty-five. The pension fund deducts fifty. That makes one hundred and seventy-five. Where am I to take it from? But the worst of all is this. My creditors have seized half my salary. Consequently, I have now only six hundred crowns to live on, instead of eight hundred. And I've waited nineteen years for that. Promotion is a splendid thing. Why did you get into debt? One ought never to get into debt. Never get into debt. With a salary of eight hundred crowns all these years, how was it possible to keep out of it? In that case, you had no business to be in the employ of the government. But this is a matter which doesn't concern me. Doesn't concern me. Won't you sign once more for the last time? You know my principles. I never sign bills. Please let the matter drop. Levin, who was evidently used to these refusals, calmed down. At the same moment, schoolmaster Nystrom entered and to the relief of both parties, interrupted the conversation. He was a dried-up individual of mysterious appearance and age. His occupation, too, was mysterious. He was supposed to be a master at a school in one of the southern suburbs. 
nobody ever asked which school, and he did not care to talk about it. His mission, so far as Falk was concerned, was first to be addressed as schoolmaster when there were other people present. Secondly, to be polite and submissive. Thirdly, to borrow a little every now and then, never exceeding a fiver. It was one of Falk's fundamental needs that people should borrow money from him occasionally. Only a little, of course. And fourthly, to write verses on festive occasions, and the latter was not the least of the component parts of his mission. Charles Nicholas Falk sat enthroned on his leather sofa, very conscious of the fact that it was his leather sofa, surrounded by his staff, or his dogs, as one might have said. Levin found everything splendid. The bowl, the glasses, the ladle, the cigars. The whole box had been taken from the mantelpiece. The matches, the ashtrays, the bottles, the corks, the wire, everything. The schoolmaster looked content. He was not called upon to talk. The other two did that. He was merely required to be present as a witness in case of need. Falk was the first to raise his glass and drink. Nobody knew to whom, but the schoolmaster, believing it to be the hero of the day, produced his verses and began to read. To Fritz Levin on the day of his promotion. Falk was attacked by a violent cough which disturbed the reading and spoiled the effect of the wittiest points. But Nystrom, who was a shrewd man and had foreseen this, had introduced into his poem the finely felt and finely expressed reflection. What would have become of Fritz Levin if Charles Nicholas hadn't befriended him? This subtle hint at the numerous loans made by Falk to his friend soothed the cough. It subsided and ensured a better reception to the last verse which was quite impudently dedicated to Levin, a tactlessness which again threatened to disturb the harmony. Falk emptied his glass as if he were draining a cup filled to the brim with ingratitude. "'You're not up to the mark, Nystrom,' he said. "'No, he was far wittier on your thirty-eighth birthday,' agreed Levin, guessing what Falk was driving at. Falk's glance penetrated into the most hidden recesses of Levin's soul trying to discover whether any lie or fraud lay hidden there, and as his eyes were blinded by pride, he saw nothing. "'Quite true,' he acquiesced. "'I never heard anything more witty in all my life. It was good enough to be printed. You really ought to get your things printed. I say, Nystrom, surely you know it by heart, don't you?' Nystrom had a shocking memory, or, to tell the truth, he had not yet had enough wine to commit the suggested outrage against decency and good form. He asked for time. But Falk, irritated by his quiet resistance, had gone too far to turn back, and insisted on his request. He was almost sure he had a copy of the verses with him. He searched his pocketbook, and behold, there they lay. Modesty did not forbid him to read them aloud himself. It would not have been for the first time but it sounded better for another to read them. The poor dog bit his chain, but it held. He was a sensitive man, this schoolmaster, but he had to be brutal if he did not want to relinquish the precious gift of life, and he had been very brutal. The most private affairs were fully and openly discussed. Everything in connection with the birth of this hero, his reception into the community, his education and upbringing were made fun of. The verses would have disgusted even Falk himself if they had treated of any other person, but the fact of their celebrating him and his doings made them excellent. When the recitation was over, his health was drunk uproariously. In many glasses, for each member of the little party felt that he was too sober to keep his real feelings under control. The table was now cleared, and an excellent supper consisting of oysters, birds, and other good things was served. Falk went sniffing from dish to dish, sent one or two of them back, took care that the chill was taken off the stout, and that the wines were the right temperature. Now his dogs were called upon to do their work and offer him a pleasant spectacle. When everybody was ready, he pulled out his gold watch and held it in his hand, while he jestingly asked a question which his convives had heard many times, so very many times, what is the time by the silver watches of the gentlemen? The anticipated reply came in duty bound, accompanied by gay laughter. The watches were at the watchmakers. This put Falk into the best of tempers, 
which found expression in the not at all unexpected joke. The animals will be fed at eight. He sat down, poured out three liqueurs, took one, and invited his friends to follow his example. I must make a beginning myself, as you both seem to be holding back. Don't let's stand on ceremony. Tuck in, boys. The feeding began. Charles Nicholas was not particularly hungry, had plenty of time to enjoy the appetite of his guests, and he continually urged them to eat. An unspeakably benevolent smile radiated from his bright, sunny countenance as he watched their zeal, and it was difficult to say what he enjoyed more, the fact of their having a good meal or the fact of their being so hungry. He sat there like a coachman on his box, clicking his tongue and cracking his whip at them. Eat, Nystrom. You don't know when you will get a next meal. Help yourself, Levin. You look as if you could do a little flesh on your bones. Are you grinning at the oysters? Aren't they good enough for a fellow like you? What do you say? Take another. Don't be shy. What do you say? You've had enough? Nonsense. Have a drink now. Take some stout, boys. Now a little salmon. You shall take another piece. By the Lord Harry, you shall. Go on eating. Why the devil don't you? It costs you nothing. When the birds had been carved, Charles Nicholas poured out the claret with a certain solemnity. The guest paused, anticipating a speech. The host raised his glass, smelt the bouquet of the wine, and said with profound gravity, Your health, you hogs! Nystrom responded by raising his glass and drinking, but Levin left his untouched, looking as if he were secretly sharpening a knife. When supper was over, Levin, strengthened by food and drink, his senses befogged by the fumes of the wine, began to nurse a feeling of independence. A strong yearning for freedom stirred in his heart. His voice grew more resonant. He pronounced his words with increasing assurance, and his movements betrayed greater ease. "'Give me a cigar,' he said in a commanding tone. "'No, not a weed like these, a good one.' Charles Nicholas, regarding his words as a good joke, obeyed. "'Your brother isn't here tonight,' remarked Levin casually. There was something ominous and threatening in his voice. Falk felt it and became uneasy. "'No,' he said shortly, but his voice was unsteady. Levin waited for a few moments before striking a second blow. One of his most lucrative occupations was his interference in other people's business. He carried gossip from family to family sowed a grain of discord here and another there, merely to play the grateful part of the mediator afterwards. In this way he had obtained a great deal of influence, was feared by his acquaintances, and managed them as if they were marionettes. Falk felt this disagreeable influence and attempted to shake it off, but in vain. Levin knew how to whet his curiosity, and by hinting at more than he knew he succeeded in bluffing people into betraying their secrets. At the present moment, Levin held the whip, and he promised himself to make his oppressor feel it. He was still merely playing with it, but Falk was waiting for the blow. He tried to change the subject of conversation. He urged his friends to drink, and they drank. Levin grew whiter and colder as his intoxication increased, and went on playing with his victim. "'Your wife has visitors this evening,' he suddenly remarked. "'How do you know?' asked Falk, taken back. I know everything, answered Levin, showing his teeth. It was almost true. His widely extended business connections compelled him to visit as many public places as possible, and there he heard much, not only the things which were spoken of in his society, but also those which were discussed by others. Falk was beginning to feel afraid without knowing why, and he thought it best to divert the threatening danger. He became civil, humble even, but Levin's boldness still increased. There was no alternative. He must make a speech, remind his companions of the cause of the gathering, acknowledge the hero of the day. There was no other escape. He was a poor speaker, but the thing had to be done. He tapped against the bowl, filled the glasses, and recollecting an old speech made by his father when Falk became his own master, he rose and began very slowly. Gentlemen, I have been my own master these eight years. I was only thirty years old. The change from a sitting position to a standing one caused a rush of blood to his head. He became confused. 
Levin's mocking glances added to his embarrassment. His confusion grew. The figure thirty seemed something so colossal that it completely disconcerted him. Did I say thirty? I didn't mean it. I was in my father's employ for many years. It would take too long to recount everything I suffered during those years. It's the common lot. Perhaps you think me selfish. Here, here, groaned Nystrom, who was resting his heavy head on the table. Levin puffed the smoke of his cigar in the direction of the speaker, as if he were spitting into his face. Falk, really intoxicated now, continued his speech. His eyes seemed to seek a distant goal without being able to find it. Everybody is selfish, we all know that. Yes, my father, who made a speech when I became my own master, as I was just saying. He pulled out his gold watch and took it off the chain. The two listeners opened their eyes wide. Was he going to make a present of it to Levin? Handed me on that occasion this gold watch, which he, in his turn, had received from his father in the year. Again, those dreadful figures. He must refer back. This gold watch, gentlemen, was presented to me, and I cannot think without emotion of the moment when I received it. Perhaps you think I'm selfish, gentlemen. I'm not. I know it's not good form to speak of oneself, but on such an occasion as this it seems very natural to glance at the past. I only want to mention one little incident. He had forgotten Levin and the significance of the day, and was under the impression that he was celebrating the close of his bachelor life. All of a sudden he remembered the scene between himself and his brother and his triumph. He felt a pressing need to talk of this triumph, but he could not remember the details. He merely remembered having proved that his brother was a blackguard. He had forgotten the chain of evidence with the exception of only two facts, his brother and a blackguard. He tried to link them together, but they always fell apart. His brain worked incessantly, and picture followed on picture. He must tell them of a generous action he had done. He recollected that he had given his wife some money in the morning, and had allowed her to sleep as long as she liked and have breakfast in bed, but that wasn't a suitable subject. He was in an unpleasant position, but fear of the silence and the two pairs of sharp eyes which followed his every movement helped him to pull himself together. He realized that he was still standing, watch in hand. The watch? How had it got into his hand? Why were his friends sitting down, almost blotted out by the smoke, while he was on his legs? Oh, of course, he had been telling them about the watch, and they were waiting for the continuation of the story. This watch, gentlemen, is nothing special at all. It's only French gold. The two Willem owners of silver watches opened their eyes wide. This information was new to them and I believe it has only seven rubies. It's not a good watch at all. On the contrary, I shall rather call it a cheap one. Some secret cause of which his brain was hardly conscious made him angry. He must vent his wrath on something. Tapping the table with his watch, he shouted, It's a damn bad watch, I say. Listen to me when I'm speaking. Don't you believe what I say, Fritz? Answer me. Why do you look so vicious? You don't believe me? I can read it in your eyes, Fritz. You don't believe what I'm saying. Believe me, I know human nature, and I might stand security for you once more. Either you are a liar or I am. Shall I prove to you that you are a scoundrel? Shall I? Listen, Nystrom, if I forge a bill, am I a scoundrel? Of course you're a scoundrel. The devil take you, answered Nystrom without a moment's hesitation. Yes. Yes. His efforts to remember whether Levin had forged a bill, or was in any way connected with a bill, were in vain. Therefore he was obliged to let the matter drop. Levin was tired. He was also afraid that his victim might lose consciousness, and that he and Nystrom would be robbed of the pleasure of enjoying his intended discomfiture. He therefore interrupted Falk with a jest in his host's own style. Your health, old rascal. And down came the whip. He produced a newspaper. "'Have you seen the people's flag?' he asked Falk in a cold, murderous accent. Falk stared at the scandalous paper, but said nothing. The inevitable was bound to happen. 
it contains a splendid article on the board of payment of employees' salaries. Falk's cheeks grew white. Rumor has it that your brother wrote it. It's a lie. My brother's no scandal monger. He isn't, do you hear? But unfortunately, he has to suffer for it. I'm told he's been sacked. It's a lie. I'm afraid it's true. Moreover, I saw him dining today at the brass button with a rascally-looking chap. I'm sorry for the lad. It was the worst blow that could have befallen Charles Nicholas. He was disgraced. His name, his father's name, was dishonored. All that the old Burgesses had achieved had been in vain. If he had been told that his wife had died, he could have borne up under it. A financial loss, too, might have been repaired. If he had been told that his friend Levin or Nystrom had been arrested for forgery, he would have disowned them, for he had never shown himself in public in their company. But he could not deny his relationship to his brother, and his brother had disgraced him. There was no getting away from the fact. Levin had found a certain pleasure in retailing his information. Falk, although he had never given his brother the smallest encouragement, was in the habit of boasting of him and his achievements to his friends. "'My brother, the assessor, is a man of brains, and he'll go far. Mark my words.' These continual indirect reproaches had long been a source of irritation to Levin, more particularly as Charles Nicholas drew a definite, unsurpassable, although indefinable, line between assessors and secretaries. Levin, without moving a finger in the matter, had had his revenge at so little cost to himself that he could afford to be generous and play the part of the comforter. There's no reason why you should take it so much to heart. Even a journalist can be a decent specimen of humanity, and you exaggerate the scandal. There can be no scandal where no definite individuals have been attacked. Moreover, the whole thing's very witty, and everybody's reading it. This last pill of comfort made Falk furious. He robbed me of my good name. My name. How can I show myself tomorrow at the exchange? What will people say? By people, he met his wife. She would enjoy the situation because it would make the misalliance less marked. Henceforth, they would be on the same social level. The thought was intolerable. A bitter hatred for all mankind took possession of his soul. If only he had been the bastard's father, then he could have made use of his parental privilege, washed his hands of him, cursed him, and so have put an end to the matter. But there was no such thing as brotherly privilege. Was it possible that he himself was partly to blame for the disgrace? Had he not forced his brother into his profession? Maybe the scene of the morning or his brother's financial difficulties caused by him were to blame. No, he had never committed a base action. He was blameless. He was respected and looked up to. He was no scandal monger. He had never been sacked by anybody. Did he not carry a paper in his pocketbook, testifying that he was the kindest friend with the kindest heart? Had not the schoolmaster read it aloud a little while ago? Yes, certainly. And he sat down to drink, drink immoderately, not to stupefy his conscience. There was no necessity for that. He had done no wrong, but merely to drown his anger. But it was no use. It boiled over and scalded those who sat nearest to him. Drink, you rascals! That brute there is asleep, and you call yourselves friends? Waken him up, Levin. Whom are you shouting at? asked the offended Levin peevishly. At you, of course. Two glances were exchanged across the table, which promised no good. Falk, whose temper improved directly when he saw another man in a rage, poured a ladleful of the contents of the bowl on the schoolmaster's head, so that it trickled down his neck behind his collar. Don't dare do that again, threatened Levin. Who's to prevent me? I. Yes, I. I shan't let you ruin his clothes. It's a beastly shame. His clothes, laughed Falk. Isn't it my coat? Didn't I give it to him? You're going too far, said Levin, rising to go. So you're going to go now? You've had enough to eat? You can't drink any more? You don't want me any longer tonight? Didn't you want to borrow a fiver? What, am I to be deprived of the honor of lending you some money? Didn't you want me to sign something? Sign, eh? At the word sign, Levin pricked up his ears. 
supposing he tried to get the better of him in his excited condition, the thought softened him. Don't be unjust, brother, he recommended. I'm not ungrateful. I fully appreciate your kindness. But I'm poor, poorer than you've ever been or ever can be. I've suffered humiliations which you can't even conceive. But I've always looked upon you as a friend. I mean a friend in the highest sense of the word. You've had too much to drink tonight, and so you're cross. This makes you unjust. But I assure you, gentlemen, in the whole world, there beats no kinder heart than that of Charles Nicholas. And I don't say this for the first time. I thank you for your courtesy tonight. That is to say, if the excellent supper we have eaten, the magnificent wines we have drunk, have been eaten and drunk in my honor. I thank you, brother, and drink your health. Here's to you, brother Charles Nicholas. Thank you, thank you a thousand times. You've not done it in vain. Mark my words. Strange to say, these words, spoken in a tremulous voice, tremulous with emotion, produced good results. Falk felt good. Hadn't he again been assured that he had a kind heart? He firmly believed it. The intoxication had reached a sentimental stage. They moved nearer together. They talked of their good qualities, of the wickedness of the world, the warmth of their feelings, the strength of their good intentions. They grasped each other's hands. Falk spoke of his wife, of his kindness to her. He regretted the lack of spirituality in his calling. He mentioned how painfully aware he was of his want of culture. He said that his life was a failure and after the consumption of his tenth liqueur, he confided to Levin that it had been his ambition to go into the church, become a missionary even. They grew more and more spiritual. Levin spoke of his dead mother, her death and funeral, of an unhappy love affair, and finally of his religious convictions, as a rule jealously guarded as a secret, and soon they were launched on an eager discussion of religion. It struck one, it struck two, and they were still talking while Nystrom slept soundly, his arms on the table and his head resting on his arms. A dense cloud of tobacco smoke filled the counting house and robbed the gas flames of their brilliancy. The seven candles of the seven-armed candelabrum had burnt down to the sockets and the table presented a dismal sight. One or two glasses had lost their stems, the stained tablecloth was covered with cigar ash, the floor was strewn with matches. The daylight was breaking through the chinks of the shutters. Its shafts peered the cloud of smoke and drew cabalistic figures on the tablecloth between the two champions of their faith, busily engaged in re-editing the Augsburg Confession. They were now talking with hissing voices. Their brains were numbed. Their words sounded dry. The tension was relaxing in spite of their diligent recourse to the bottle. They tried to whip up their souls into an ecstasy but their efforts grew weaker and weaker. The spirit had died out of their conversation. They only exchanged meaningless words. The stupefied brains which had been whirling around like teetotems slackened in their speed and finally stopped. One thought alone filled their minds. They must go to bed. If they did not want to loathe the sight of each other, they must be alone. Nystrom was shaken into consciousness. Levin embraced Charles Nicholas and took the opportunity to pocket three of his cigars. The heights which they had scaled were too sublime to allow them to talk of the bill just yet. They parted. The host let his guests out. He was alone. He opened the shutters. Daylight poured into the room. He opened the window. The cool sea breeze swept through the narrow street, one side of which was already illuminated by the rising sun. It struck four. He listened to that wonderful striking only heard by the poor wretch who yearns for the day on a bed of sickness or sorrow. Even Long Street East, the street of vice, of filth and brawls, lay in the early morning sun, still desolate and pure. Falk felt deeply unhappy. He was disgraced. He was lonely. He closed window and shutters, and as he turned round and beheld the state of the room, he at once began setting it straight. He picked up the cigar ends and threw them into the grate. He cleared the table, swept the room, dusted it, and put everything in its place. He washed his face and hands and brushed his hair. A policeman might have thought him a murderer, intent on effacing all traces of his crime. But all the while he thought, clearly, 
firmly and logically. When he had straightened the room and himself, he formed a resolution, long brooded over, but now to be carried into effect. He would wipe away the disgrace which had fallen on his family. He would rise in the world and become a well-known and influential man. He would begin a new life. He would keep his reputation unstained, and he would make his name respected. He felt that only a great ambition could help him to keep his head erect after the blow he had received tonight. Ambition had been latent in his heart. It had been awakened, and henceforth it should rule his life. Quite sober now, he lighted a cigar, drank a brandy, and went upstairs, quietly, gently, so as not to disturb his sleeping wife. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five at the Publishers. Harvard Falk decided to try Smith first, the Almighty Smith, a name adopted by the publisher in his youth during a short trip to the great continent from exaggerated admiration of everything American. The redoubtable Smith, with his thousand arms who could make a writer in twelve months, however bad the original material. His method was well known, though none but he dared to make use of it, for it required an unparalleled amount of impudence. The writer whom he took up could be sure of making a name. Hence Smith was overrun with nameless writers. The following story is told as an instance of his irresistible power and capacity for starting an author on the road to fame. A young, inexperienced writer submitted his first novel, a bad one, to Smith. For some reason the latter happened to like the first chapter. He never read more, and decided to bless the world with a new author. The book was published, bearing on the back of the cover the words, Blood and Sword a novel by Gustav Soholm. This work of the young and promising author, whose highly respected name, has for a long time been familiar to the widest circles, etc., etc. It is a book which we can strongly recommend to the novel-reading public. The book was published on April 3rd. On April 4th, a review appeared in the widely read metropolitan paper, The Grey Bonnet, in which Smith held 50 shares. It concluded by saying, quote, Gustav Soholm's name is already well known. The spreading of his fame does not lie with us, and we recommend this book not only to the novel reading, but also to the novel writing public. End of quote. On April 5th, an advertisement appeared in every paper of the capital with the following quotation, quote, Gustav Soholm's name is already well known. The spreading of his fame does not lie with us. Gray Bonnet. End of quote. On the same evening, a notice appeared in the Incorruptible, a paper read by nobody. It represented the book as a model of bad literature, and the reviewer swore that Gustav's sublome, reviewer's intentional slip, had no name at all. But as nobody read the Incorruptible, the opposition remained unheard. The other papers, unwilling to disagree with their venerable leading gray bonnet, and afraid of offending Smith, were mild in their criticisms, but no more. They held the view that with hard work Gustav Soholm might make a name for himself in the future. A few days of silence followed, but in every paper, in the incorruptible and bold type, appeared the advertisement shouting, quote, Gustav Soholm's name is already well known. End of quote. Then a correspondence was started in the excorpulings miscellaneous reproaching the metropolitan papers with being hard on young authors. Quote, Gustav Soholm is simply a genius, end of quote, affirmed the hot-headed correspondent, quote, in spite of all the dogmatic blockheads might say to the contrary, end of quote. On the next day, the advertisement again appeared in the papers, bawling, quote, Gustav Soholm's name is already well known, etc., gray bonnet, end of quote. Gustav Soholm is a genius, etc., excurpalings, miscellaneous. 
The cover of the next number of the magazine, Our Land, one of Smith's publications, bore the notice. We are pleased to be in a position to inform our numerous subscribers that the brilliant young author, Gustav Soholm, has promised us an original novel for our next number, etc. And then again the advertisement in the papers. Finally, when at Christmas, the almanac, Our People, appeared, the authors mentioned on the title page were Orvar Odd, Tawas Qualis, and Gustav Soholm, and others. It was a fact. In the eighth month, Gustav Soholm was made, and the public was powerless. It had to swallow him. It was impossible to go into a bookseller's and look at a book without reading his name. Impossible to take up a newspaper without coming across it. In all circumstances and conditions of life, that name attrited itself. Printed on a slip of paper, it was put into the housewives' market baskets on Saturdays. The servants carried it home from the tradespeople. The crossing sweeper swept it off the street, and the man of leisure went about with it in the pockets of his dressing gown. Being well aware of Smith's great power, the young man climbed the dark stairs of the publisher's house close to the great church, not without misgivings. He had to wait for a long time in an outer office, a prey to the most unpleasant meditations, until suddenly the door was burst open, and a young man rushed out of an inner office, despair on his face, and a roll of paper under his arm. Shaking in every limb, Falk entered the sanctum, where the despot received his visitors, seated on a low sofa, calm and serene as a god. He kindly nodded his gray head, covered by a blue cap, and went on smoking, peacefully, as if he had never shattered a man's hopes or turned an unhappy wretch from his door. "'Good morning, sir. Good morning.' His divinely flashing eyes glanced at the newcomer's clothes and approved. Nevertheless, he did not ask him to sit down. "'My name is Falk.' "'Unknown to me, what is your father?' "'My father is dead.' "'Is he? Good. What can I do for you, sir?' Falk produced a manuscript from his breast pocket and handed it to Smith. The latter sat on it without looking at it. "'You want me to publish it? Verse?' I might have guessed it. You know the cost of printing a single page, sir. No, you don't. And he playfully poked the ignoramus with the stem of his pipe. Have you made a name, sir? No. Have you distinguished yourself in any way? No. The Academy has praised these verses. Which Academy? The Academy of Sciences? The one which publishes all that stuff about flints? About flints? Yes, you know, the Academy of Sciences, close to the museum near the river. Well, then? Oh, no, Mr. Smith. The Swedish Academy in the exchange? I see. The one with the tallow candles? Never mind. No man on earth can tell what purpose it serves. No, my dear sir, the essential thing is to have a name. A name like Tegner, like Orenschlagel, like, yes, our country has many great poets. But I can't remember them just at the moment. But a name is necessary, Mr. Falk. Hmm. Who knows Mr. Falk? I don't, and I know many great poets. As I recently said to my friend Ibsen, now you just listen to me, Ibsen. I call him Ibsen quite plainly. Just you listen to me. Write something for my magazine. I'll pay you whatever you ask. He wrote, I paid, but I got my money back. The annihilated young man longed to sink through the chinks in the floor when he realized that he was standing before a person who called Ibsen, quite plainly, Ibsen. He longed to recover his manuscript and go his way, as the other young man had done, away, far away, until he came to running water. Smith guessed it. Well, I've no doubt you can write Swedish, sir, and you know our literature better than I do. Good. I have an idea. I told of great, beautiful spiritual writers who lived in the past. Let's say in the reign of Gustav Eriksson and his daughter Christina. Isn't that so? Gustav Adolphus. Gustav Adolphus, so be it. I remember there was one with a great and a very great name. He wrote a fine work in verse on God's creation. I believe his Christian name was Hoken. Oh, you mean Hakwin Spagel, Mr. Smith. God's works and rest. Ah, yes. Well, I've been thinking of publishing it. Our nation is yearning for religion these days. I've noticed that. 
and one must give the people something. I have given them a good deal of Herman Frank and Arndt, but the great foundation can sell more cheaply than I can, and now I want to bring out something good at a fair price. Will you take the matter in hand? I don't know where I come in, as it is but a question of a reprint, answered Falk, not daring to refuse straight out. Dear me, what ignorance! You would do editing and proofreading, of course. Are we agreed? You publish it, sir. What? Shall we draw up a little agreement? The work must appear in numbers. What? A little agreement? Just hand me pen and ink. Well? Falk obeyed. He was unable to offer resistance. Smith wrote, and Falk signed. Well, so much for that. Now there's another thing. Give me that little book on the stand. The third shelf. There. Now look here. A brochure title, The Guardian Angel. Look at the vignette. An angel with an anchor and a ship. It's a schooner without any yards, I believe. The splendid influence of marine insurance and social life in general is well known. Everybody has at one time or another sent something more or less valuable across the sea in a ship. What? Well, everybody doesn't realize this. No? Consequently, it is our duty to enlighten those who are ignorant. Isn't that so? Well, we know, you and I, therefore, it is for us to enlighten those who don't. This book maintains that everybody who sends things across the water should insure them. But this book is badly written. Well, we'll write a better one. What? You'll write me a novel of ten pages for my magazine, Our Land and I expect you to have sufficient gumption to introduce the name Triton, which is the name of a new limited liability company founded by my nephew, and we are told to help our neighbors, twice, neither more nor less. But it must be done cleverly, and so that it is not at all obvious. Do you follow me? Falk had found the offer repulsive, although it contained nothing dishonest. However, it gave him a start with the influential man straight away, without any effort on his part. He thanked Smith and accepted. You know the size, 16 inches to the page, altogether 160 inches of eight lines each. Shall we write a little agreement? Smith drew up an agreement, and Falk signed. Well now, you know the history of Sweden? Go to the stand again. You will find a cliché there, a wood block. To the right. That's it. Can you tell me who the lady is meant for? She is supposed to be a queen. Falk, who saw nothing at first but a piece of black wood, finally made out some human features and declared that to the best of his belief it represented Ulrica Eleonora. Didn't I say so? He <laughs> he. The block has been used for Elizabeth, Queen of England, in an American popular edition. I bought it cheaply, with a lot of others. I'm going to use it for Ulrica Eleonora in my people's library. Our people are splendid. They are so ready to buy my books. Will you write the letterpress? Although Falk did not like the order, his super-sensitive conscience could find no wrong in the proposal. Well, then, we'd better make out our little agreement. Sixteen pages octavo, at three inches, at twenty-four lines each. There! Falk, realizing that the audience was over, made a movement to recover his manuscript on which Smith had all along been sitting. But the latter would not give it up. He declared that he would read it, although it might take him some time. "'You're a sensible man, sir. Who knows the value of time?' he said. "'I had a young fellow here just before you came in. He also bought me verses, a great poem, for which I have no use. I made him the same offers I just made to you, sir.' Do you know what he said? He told me to do something unmentionable. He did, indeed, and rushed out of the office. He'll not live long, that young man. Good day, good day. Don't forget to order a copy of Hoken Spiegel. Well, good day, good day. Smith pointed to the door with the stem of his pipe, and Falk left him. He did not walk away with light footsteps. The wood block in his pocket was heavy and weighed him down, kept him back. He thought of the pale young man with the roll of manuscript who had dared to say a bold thing to Smith, and pride stirred in his heart. But memories of old paternal warnings and advice whispered the old lie to him that all work was equally honorable, 
and reproved him for his pride. He laid hold of his common sense and went home to write a hundred and ninety-two inches about Ulrica Eleonora. As he had risen early, he was at his writing table at nine o'clock. He filled a large pipe, took two sheets of paper, wiped his steel nibs, and tried to recall all he knew about Ulrica Eleonora. He looked her up in Eklund and Frixel. There was a great deal under the heading Ulrica Eleonora, but very little about her personally. At half-past nine he had exhausted the subject. He had written down her birthplace and the place where she died, when she came to the throne, when she abdicated, the names of her parents and the name of her husband. It was a commonplace excerpt from a church register and filled three pages, leaving thirteen to be covered. He smoked two or three pipes and dragged the inkstand with his pen, as if he were fishing for the Midgard serpent. But he brought up nothing. He was bound to say something about her personally, sketch her character. He felt as if he were sitting in judgment on her. Should he praise or revile her? As it was a matter of complete indifference to him, his mind was still not made up when it struck eleven. He reviled her and came to the end of the fourth page, leaving twelve to be accounted for. He was at his wit's end. He wanted to say something about her rule, but as she had not ruled, there was nothing to be said. He wrote about her counsel, one page, leaving eleven. He whitewashed Gertz, another, leaving ten. He had not yet filled half the required space. He hated the woman. More pipes, fresh steel nibs. He went back to remoter days, passing them in review, and being now in a thoroughly bad temper, he overthrew his old idol, Charles the Twelfth, and hurled him in the dust. It was done in a few words, and only added one more page to his pile. There still remain nine. He anticipated events and criticized Frederick the First, half a page. He glanced at the paper with unhappy eyes. He glimpsed halfway house, but could not reach it. He had written seven and a half small pages. Eklund had only managed one and a half. He flung the wood block on the floor, kicked it underneath his writing table, crawled after it, dusted it, and put it in its former place. It was torture. His soul was as dry as the block. He tried to work himself up to views which he did not hold. He tried to awaken some sort of emotion in his heart for the dead queen, but her plain, dull features cut into the wood made no more impression on him than he on the block. He realized his incapacity and felt despondent, degraded. And this was the career of his choice, the one he had preferred to all others. With a strong appeal to his reason, he turned to the guardian angel. The brochure was originally written for a German society, Denarius, and the argument was as follows. Mr. and Mrs. Castle had emigrated to America, where they acquired a large estate. To make the story possible, they had sold their land and very unpractically invested the total amount realized in costly furniture and objects of art. As the story required that everything should be completely lost and nothing whatever saved from the shipwreck, they sent off the whole lot in advance by the Washington, a first-class steamer, copper bottom, with watertight bulkheads, and insured with the great German Marine Insurance Company for 60,000 pounds. Mr. and Mrs. Castle and the children followed on the Bolivar, the finest boat of the White Star Line, insured with the great marine insurance company, Nereus, capital ten million, and safely arrived at Liverpool. They left Liverpool, and all went well until they came to Skagen Point. During the whole voyage, the weather had, of course, been magnificent. The sky was clear and radiant, but at the dangerous Skagen Point, a storm overtook them. The steamer was wrecked. The parents, whose lives were insured, were drowned, thereby guaranteeing to the children, who were saved, fifteen hundred pounds. The latter, rejoicing at their parents' foresight, arrived at Hamburg in good spirits, eager to take possession of the insurance money and the property which they had inherited from their parents. Imagine their consternation when they were told that the Washington had been wrecked a fortnight before their arrival on Dwarger Bank. Their whole fortune, which had been left uninsured, was lost. All that remained was the life insurance money. They hurried to the company's agents. A fresh disaster. 
they were told that their parents had not paid the last premium which oh fateful blow had been due on the day preceding their death the distressed children bitterly mourned their parents who had worked so hard for them they embraced each other with tears and made a solemn vow that henceforth all their possessions should be insured and that they would never neglect paying their life insurance premiums this story was to be localized adapted to a swedish environment and made into a readable novelette and with this he was to make his debut in the literary world the devil of pride whispered to him not to be a blackguard and to leave the business alone but this voice was silenced by another which came from the region of his empty stomach and was accompanied by a gnawing stinging sensation he drank a glass of water and smoked another pipe but his discomfort increased his thoughts became more gloomy he found his room uncomfortable the morning dull and monotonous he was tired and despondent everything seemed repulsive his ideas were spiritless and revolved around nothing but unpleasant subjects and still his discomfort grew he wondered whether he was hungry it was one o'clock he never dined before three he anxiously examined his purse three pence half penny for the first time in his life he would have to go without dinner this was a trouble hitherto unknown to him but with three pence half penny there was no necessity to starve he could send for bread and beer no that would not do it was infra dig go to a dairy no borrow impossible he knew nobody who would lend. No sooner had he realized this than hunger began to rage in him like a wild beast let loose, biting him, tearing him, and chasing him round the room. He smoked the pipe after pipe to stupefy the monster, in vain. A rolling of drums from the barracks yard told him that the guardsmen were lining up with their copper vessels to receive their dinner. Every chimney was smoking. The dinner bell went in the dockyard. A hissing sound came from his neighbors, the policeman's kitchen. The smell of roast meat penetrated through the chinks of the door. He heard the rattling of knives and plates in the adjacent room, and the children sang grace. The paviars in the street below were taking their after-dinner nap with their heads on their empty food baskets. The whole town was dining, everybody except he. He raged against God, but all once a clear thought shot through his brain. He sees Ulrica Eleonora and the guardian angel, wrapped them in a paper, wrote Smith's name and address on the parcel, and handed the messenger his three pence half penny. And with a sigh of relief he threw himself on his sofa and starved, with a heart bursting with pride. End of chapter 5《ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ was standing before his easel working at his picture, which had to be in the exhibition on the following morning before ten, finished, framed, and varnished. Ali Montanus sat on the bed sofa reading the wonderful book lent to him by Yigberg for a day in exchange for his muffler. Between whiles he cast a look of admiration at Selen's picture. He had great faith in Selen's talent. Lundell was calmly working at his Descent from the Cross. He had already sent three pictures to the exhibition, and like many others, he was awaiting their sale with a certain amount of excitement. "'It's fine, Selen,' said Ollie. "'You paint divinely.' "'May I look at your spinach?' asked Lundell, who never admired anything, on principle. The subject was simple and grand. The picture represented a stretch of drifting sand on the coast of Holland, with the sea in the background. It was full of the feeling of autumn. Sunbeams were breaking through the riven clouds. The foreground was partly drift sand and newly washed up seaweed, dripping wet and lit by the sun. In the middle distance lay the sea with huge crested waves, the greater part in deep shadow. But in the background, on the horizon, 
the sun was shining, opening up a perspective into infinity. The only figures were a flock of birds. No unperverted mind who had the courage to face the mysterious wealth of solitude had seen promising harvests choked by the drifting sand could fail to understand the picture. It was painted with inspiration and talent. The coloring was the result of the prevailing mood. The mood was not engendered by the coloring. "'You must have something in the foreground,' persisted Lundell. "'Take my advice.' "'Rubbish,' replied Selwyn. "'Do what I tell you, and don't be a fool, otherwise you won't sell. Paint in a figure, a girl by preference. I'll help you if you don't know how to do it. Look here.' "'None of your tricks. What's the good of petticoats in a high wind? You're mad, Aunt Petticoats.' "'Very well. Do as you like,' replied Lundell, a little hurt by the reference to one of his weakest points. "'But instead of those gray gulls you should have painted, storks. Nobody can tell what sort of birds these are. Picture the red storks' legs against a dark cloud. What a contrast!' "'You don't understand.' Selwyn was not clever in stating his motives, but he was sure of his points and his sound instincts led him safely past all errors. "'You won't sell,' Lundell began again. His friend's financial position worried him. "'Well, I shall live tomorrow in spite of it. Have I ever sold anything? Am I the worst for it? Do you think I don't know that I should sell if I painted like everybody else? Do you think I can't paint as badly as everybody else? I just don't want to.' "'But you ought to think of paying your debts.' You owe Mr. Lund of Saucepan several hundred crowns. Well, that won't ruin him. Moreover, I gave him a picture worth twice that amount. You are the most selfish man I ever met. The picture wasn't worth twenty crowns. I value it at five hundred, as prices go. But unfortunately, inclinations and tastes differ here below. I find your crucifixion an execrable performance. You find it beautiful. Nobody can blame you for it tastes differ. But you spoilt our credit at the saucepan. Mr. Lund refused to give me credit yesterday, and I don't know how I'm going to get a dinner today. What does it matter? Do without it. I haven't had dinner these last two years. You plundered Mr. Falk the other day when he fell into your clutches. That's true. He's a nice chap. Moreover, he has talent. There's much originality in his verses. I have read some of them these last few evenings, but I'm afraid he's not hard enough to get on in this world. He's too sensitive, the rascal. If he sees much of you, he'll get over that. It's outrageous how you spoilt that young Renhelm in so short a time. I hear you are encouraging him to go on the stage. Did he tell you that? The little devil. He'll get on if he remains alive. But that's not so simple when one has so little to eat. God's death. I have no more paint. Can you spare any white? Merciful Lord, all the tubes are empty. You must give me some, Lundell. I've no more than I want for myself, and even if I had, I should take jolly good care not to give you any. Stop talking nonsense. You know there's no time to lose. Seriously, I haven't got your colors. If you weren't so wasteful, your tubes would go further. I know that. Give me some money, then. Money, indeed. That's a no-go. Get up, Ollie. You must go and pawn something. At the word pawn, Ollie's face brightened. He saw a prospect of food. Selen was searching the room. What's this? A pair of boots. We'll get two pence half penny on them. They better be sold. They're Renhelms. You can't take them, objected Lundell, who had meant to put them on in the afternoon when he was going up to town. Surely you aren't going to take liberties with other people's property. Why not? He'll be getting money for them. What's in this parcel? A velvet waistcoat. A beauty. I shall keep it for myself, and then Ollie can pawn mine. Collars and cuffs. Oh, paper. A pair of socks. Here, Ollie, two pence, half penny. Wrap them in the waistcoat. You can sell the empty bottles. I think the best thing would be to sell everything. Do you mean to say you are going to sell other people's belongings? Have you no sense of right and wrong? Interrupted Lundell again hoping to gain possession of the parcel which had long tempted him by means of persuasion. He'll get paid for it later on, but it isn't enough yet. We must take the sheets off the bed. Why not? We don't want any sheets. Here, Ollie, cram them in. Ollie, very skillfully, 
made a bag of one of the sheets and stuffed everything into it, while Lundell went on eagerly protesting. When the parcel was made, Ollie took it under his arm, buttoned his ragged coat so as to hide the absence of a waistcoat, and set out on his way to the town. "'He looks like a thief,' said Sellen, watching him from the window with a sly smile. "'I hope the police won't interfere with him. Hurry up, Ollie!' he shouted after the retreating figure. "'Buy six French rolls and two half-pints of beer, if there's anything over after you bought the paint.' Ollie turned round and waved his hat with as much assurance as if he had the feast already safely in his pockets. Lundell and Sellen were alone. Sellen was admiring his new velvet waistcoat for which Lundell had nursed a secret passion for a long time. He scraped his palate and cast envious glances at the lost glory. But it was something else he was trying to speak of, something else which was very difficult to mention. "'I wish you'd look at my picture,' he said at last. "'What do you think of it, seriously?' Don't draw and slave at it so much. Paint. Where does the light come from? From the clothes. From the flesh. It's crazy. What do these people breathe? Color? Turpentine? I see no air. Well, said Lundell, tastes differ, as you said just now. What do you think of the composition? Too many people. You're awful. I want more, not fewer. Let me see. There's one great mistake in it. Selwyn shot a long glance at the picture, a glance peculiar to the inhabitants of seacoasts and plains. "'Yes, you're right,' agreed Lundell. "'You can see it, then?' "'There are only men in your picture. It's somewhat monotonous.' "'That's it. But fancy that you should see that. You want a woman, then?' Lundell looked at him, wondering whether he was joking, but was unable to settle the point, for Selwyn was whistling. "'Yes, I want a female figure.' he replied at last. There was silence, and gradually the silence became uncomfortable. Two very old acquaintances in a tete-a-tete -tete conversation. I wish I knew where to get a model from. I don't want the Academy models. The whole world knows them, and besides, the subject is a religious one. You want something better? I understand. If it were not for the nude, I might perhaps... It isn't for the nude. Are you mad? Among all those men... Besides, it's a religious subject. Yes, yes, we know all that. She must be dressed in something oriental and bend down as if she were picking up something. Show her shoulders, her neck, and the first vertebra. I understand. Religious like the Magdalen. Bird's eye view. You scoff and jeer at everything. Let's keep to the point. You shall have your model, for it's impossible to paint without one. You yourself don't know one. Very well. Your religious principles don't allow you to look for one. Therefore, Renhelm and I, the two black sheep, will find you one. But it must be a respectable girl. Don't forget that. Of course. We will see what we can do the day after tomorrow, when we shall be in the funds. And they went on painting, quietly, diligently, until four, until five. Every now and then their anxious glances swept the road. Selwyn was the first to break the uneasy silence. Ollie is a long time. Something must have happened to him, he said. Yes, something must be up. But why do you always send the poor devil? Why can't you run your own errands? He's nothing else to do, and he likes going. How do you know? And besides, let me tell you, nobody can say how Ollie's going to turn out. He has great schemes, and he may be on his feet any day. Then it will be a good thing to have him for a friend. You don't say so. What great work is he going to accomplish? I can't quite believe that Ollie will become a great man, although not a great sculptor. But where the devil is he? Do you think he's spending the money? Possibly, possibly. He had nothing for a long time, and perhaps the temptation was too strong, answered Lundell, tightening his belt by two holes, and wondering what he would do in Ollie's place. Well, he's only human, and charity begins at home, said Selwyn, who knew practically well what he would have done under the circumstances. But I can't wait any longer. I must have paint, even if I have to steal it. I'll go and see Falk. Are you going to squeeze more out of that poor chap? You robbed him yesterday for your frame, and it wasn't a small sum you borrowed. My dear fellow, I am compelled to cast all feelings of shame to the winds. There is no help for it. One has to put up with a good deal. However, Falk is a great-hearted fellow, 
who understands that a man may suddenly find himself in Queer Street. Anyhow, I'm going. If Ollie returns in the meantime, tell him he's a blockhead. So long. Come to the Red Room, and we'll see whether our master will be graciously pleased to give us something to eat before the sun sets. Lock the door when you leave, and push the key underneath the mat. Bye-bye. He went, and before long he stood before Falk's door in Count Magni Street. He knocked, but received no reply. He opened the door and went in. Falk, who had probably had uneasy dreams, awakened from his sleep, jumped up and stared at Selwyn without recognizing him. "'Good evening, old chap,' said Selwyn. "'Oh, it's you? I must have had a strange dream. Good evening. Sit down and smoke a pipe. Is it evening already?' Selwyn thought he knew the symptoms, but he pretended to notice nothing. "'You didn't go to the brass button today,' he remarked. "'No,' replied Falk, confused. "'I wasn't there. I was at Iduna.' He really didn't know whether he had dreamt it or whether he had actually been there, but he was glad that he had said it, for he was ashamed of his position. "'Perfectly right, old chap,' commented Selwyn. "'The cooking at the brass button is beneath criticism.' "'It is, indeed,' agreed Falk. "'The soup's damn bad. "'And the old head-waiter is always on the spot, "'counting the rolls and butter, the rascal.' "'The words, rolls and butter, awakened Falk to consciousness. "'He did not feel hungry, only a little shaky and faint. "'But he did not like the subject of conversation and changed it. "'Well, will your picture be ready for tomorrow? he asked. "'No, unfortunately it won't. "'What's the matter now?' I can't possibly finish it. You can't? Why aren't you at home working? The old story. Old story, my dear fellow. I have no paint. No paint. But there's a remedy for that. Or haven't you any money? If I had, I should be all right. And I haven't any either. What's to be done? Selwyn dropped his eyes until his glance reached the height of Falk's waistcoat pocket, into which a heavy gold chain was creeping. Not that Selwyn believed it to be gold good stamp gold he could not have understood the recklessness of carrying so much money outside one's waistcoat but his thoughts were following a definite course and he continued if at least i had something to pawn but we carelessly pledged our winter overcoats on the first sunny day in april falk blushed he had never done such a thing do you pawn your winter overcoats he asked do you get anything on them one gets something on everything on everything said selwyn laying stress on everything the only thing needful is to have something to falk the room seemed to be turning round he had to sit down then he pulled out his gold watch how much do you think should i get on this watch and chain selwyn seized the future pledges and looked at them with the eye of a connoisseur is it gold he asked faintly it is gold stamped stamped the chain too the chain too a hundred crowns declared selwyn shaking his hand so that the gold chain rattled but it's a pity you shouldn't pawn your things for my sake then for my own said falk anxious to avoid the semblance of an unselfishness which he did not feel i want money too if you'll turn them into cash you'll do me a service all right then said selwyn resolved not to embarrass his friend by asking indelicate questions i'll pawn them Pull yourself together, old chap. Life is hard at times. I don't deny it, but we go through with it. He patted Falk's shoulder with a cordiality which did not often pierce the scorn with which he had enveloped himself. They went out together. By the time they had concluded the business, it was seven o'clock. They bought the paint and repaired to the Red Room. Burns' salon had just begun to play its civilizing part in the life of Stockholm, by putting an end to the unhealthy Café Chantant's life, which had flourished, or raged, in the sixties, and from the capital had spread over the whole country. Here, every evening after seven, crowds of young people met, who lived in the abnormal transition stage which begins on leaving the parental roof and ends with the foundation of a new home and family. Here were numbers of young men who had escaped from the solitude of their room or attic to find light and warmth and a fellow creature to talk to. The proprietor had made more than one attempt to amuse his patrons by pantomimic, gymnastic, ballet, and other performances, 
but he had been plainly shown that his guests were not in search of amusement, but in quest of peace. What was wanted was a consulting room, where one was likely every moment to chance on a friend. The band was tolerated because it did not stop conversation, but rather stimulated it, and gradually it became as much a component of the Stockholm evening diet as punch and tobacco. In this way, Burns Salon became the bachelor's club of all Stockholm. Every circle had its special corner. The colonists of Lil Jans had usurped the inner chess room, usually called the Red Room, on account of its red furniture, and for the sake of brevity. It was a safe meeting ground, even if during the whole day the members had been scattered like chaff. When times were hard and funds had to be raised at any cost, regular raids were made from this spot round the room. A chain was formed. Two members skirmished in the galleries, and two others attacked the room lengthwise. One might have said they dredged the room with a ground net, and they rarely dredged in vain, for there was a constant flow of new arrivals during the evening. Tonight, however, these efforts were not required. Selwyn, calmly and proudly, sat down on the red sofa in the background. After having acted a little farce on the subject of what they were going to drink, they came to the conclusion that they must have something to eat first. They were starting the Saxa, and Falk was beginning to feel a return of his strength when a long shadow fell across their table. Before them stood Yigberg, as pale and emaciated as ever. Selen, who was in funds tonight, and under those circumstances invariably courteous and kind-hearted, pressed him to have dinner with them, and Falk seconded the invitation. Yigberg hesitated while examining the contents of the dishes and calculating whether his hunger would be satisfied or only half satisfied. "'You will the stinging pen, Mr. Falk,' he said, in order to deflect the attention from the raids which his fork was making on the tray. "'How? What do you mean?' asked Falk, flushing. He did not know that anybody had made the acquaintance of his pen. "'The article has created a sensation.' What article? I don't understand. The correspondence in the People's Flag, on the Board of Payment of Employees' Salaries. I didn't write it. But the Board is convinced that you did. I just met a member who's a friend of mine. He mentioned you as the author. I understood that the resentment was fierce. Indeed. Falk felt that he was half to blame for it. He realized now what the notes were which Struve had been making on that evening on Moses Height, but Struve had merely reported what he, Falk, had said. He was responsible for his statements, and must stand by them even at the risk of being considered a scandal-monger. Retreat was impossible. He realized that he must go on. "'Very well,' he said. "'I am the instigator of the article. But let us talk of something else. What do you think of Ulrica Eleonora?' Isn't she an interesting character? Or what is your opinion of the Maritime Insurance Company, Triton, or Hackwin Spagel? Ulrika Eleonora is the most interesting character in the whole history of Sweden, answered Yigberg gravely. I've just had an order to write an essay on her. From Smith? asked Falk. Yes, but how do you know? I've returned to Block this afternoon. It's wrong to refuse work. You'll repent it, believe me. A hectic flush crimsoned Falk's cheeks. He spoke feverishly. Someone sat quietly on the sofa, smoking. He paid more attention to the band than to the conversation, which did not interest him because he did not understand it. From his sofa corner he could see through the two open doors leading to the south gallery and catch a glimpse of the north gallery. In spite of the dense cloud of smoke which hung above the pit between the two galleries, he could distinguish the faces on the other side. Suddenly his attention was caught by something in the distance. He clutched Falk's arm. The sly boots. Look behind the left curtain. Lundell? Just so. He's looking for Magdalene. See? He's talking to her now. What a beautiful girl. Falk blushed, a fact which did not escape Sullen. Does he come here for his models? he asked in surprise. Well, where else should he go? He can't find him in the dark. A moment afterwards, Lundell joined them. Sullen greeted him with a patronizing nod, the significance of which did not seem to be lost on the newcomer. 
he bowed to Falk with more than his usual politeness, and expressed his astonishment at Yigberg's presence in disparaging words. Yigberg, carefully observing him, seized the opportunity to ask him what he would like to eat. Lundell opened his eyes. He seemed to have fallen among magnets. He felt happy. A gentle, philanthropic mood took possession of him, and after ordering a hot supper, he felt constrained to give expression to his emotion. It was obvious that he wanted to say something to Falk, but it was difficult to find an opening. The band was playing, Hear us, Sweden, and a moment afterwards, A stronghold is our God. Falk called for more drink. I wonder whether you admire this fine old hymn as much as I do, Mr. Falk, began Lundell. Falk, who was not conscious of admiring any one hymn more than another, asked him to have some punch. Lundell had misgivings. He did not know whether he could venture. He thought he had better have some more supper first. He was not strong enough to drink. He tried to prove it, after his third liqueur, by a short but violent attack of coughing. "'The Torch of Reconciliation is a splendid name,' he said presently. "'It proves at the same time the deep religious need of atonement and the light which came into the world when the miracle happened, <coughs> which has always given offense to the proud in spirit.' He swallowed the meatball while carefully studying the effect of his remark, and felt anything but flattered when he saw three blank faces staring at him, expressing nothing but consternation. Spiegel is a great name, and his words are not like the words of the Pharisees. We all know that he wrote the magnificent psalm. The wailing cries are silent, a psalm which has never been equaled. Your health, Mr. Falk, I am glad to hear that you are identifying yourself with the work of such a man. Lundell discovered that his glass was empty. I think I must have another half pint. Two thoughts were humming in Falk's brain. The fellow is drinking neat brandy. And... How did he get to know about Spiegel? A suspicion that illuminated his mind like a flash of lightning, but he pretended to know nothing, and merely said, Your health, Mr. Lundell. The unpleasant explanation which seemed bound to follow was avoided by the sudden entrance of Ollie. It was Ollie, but more rugged than before, dirtier than before, and, to judge from his appearance, lamer than before. His hips stood out beneath his coat like bow spirits. A single button kept his coat together, close above his first rib. But he was in good spirits, and laughed on seeing so much food and drink on the table. To Selwyn's horror, he began to report on the success of his mission, all the time divesting himself of his acquisitions. He had really been arrested by the police. "'Here are the tickets,' he handed Selwyn two green pawn tickets across the table, which Selwyn instantly converted into a paper pellet. He had been taken to the police station. He pointed to his coat, the collar of which was missing. There he was asked for his name. His name was, of course, assumed. There existed no such name as Montanus. His native place? Vastmanland. Again a false statement. The inspector was a native of that province, and knew his countrymen. His age? Twenty-eight years. That was a lie. He must be at least forty. His domicile? Lillian's, another lie. Nobody but a gardener lived there. His profession? Artist. That was also a lie, for he looked like a dock laborer. Here is your paint. Four tubes. Better look at them carefully. His parcel had been open, and in the process one of the sheets had been torn. Therefore I only got one and two pence half penny for both. You'll see that I'm right if you look at the ticket. The next question was where he had stolen the things. Ollie had replied that he had not stolen them. Then the inspector drew his attention to the fact that he had not been asked whether he had stolen them, but where he had stolen them. Where? 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 Here is your change. Two pence, half penny. I've kept nothing back. Then the evidence was taken down, and the stolen goods, which had been sealed with three seals, were described. In vain had Ollie protested. In vain had he appealed to their sense of justice and humanity. The only result of his protestations was a suggestion made by the constable to place on record that the prisoner, he was already regarded in the light of a prisoner, was heavily intoxicated. The suggestion was acted upon, but the word heavily was omitted. 
after the inspector had repeatedly urged the constable to try and remember whether the prisoner had offered resistance at his arrest and the constable had declared that he could not take his oath on it it would have been a very serious matter for the prisoner looked a desperate character but it had appeared to him that he had tried to resist by taking refuge in a doorway the latter statement was placed on record then a report was drawn up and ollie was ordered to sign it it ran as follows a male individual of sinister and forbidding appearance was found slinking along the row of houses in northland street carrying a suspicious-looking parcel in his hand on his arrest he was dressed in a green frock coat he wore no waistcoat blue serge trousers a shirt and the initials p l which clearly proves that either the shirt was stolen or that he had given a wrong name woolen stockings with gray edges and felt hat with a cock's feather prisoner gave the assumed name of ali montanus falsely deposed that his people were peasants in vasmalan and that he was an artist domiciled at lillian's obviously an invention on being arrested he tried to offer resistance by taking refuge in a doorway then followed a minute description of the contents of the parcel as Ali refused to admit the correctness of this report, a telegram was sent to the prison, and a conveyance appeared to fetch Ali, the bundle, and a constable. As they were turning into Mint Street, Ali caught sight of Pur Ilson, a member of Parliament, and a countryman of his. He called to him, and Pur Ilson proved that the report was wrong. Ali was released, and his bundle was restored to him, and now he had come to join them, and here are your french rolls there are only five of them for i've eaten one and here's the beer he produced five french rolls from his coat pockets laid them on the table and placed two bottles of beer which he pulled out of his trousers pockets by the side of them after which his figure resumed its usual disproportions falk old chap you must excuse ollie he's not used to smart society put the french rolls back into your pockets ollie what will you be up to next said selwyn disapprovingly ollie obeyed lundell refused to have the tray taken away although he had cleared the dishes so thoroughly it would have been impossible to say what they had contained every now and then he seized the brandy bottle absent-mindedly and poured himself out half a glass occasionally he stood up or turned around in his chair to see what the band was playing on those occasions selwyn kept a close eye on him at last Renhelm arrived. He had obviously been drinking. He sat down silently, his eyes seeking an object on which they could rest while he listened to Lundell's exhortations. Finally his weary eyes fell on Selwyn and remained riveted on the velvet waistcoat, which gave him plenty of food for thought for the remainder of the evening. His face brightened momentarily as if he had met an old friend, but the light on it went out as Selwyn buttoned up his coat, because there was a draft. Yigberg took care that Ollie had some supper, and never tired of urging him to help himself and to fill his glass. As the evening advanced, music and conversation grew more and more lively. The state of semi-stupor had a great charm for Falk. It was warm, light, and noisy here. He was in the company of men whose lives he had prolonged for a few more hours, and who were therefore gay and lively as flies revived by the rays of the sun. He felt that he was one of them, for he knew that in their inner consciousness they were unhappy. They were unassuming, they understood him, and they talked like human beings and not like books. Even their coarseness was not unattractive. There was so much naturalness in it, so much innocence. Even Lundell's hypocrisy did not repulse him. It was so naive and sat on him so loosely that it could have been cast off at any moment. And the evening passed away, and the day was over which had pushed Falk irrevocably onto the thorny path of the writer. End of chapter 6on the following morning, Falk was awakened by a maid servant who bought him a letter. He opened it and read, 
Timothy, Book 10, Verses 27, 28, 29. First Corinthians, Book 6, Verses 3, 4, and 5. Dear Brother, the grace and peace of our Lord J.C., the love of the Father, and the fellowship of H.G., etc. Amen. I read last night in the gray bonnet that you are going to edit The Torch of Reconciliation. Meet me in the office tomorrow morning. Your saved brother, Nathaniel Scorey. Now he particularly understood Lundell's riddle. He did not know Scorey, the great champion of the Lord, personally. He knew nothing of the torch of reconciliation. But he was curious and decided to obey the insolent request. At nine o'clock, he was in the government street, looking at the imposing four-storied house, the front of which, from cellar to roof, was covered by signboards. Kristen Printing Office, Peace, Limited, Second Floor, Editorial Office, The Inheritance of the Children of God, Half Landing Floor, Publishing Office, The Last Judgment, First Floor, Publishing Office, The Trump of Peace, Second Floor, Editorial Office of the Children's Paper, Feed My Lambs, First Floor, Offices of the Kristen Prayer House Society, Limited, The Seat of Mercy, Loans Granted Against First Securities, Third Floor, Come to Jesus, Third Floor, Employment Found for Respectable Salesmen Who Can Offer Security, Foreign Mission Society, Limited, Eagle, Distribution of the Profits of the Year, 1867, in Coupons, Second Floor. Offices of the Christian Mission Steamer, Zululu, Second Floor. The steamer will leave D. Period, v. Period, on the 28th. Goods received against Bill of Lading and Certificate at the shipping offices, close to the landing bridge where the steamer is loading. Needlework Society, Ant Heap, receives gifts, First Floor. Clergymen's bands washed and ironed by the porter. Wafers at one shilling, six pennies a pound, obtainable from the porter. Black dress coats for confirmation candidates let out. Unfermented wine, Matthew chapter 19, verse 32, at nine and a half pennies per quart. Apply to the porter. Bring your own jug. On the ground floor to the left of the archway was a Christian bookshop. Falk stopped for a few moments and read the titles of the books exhibited in the window. It was the usual thing. Indiscreet questions, impudent charges, offensive familiarities. But his attention was mainly attracted to a number of illustrated magazines with large English woodcuts displayed in the window in order to attract the passers-by. More especially, the children's papers had an interesting table of contents and a young man in the shop could have told anyone who cared to know that old men and women would pass hours before this window, lost in contemplation of the illustrations which appeared to move their pious hearts and awaken memories of their vanished and perhaps wasted youth. He climbed a broad staircase between Pompeian frescoes, reminiscent of the path which does not lead to salvation, and came to a large room furnished with desks like a bank, but so far unoccupied by cashiers and bookkeepers. In the center of the room stood a writing table of the size of an altar, resembling an organ with many stops. There was a complete keyboard with buttons and semaphores with trumpet-like speaking tubes connected with all parts of the building. A big man in riding boots was standing at the writing desk. He wore a cassock fastened with one button at the neck, which gave it a military appearance. The coat was surmounted by a white band and the mask of a sea captain, for the real face had long ago been mislaid in one of the desks or boxes. The big man was slapping the tops of his boots with his horsewhip, the handle of which was in the form of a symbolical hoof, and sedulously smoking and chewing a strong regalia, probably to keep his jaws in trim. Falk looked at the big man in astonishment. This, then, was the last fashion in clergymen, for in men, too, there is a fashion. This was the great promulgator who had succeeded in making it fashionable to be sinful, to thirst for mercy, to be poor and wretched, in fact, to be a worthless specimen of humanity in every possible way. This was the man who had brought salvation in vogue, 
he had discovered a gospel for smart society. The divine ordinance of grace had become a sport. There were compilations in viciousness in which the prize was given to the sinner. Paper chases were arranged to catch poor souls for the purpose of saving them. But also, let us confess it, Battus, for subjects on whom to demonstrate one's conversion in a practical manner by venting on them the most cruel charity. Oh, it's you, Mr. Falk, said the mask. Welcome, dear friend. Perhaps you would like to see something of my work. Pardon me, I hope you are saved. Yes, this is the office of the printing works. Excuse me a second. He stepped up to the organ and pulled out several stops. The answer was a long whistle. Just have a look around. He put his mouth to one of the trumpets and shouted, The seventh trumpet and the eighth woe, composition, medieval eight, titles, gothic, names, spaced out. A voice answered through the same trumpet. No more manuscript. The mass sat down at the organ and took a pen and a sheet of fool's cap. The pen raced over the paper while he talked cigar in mouth. This activity is so extensive that it would soon be beyond my strength and my health, would be worse than it is if I did not look after it so well. He jumped up, pulled out another stop, and shouted into another trumpet, Proofs of Have You Paid Your Debt? Then he continued writing and talking. You wonder why I wear riding boots. It's first because I take writing exercises for the sake of my health. A boy appeared with proofs. The mask handed them to Falk. Please read that, he said, speaking through his nose, because his mouth was busy while his eyes shouted to the boy, Wait. Secondly, a movement of the ears plainly conveyed to Falk that he had not lost the thread. Because... I am of opinion that a spiritually minded man should not be conspicuous by his appearance, for this would be spiritual pride and a challenge to the scoffers. A bookkeeper entered. The mask acknowledged his salutation by a wrinkling of his forehead, the only part of his face which was unoccupied. For want of something else to do, Falk took the proofs and began to read them. The cigar continued talking. Everybody wears riding boots. I won't be conspicuous by my appearance. I wear riding boots because I'm no humbug. He handed the manuscript to the boy and shouted with his lips, Four sticks, seven trumpet for Nystrom, and then to Falk, I shall be disengaged in five minutes. Will you come with me to the warehouse? And to the bookkeeper, Zululu is charging? Brandy, answered the bookkeeper in a rusty voice. Everything all right? Everything's all right. In God's name, then, come along, Mr. Falk. They entered a room, the walls of which were lined with shelves, filled with piles of books. The mass touched them with his horsewhip and said proudly, I've written those. What do you think of that? Isn't it a lot? You too write. A little. If you stick to it, you might write as much. He bit and tore at his cigar and spat out the tiny flakes which filled the air like flies and settled on the backs of the books. His face wore a look of contempt. The Torch of Reconciliation. Hmm. I think it's a stupid name. Don't you rather agree with me? What made you think of it? For the first time, Falk had a chance of getting in a word for like all great men, the mask answered his own questions. His reply was in the negative, but he got no further. The mask again usurped the conversation. I think it's a very stupid name, and do you really believe that it will draw? I know nothing whatever about the matter. I don't know what you are talking about. You don't know? He took up a paper and pointed to a paragraph. Falk, very much taken aback, read the following advertisement. Notice to subscribers, The Torch of Reconciliation, magazine for Christian readers about to appear under the editorship of Arvid Falk, whose work has been awarded a prize by the Academy of Sciences. The first number will contain God's creation, 
by Hoken Spago, a poem of an admittedly religious and profoundly Christian spirit. Falk had forgotten Spago and his agreement. He stood speechless. How large is the addition going to be? What? Two thousand? I suppose. Too small. No good. My last judgment was ten thousand, and yet I didn't make more than, what shall I say, fifteen? Net? Fifteen? Thousand, young man. The mask seemed to have forgotten his part and reverted to old habits. You know, he continued, that I am a popular preacher. I may say that without boasting, for all the world knows it. You know that I am very popular. I can't help that. It is so. I should be a hypocrite if I pretended not to know what all the world knows. Well, I'll give you a helping hand to begin with. Look at this bag here. If I say that it contains letters from persons, ladies, don't upset yourself, I'm a married man. Begging for my portrait? I have not said too much. As a matter of fact, it was nothing but an ordinary bag, which he touched with his whip. To save them, and me, a great deal of trouble, and at the same time for the sake of doing fellow man a kindness, I have decided to permit you to write my biography. Then you can safely issue ten thousand copies of your first number and pocket a clear thousand. But my dear pastor, he had it on the tip of his tongue to say, Captain, I know nothing at all about this matter. Never mind, never mind. The publisher has himself written to me and asked me for my portrait, and you are to write my biography. To facilitate your work, I asked a friend to write down the principal points. You have only to write an introduction, brief and eloquent, a few sticks at the most. That's all. So much foresight depressed Falk. He was surprised to find the portrait so unlike the original, and the friend's handwriting so much like that of the mask. The latter, who had given him portrait and manuscript, now held out his hand expecting to be thanked. My regards to the publisher, he had nearly said Smith, that a slight blush appeared between his whiskers. But you don't know my views yet, protested Falk. Views? Have I asked what your views are? I never asked anybody about his views. God forbid. I? Never. Once more he touched the backs of his publications with his whip, opened the door, let the biographer out, and returned to his service at the altar. Falk, as usual, could not think of a suitable answer until it was too late. When he thought of one, he was already in the street. A cellar window, which happened to stand wide open, and was not covered with advertisements, received biography and portrait into safekeeping. Then Falk went to the nearest newspaper office, handed in a protest against the torch of reconciliation, and resigned himself to starve. End of chapter 7「Poor Mother Country」The clock on the Ritterholmes church struck ten as Falk arrived a few days later at the parliamentary buildings to assist the representative of the Red Cap in reporting the proceedings of the Second Chamber. He hastened his footsteps, convinced that here, where the pay was good, strict punctuality would be looked upon as a matter of course. He climbed the committee stairs and was shown to the reporter's gallery on the left. A feeling of awe overcame him as he walked across the few boards, hung up under the roof like a pigeon house, where the men of free speech listened to the discussion of the country's most sacred interest by the country's most worthy representatives. It was a new sensation to Falk, but he was far from being impressed as he looked down from his scaffolding into the empty hall which resembled a Lancastrian school. It was five minutes past ten, but with the exception of himself, not a soul was present. All of a sudden the silence was broken by a scraping noise. A rat, he thought, but almost immediately he discovered, on the opposite gallery, across the huge, empty hall, a short, abject figure sharpening a pencil on the rail. 
he watched the chips fluttering down and settling on the tables below. His eyes scanned the empty walls without finding a resting place until finally they fell on the old clock dating from the time of Napoleon I, with its imperial newly lit emblems, symbolical of the old story, and its hands, now pointing to ten minutes past ten, symbolical in the spirit of irony, of something else. At the moment, the doors in the background opened, and a man entered. He was old. His shoulders stooped under the burden of public offices. His back had shrunk under the weight of communal commissions. The long continuance in damp offices, committee rooms, and safe deposits had warped his neck. There was a suggestion of the pensioner in his calm footsteps as he walked up the coconut matting towards the chair. When he had reached the middle of the long passage and had come into line with the imperial clock, he stopped. He seemed accustomed to stopping halfway and looking round and backwards, but now he stopped to compare his watch with the clock. He shook his old, worn-out head with a look of discontent. Fast, fast, he murmured. His features expressed a supernatural calm and the assurance that his watch could not be slow. He continued his way with the same deliberate footsteps. He might be walking towards the goal of his life, and it was very much a question whether he had not attained it when he arrived at the venerable chair on the platform. When he was standing close by it, he pulled out his handkerchief and blew his nose. His eyes roamed over the brilliant audience of chairs and tables, announcing an important event. Gentlemen, I have blown my nose. Then he sat down and sank into a presidential calm, which might have been sleep, if it had not been waking, and alone in the large room, as he imagined, alone with his God. He prepared to summon strength for the business of the day, when a loud scraping on the left, high up, underneath the roof, pierced the stillness. He started and turned his head to kill, with a three-quarter look, the rat, which dared to gnaw in his presence. Falk, who had omitted to take into account the resonant capacity of the pigeon house, received the deadly thrust of the murderous glance. But the glance softened as it slid down the ease moldings, whispering, Only a reporter. I was afraid it might be a rat. And deep regret stole over the murderer, contrition at the sin committed by his eye. He buried his face in his hands and wept? Oh, no. He rubbed off the spot which the appearance of a repulsive object had thrown on his retina. Presently, the doors were flung wide open. The delegates were beginning to arrive. While the hands on the clock crept forward, the president rewarded the good with friendly nods and pressures of the hand, and punished the evildoers by turning away his head. He was bound to be just as the Most High. The reporter of the Red Cap arrived. An unprepossessing individual not quite sober, and only half awake. In spite of this, he seemed to find pleasure in answering truthfully the questions put by the newcomer. Once more the doors were flung open, and in stalked a man with as much self-assurance as if he were in his own home. He was the treasurer of the Inland Revenue Office, and actuary of the Board of Payment of Employees' Salaries. He approached the chair, greeted the president like an old acquaintance, and began to rummage in the papers as if they were his own. "'Who's this?' asked Falk. "'The chief clerk,' answered his friend from the red cap. "'What? Do they write here too, then?' Two? You'll soon see. They keep a story full of clerks. "'The attics are full of clerks, and they'll soon have clerks in the cellars.' The room below was now presenting the aspect of an ant heap. A rap of the hammer, and there was silence. The head clerk read the minutes of the last meeting, and they were signed without comment. Then the same man read a petition for a fortnight's leave, sent in by John Johnson from Lurback. It was granted. Do they have holidays here? asked the novice, surprised. Certainly. John Johnson wants to go home and plant his potatoes. The platform down below was now beginning to fill with young men armed with pen and paper. All of them were old acquaintances from the time when Falk was a government official. They took their seats at little tables as if they were going to play preference. Those are the clerks, explained the red cap. They appear to recognize you. And they really did. And they put on their eyeglasses and stared at the pigeon house with the condescension vouchsafed in a theater by the occupants of the stalls to the occupants of the galleries. They whispered among themselves, evidently discussing an absent acquaintance who, 
from unmistakable evidence, must have been sitting on the chair occupied by Falk. The latter was so deeply touched by the general interest that he looked with anything but a friendly eye on Struve, who was entering the pigeon house, reserved, unembarrassed, dirty, and a conservative. The chief clerk read a petition, or a resolution, to grant the necessary money for the provision of the new doormats and new brass numbers on the lockers, destined for the reception of overshoes. Granted. Where is the opposition? asked the tyro. Devil knows. But they say yes to everything. Wait a little and you'll see. Haven't they come yet? Here everyone comes and goes as he pleases. But this is the government offices all over again. The conservative Struve, who had heard the frivolous words, thought it incumbent upon him to take up the cudgels for the government. What is this? Little Falkus sang? he asked. Mustn't growl here. It took Falk so long to find a suitable reply that the discussions down below had started in the meantime. Don't mind him, said the red cap soothingly. He's invariably a conservative when he has the price of a dinner in his pocket, and he's just borrowed a fiver from me. The chief clerk was reading. 54. Report of the committee on Ola Hipson's motion to remove defenses. Timber merchant Larson from Norland demanded acceptance at as it stood. What is to become of our forest? he burst out. I ask you, what is to become of our forest? And he threw himself on his bench, puffing. This racy eloquence had gone out of fashion during the last few years, and the words were received with hisses, after which the puffing on the Norland bench ceased. The representative of Oland suggested sandstone walls. Scania's delegate preferred box. Norbotten's opined that fences were unnecessary, where there were no fields and a member on the Stockholm bench proposed that the matter should be referred to a committee of experts. He laid stress on experts. A violent scene followed, death rather than a committee. The question was put to the vote. The motion was rejected. The fences would remain standing until they decayed. The chief clerk was reading, 66, report of the committee on Carl Janssen's proposition to intercept the monies for the Bible Commission. At the sound of the venerable name of an institution a hundred years old, even the smiles died away and a respectful silence ensued. Who would dare to attack religion in its very foundation? Who would dare to face universal contempt? The bishop of Ystad asked permission to speak. Shall I write? asked Falk. No, what he says doesn't concern us. But the conservative Struve took down the following notes. Sacred, Mother Country, United Names Religion Humanity, 829, 1632. Unbelief. Mania for Innovations. God's Word. Man's Word. Senton. Ansgar. Zeal. Honesty. Fair Play. Kapak. Doctrine. Exist. Swede. Church. Immemorial Swede. Honor. Gustavs I. Gustavs Adolphus. Hill Lutzen. Eyes, Europe. Verdict, posterity. Morning, shame. Green fields. Wash my hands. They would not hear. Carl Janssen held the floor. Now it's our turn, said the red cap, and they wrote while Struve embroidered the bishop's velvet. Twaddle, big words. Commission, sat for a hundred years. Cost, one hundred thousand crowns. Nine archbishops. Thirty professors. Uppsala. Together, five hundred years. Dietaries, secretaries, done nothing. Proof sheet, bad work, money, 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 everything by its right name. Humbug, official sucking system. No one else spoke up, but when the question was put to the vote, the motion was accepted, while the bread cap, with practice hands, smoothed Janssen's stumbling speech and provided it with a strong title. Falk took a rest, accidentally scanning the stranger's gallery, his gaze fell on a well-known head, resting on the rail and belonging to Ali Montanus. At the moment he had the appearance of a dog, carefully watching a bone, and he was not there without a very definite reason, but Falk was in the dark. Ali was very secretive, from the end of the bench, just below the right gallery, on the very spot where the abject individual's pencil ships had fluttered down, a man now arose. He wore a blue uniform had a three-cornered hat tucked under his arm, and held a roll of paper in his hand. The hammer fell, 
and an ironical, malicious silence followed. Right, said the red cap. Take down the figures. I'll do the rest. Who is it? These are royal propositions. The man in blue was reading from the paper roll. H. M. Most gracious proposition to increase the funds of the department assisting young men of birth in the study of foreign languages under the heading of stationary and sundry expenses from fifty crowns to fifty-six crowns, thirty-seven or. What are sundry expenses? asked Falk. Water bottles, umbrella stands, spittoons, Venetian blinds, dinners, tips, and so on. Be quiet. There's no more to come. The paper roll went on. H. M. Most gracious proposition to create sixty new commissions in the West Gothic Calvary. Did he say sixty? asked Falk, who was unfamiliar with public affairs. Sixty, yes, write it down. The paper roll opened out and it grew bigger and bigger. H. M. Most gracious proposition to create five new regular clerkships in the Board of Payment of Employees' Salaries. Great excitement at the preference tables, great excitement on Falk's chair. Now the paper rolled itself up. The chairman rose and thanked the reader with a bow which plainly said, Is there something else we can do? The owner of the paper roll sat down on the bench and blew away the chips the man above him had allowed to fall down. His stiff, embroidered collar prevented him from committing the same offense which the president had perpetrated earlier in the morning. The proceedings continued. The peasant, Sven Svensson, asked for permission to say a few words on the poor law. With one accord all the reporters arose, yawned, and stretched themselves. "'We'll go to lunch now,' explained the red cap. "'We have an hour and ten minutes.' But the Sven Svensson was speaking. The delegates began to get up from their places. Two or three of them went out. The president spoke to some of the good members, and by doing so expressed in the name of the government his disapproval of all Sven Svensson might be going to say. Two older members pointed him out to a newcomer as if he were a strange beast. They watched him for a few moments, found him ridiculous, and turned their backs on him. The red cap was under the impression that politeness required him to explain that the speaker was the scourge of the chamber. He was neither hot nor cold, could be used by no party, be won for no interest, but he spoke. What he spoke about no one could tell, for no paper reported him, and nobody took the trouble to look up the records. But the clerks at the tables had sworn that if they ever came into power, they would amend the laws for his sake. Falk, however, who had a certain weakness for all those who were overlooked, remained behind and heard what he had not heard for many a day. A man of honor, who lived an irreproachable life, espousing the cause of the oppressed and the downtrodden, while nobody listened to him. Struve, at the sight of the peasant, had taken his own departure, and had gone to a restaurant. He was quickly followed by all the reporters and half the deputies. After luncheon they returned and sat down on the narrow stairs. For a little longer they heard Sven Svensson speaking, or rather saw him speaking, for now the conversation had become so lively that not a single word of the speech could be understood. But the speaker was bound to come to an end. Nobody had any objections to make. His speech had no result whatsoever. It was exactly as if it had never been made. The chief clerk, who during this interval had had time to go to his offices, looked at the official papers and poked his fires, was again in his place reading, 72, Memorial of the Royal Commission, on Per Ilsen's motion to grant 10,000 crowns for the restoration of the old sculptures in the church of Trascola. The dog's head on the rail of the stranger's gallery assumed a threatening aspect. He looked as if he were going to fight for his bone. Do you know the freak up there in the gallery? asked the red cap. Ollie Montanus. Yes, I know him. Do you know that he and the church at Trascola are countrymen? He's a shrewd fellow. Look at the expression on his face now that Trascola's turn has come. Per Ilsen was speaking. Struve contemptuously turned his back on the speaker and cut himself a piece of tobacco. But Falk and the red cap trimmed their pencils for action. You take the flourishes, I'll take the facts, said the red cap. After the lapse of a quarter of an hour, Falk's paper was covered with the following notes. Native culture, social interest, charge of materialism, accord, fichte material, native culture, not matter, 
ergo charge rejected, venerable temple, in the radiance morning, sun pointing heavenwards, from heath, times philos, never dreamt, sacred rites, nation, sacred, native cult, literature, academy, history, antiquity. The speech, which had repeatedly called forth the universal amusement, especially at the exhumation of the deceased Fichte, provoked replies from the Metropolitan Bench and the Bench of Uppsala. The delegate on the Metropolitan Bench said that although he knew neither of the Church of Trescola nor Fichte, and doubted whether the old plaster boys were worth ten thousand crowns, yet he thought himself justified in urging the chamber to encourage this beautiful undertaking as it was the first time the majority had asked for money for a purpose other than the building of bridges, fences, national schools, etc. The delegate on the bench of Uppsala held, according to Struz's notes, that the mover of the proposition was a priori right, that his premise that native culture should be encouraged was correct, that the conclusion that 10,000 crowns should be voted was binding, that the purpose, the aim, the tendency was beautiful, praiseworthy, patriotic, but an error had certainly been committed. By whom? By the mother country? The state? The church? No. By the proponent? The proponent was right, according to common sense, and therefore the speaker, he begged the chamber to pardon the repetition, could only praise the purpose, the aim, the tendency. The proposition had its warmest sympathies. He was calling on the chamber in the name of the mother country, in the name of art and civilization, to vote for it. But he himself felt bound to vote against it, because he was of the opinion that, conformable to the idea, it was erroneous, motiveless, and figurative, as it subsumed the conception of the place under that of the state. The head in the stranger's gallery rolled its eyes and moved its lips convulsively while the motion was put to a vote. But when the proceeding was over and the proposition had been accepted, the head disappeared in a discontented and jostling audience. Falk did not fail to understand the connection between Per Ilsen's proposition and Ollie's presence and disappearance. Struve, who had become even more loud and conservative after lunch, talked unreservedly of many things. The red cap was calm and indifferent. He had ceased to be astonished at anything. From the dark cloud of humanity which had been rent by Ollie's exit, suddenly broke a face, clear, bright, and radiant as the sun, and Arvid Falk, whose glances had strayed to the gallery, felt compelled to cast down his eyes and turn away his head. He had recognized his brother, the head of the family, the pride of the name, which he intended to make great and honorable. Behind Nicholas Falk's shoulder half of a black face could be seen, gentle and deceitful, which seemed to whisper secrets into the ear of the fair man. Falk had only time to be surprised at his brother's presence. He knew his resentment at the new form of administration, for the president had given Anders Anderson permission to state a proposition. Anderson availed himself of the permission with the greatest calm. In view of certain events, he read, moved that a bill should be passed making His Majesty jointly and severably liable for all joint stock companies whose statutes he has sanctioned. The sun on the stranger's gallery lost its brilliancy, and a storm burst out in the chamber. Like a flash, Count Splint was on his legs. Quasque tandem, Catalina? It has come to that? Members are forgetting themselves so far as to dare to criticize government? Yes, gentlemen, criticize government, or what is even worse, make a joke of it, for this motion cannot be anything but a vulgar joke. Did I say joke? It is treason. Oh, my poor country, your unworthy sons have forgotten the debt they owe you. But what else can we expect, now that you have lost your knightly guard, your shield, and your arms? I request the blackguard per Anderson, or whatever his name may be, to withdraw his motion, or, by God, he shall see that king and country still have loyal servants, able to pick up a stone and fling it at the head of the many-headed hydra of treason. Applause from the stranger's gallery. Indignation in the chamber. Ha! Do you think I'm afraid? The speaker made a gesture as if he were throwing a stone. But on every one of the hydra's hundred faces lay a smile. Glaring round in search of a hydra which did not smile, the speaker discovered it in the reporter's gallery. 
There, there! He pointed to the pigeon house, and in his eyes lay an expression as if he saw all hell open. That's the crow's nest. I hear their croaking, but it doesn't frighten me. Arise, men of Sweden. Cut off the tree, saw through the boards, pull down the beams, kick the chairs to pieces, break the desk in the fragments, small as my little finger. He held it up. And then burn the blackguards until nothing of them is left. Then the kingdom will flourish in peace, and its institutions will thrive. Thus speaks the Swedish nobleman. Peasants, remember his words. This speech, which three years ago would have been welcomed with acclamations, taken down verbatim and printed and circulated in national schools and other charitable institutions, was received with universal laughter. An amended version was placed on the record, and, strange to say, it was only reported by the opposition papers, which do not, as a rule, care to publish outbursts of this description. The Uppsala bench again craved permission to speak. The speaker quite agreed with the last speaker. His acute ear had caught something of the old rattling of swords. He would like to say a few words. He would like to speak of the idea of a joint stock company as an idea, but begged to be allowed to explain to the chamber that a joint stock company was not an accumulation of funds, not a combination of people, but a moral personality, and as such not responsible. Shouts of laughter and loud conversation prevented the reporters from hearing the remainder of the argument, which closed with the remark that the interests of the country were at stake, conformable to the idea, and that, if the motion were rejected, the interests of the country would be neglected and the state in danger. Six speakers filled up the interval until dinner time by giving extracts from the official statistics of Sweden, Nauman's Fundamental Statues, the Legal Textbook, and the Gutberg Commercial Gazette. The conclusion invariably arrived at was that the country was in danger if His Majesty were to be jointly and severally liable for all joint stock companies, the statues of which he had sanctioned, and that the interests of the whole country were at stake. One of the speakers was bold enough to say that the interests of the country stood on a throw of the dice. Others were the opinion that they stood on a card, others again that they hung on a thread. The last speaker said they hung on a hair. At noon, the proposition to go into committee on the motion was rejected. That was to say, there was no need for the country to go through the committee mill, the office sieve, the imperial shaft cutter, the club winnower, and the newspaper hubbub. The country was saved. Poor country. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Bills of Exchange. Some time after Harvard Falk's first experience as a reporter, Charles Nicholas Falk and his beloved wife were sitting at the breakfast table. He was, contrary to his custom, not in dressing gown and slippers, and his wife was wearing an expensive morning gown. Yes, they were all here yesterday, said Mrs. Falk, laughing gaily. All five of them, and they were extremely sorry about the matter. I wish the deuce. Nicholas, remember, you are no longer standing behind the counter. What am I to say, then, if I lose my temper? One doesn't lose one's temper, one gets annoyed, and it's permissible to say... It's very extraordinary. Very well, then. It's very extraordinary that you have always something unpleasant up your sleeve. Why can't you refrain from telling me things you know will irritate me? Vex you, old man. You expect me to keep my vexation to myself, but you lie? Lay, old girl. I said lie. Your burden's on my shoulders, too. Was that what you promised me when we got married? Don't make a scene, and don't let's have any of your logic. Go on. They were all here, Mama and your five sisters? Four sisters. You don't care much for your family. No more do you. No more do I. And they came here to condole with you on account of my brother's discharge? Is that so? Yes, and they were impertinent enough to say that I had no longer any reason to be stuck up. Proud, old girl. They said stuck up. Personally, 
I should never have condescended to make use of such an expression. What did you say? I expect you gave him a piece of your mind. You may depend on that. The old lady threatened never again to cross our threshold. Did she really? Do you think she meant it? No, I don't. But I'm certain that the old man... You shouldn't speak of your father in that tone, supposing somebody heard you. Do you think I should run that risk? However, the old man, between you and me, will never come here again. Falk pondered. After a while, he resumed the conversation. Is your mother proud? Is she easily hurt? I'm always so afraid of hurting people's feelings, as you know. You ought to tell me about her weak points so that I can take care. You ask me whether she is proud? You know she is, in her own way. Supposing, for instance, she was told that we had given a dinner party without asking her and my sisters. She would never come here again. Wouldn't she really? You may depend upon it. It's extraordinary that people of her class... What's that? Oh, nothing. Women are so sensitive. How's your association getting on? What did you call it? The Association for the Promotion of Women's Rights. What rights do you mean? The wife shall have the right of disposing of her own property. Hasn't she got it already? No, she hasn't. May I ask what your property is of, which you are not allowed to dispose? Half of yours, old man, my dowry. The devil! Who taught you such rubbish? It's not rubbish. It's the spirit of the age, my dear. The new law should read like this. When a woman marries, she becomes the owner of half her husband's property, and of this half she can dispose as she likes. And when she has run through it, the husband will have to keep her. I should take jolly good care not to. Under the new law, you would be forced to do so, or go to the poorhouse. This would be the penalty for a man who doesn't keep his wife. Take care. You are going too far. But have you any meetings? Who were the women present? Tell me. We are still busy with the statues, with the preliminaries. But who are the women? At present, only Mrs. Homan, the controller's wife, and Lady Renhelm. Renhelm? A very good name. I think I've heard it before. But didn't you tell me you were going to float a Dorcas society as well? Found a Dorcas society. Oh, yes. And what do you think? Pastor Scorey is coming one evening to read a paper. Pastor Scorey is an excellent preacher and moves in good society. I'm glad that you're keeping away from the lower classes. There is nothing so fatal to man or woman as to form low connections. My father always said that. It was one of his strictest principles. Mrs. Falk picked up the breadcrumbs from the tablecloth and dropped them into her empty cup. Mr. Falk put his fingers into his waistcoat pocket and brought out a toothpick with which he removed some tiny atoms of coffee grounds lodged between his teeth. Husband and wife felt self-conscious in each other's company. Each guessed the thoughts of the other, and both realized that the first who broke the silence would say something foolish and compromising. They cast about for fresh subjects of conversation, mentally examined them, and found them unsuitable. Every one of them had some connection with what had been said, or could be brought into connection with it. Falk would have liked to have reason for finding fault with the breakfast, so as to have an excuse for expressing indignation. Mrs. Falk looked out of the window, feebly hoping that there might be a change in the weather. In vain. A maidservant entered and saved the situation by offering them a tray with the newspapers, at the same time announcing Mr. Levin. "'Ask him to wait,' said the master curtly. For a few moments his boots squeaked up and down the room, preparing the visitor who was waiting in the corridor for his arrival. The trembling Levin, greatly impressed by the newly invented waiting in the corridor, was ultimately conducted into the master's private room, where he was received like a petitioner. "'Have you brought the bill of exchange with you?' asked Falk. "'I think so,' replied the crestfallen Levin, producing a bundle of guarantees and blank bills of various values. "'Which bank do you prefer?' I have bills on all, with the exception of one. In spite of the grave character of the situation, Falk could not help smiling as he looked at the incomplete guarantees on which the name was missing. The bills fully filled up with the exception of an acceptor's name, and those completely filled up which had not been accepted. 
Let's say the rope maker's bank, he said. That's the impossible one. I'm known there. Well, the shoemaker's bank, the tailor's bank, any one you like, only to be quick about it. They finally accepted the joiner's bank. And now, said Falk, with a look as if he had bought the other's soul, now you had better go and order a new suit, but I want you to order it at a military tailor's, so that they will supply you later on with a uniform on credit. Uniform? I don't want. Hold your tongue and do as you are told. It must be finished on Thursday next, when I'm going to give a big party. As you know, I've sold my shop and warehouse, and tomorrow I receive the freedom of the city as a wholesale merchant. Oh, I congratulate you. Hold your tongue when I'm speaking. You must go and pay a call now. With your deceitful ways, your unrivaled capacity for talking nonsense, you have succeeded in winning the good graces of my mother-in-law. I want you to ask her what she thought of the party I gave on Sunday last. Did you? Hold your tongue and do as I tell you. She'll be jealous and ask you whether you were present. Of course you weren't, for there was no party. You'll both express discontent, become good friends, and slander me. I know you're an expert at it. You must praise my wife. Do you understand? No, not quite. Well, it's not necessary that you should. All you've got to do is carry out my orders. Another thing, tell Nystrom that I've grown so proud that I don't want to have anything more to do with him. Tell him that straight out. You'll be speaking the truth for once. No, hold on. We'll postpone that. You go to him, speak of the importance of next Thursday. Paint for him the great advantages, the many benefits, the brilliant prospects, and so on. You understand me? I understand. Then you take the manuscript to the printers, and then we'll kick him out. If you like to call it that, I have no objection. And am I to read the verses to your guests and distribute them? Hmm, yes. And another thing. Try to meet my brother. Find out all you can about his circumstances and friends. Make up to him. Worm yourself into his confidence. The latter is an easy job. Become his friend. Tell him that I've cheated him. Tell him that I am proud. And ask him how much he'll take for changing his name. A tinge of green, representing a blush, spread over Levin's pale face. That's ugly, he said. What? And besides, one thing more. I'm a businessman, and I like order in all my transactions. I guarantee such and such a sum. I must pay it. That's clear. Oh, no. Don't talk rubbish. I have no security in case of death. Just sign this bond made out to the holder and payable at sight. It's merely a formality. At the word holder, a slight tremor shook Levin's body, and he seized the pen hesitatingly, although he well knew that retreat was impossible. In imagination, he saw a row of shabby, spectacled men carrying canes in their hands, their breast pockets bulging with stamped documents. He heard knocking at doors, running on stairs, summonses, threats, respite. He heard the clock on the town hall striking as men shouldered their canes and led him with clogged feet to the place of execution where he himself was finally released, but where his honor as a citizen fell under the executioner's axe amid the delighted shouts of the crowd. He signed, the audience was over. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Red Room》by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Chapter Ten: The Newspaper Syndicate, Gray Bonnet. For forty years, Sweden had worked for the right which every man obtains when he comes of age. Pamphlets have been written, newspapers founded, stones thrown suppers eaten and speeches made meetings have been held petitions have been presented the railways have been used hands have been pressed volunteer regiments have been formed and so in the end with a great deal of noise the desired object had been attained enthusiasm was great and justifiable the old birchwood tables at the opera restaurant 
were transformed into political tribunes. The fumes of the reform punch attracted many a politician, who, later on, became a great screamer. The smell of reformed cigars excited many an ambitious dream which was never realized. The old dust was washed off with reformed soap. It was generally believed that everything would be right now, and after the tremendous uproar the country lay down and fell asleep, confidently awaiting the brilliant results which were to be the outcome of all this fuss. It slept for a few years and when it awoke it was faced by a reality which suggested a miscalculation. There were murmurs here and there. The statesmen who had recently been lauded to the skies were now criticized. There were even, among the students, some who discovered that the whole movement had originated in a country which stood in a very close relationship to the promoter of the bill, and that the original could be found in a well-known handbook. But enough of it, characteristic of these days was a certain embarrassment which soon took the form of universal discontent, or, as it was called, opposition. But it was a new kind of opposition. It was not, as is generally the case, directed against the government, but against Parliament. It was a conservative opposition, including liberals as well as conservatives, young men as well as old. There was much misery in the country. Now it happened that the newspaper syndicate, Grey Bonnet, born and grown up under liberal auspices, fell asleep when it was called upon to defend unpopular views. If one may speak of the views of a syndicate, the directors proposed at the general meeting that certain opinions should be changed, as they had the effect of decreasing the number of subscribers necessary to the continuance of the enterprise. The general meeting agreed to the proposition and the Grey Bonnet became a conservative paper. But there was a but, although it must be confessed that it did not greatly embarrass the syndicate. It was necessary to have a new chief editor to save the syndicate from ridicule. That no change need be made so far as the invisible editorial staff was concerned went without saying. The chief editor, a man of honor, tendered his resignation. The editorial management, which had long been abused on account of its red color, accepted it with pleasure, hoping thereby, without further trouble, to take rank as a better class paper. There only remained the necessity of finding a new chief editor. In accordance with the new program of the syndicate, he would have to possess the following qualifications. He must be known as a perfectly trustworthy citizen, must belong to the official class, must possess a title usurped or one, which could be elaborated if necessity arose. In addition to this, he must be of good appearance, so that one could show him off at festivals and on other public occasions. He must be dependent, a little stupid because true stupidity always goes hand in hand with conservative leanings. He must be endowed with a certain amount of shrewdness, which would enable him to know intuitively the wishes of his chiefs and never let him forget that public and private welfare are, rightfully understood, one and the same thing. At the same time, he must not be too young, because an older man is more easily managed, and finally he must be married, for the syndicate, which consisted of businessmen, knew perfectly well that married slaves are more amenable than unmarried ones. The individual was discovered and he was to a high degree endowed with all the characteristics enumerated. He was a strikingly handsome man with a very fine figure and a long, wavy beard hiding all the weak points of his face, which otherwise would have given him away. His large, full, deceitful eyes caught the casual observer and inspired his confidence, which was then unscrupulously abused. His somewhat veiled voice, always speaking words of love, of peace, of honor, and above all patriotism, beguiled many a misguided listener and brought him to the punch table where the excellent man spent his evenings preaching straightforwardness and love of the mother country. The influence which this man of honor exerted on his evil environment was marvelous. It could not be seen, but it could be heard. The whole pack, which for years had been let loose on everything time-honored and venerable, which had not even let alone the higher things, was now restrained and full of love, 
not only for its old friends, was now, and not merely in its heart, moral and straightforward. They carried out in every detail the program drawn up by the new editor on his accession, the cardinal points of which, expressed in a few words, were to persecute all good ideas if they were new, to fight for and uphold all bad ones if they were old, to grovel before those in power, to extol all those on whom fortune was smiling, to push down all those who strove to rise, to adore success and abuse misfortune. Freely translated, the program read, to acknowledge and cheer only detested and admittedly good, to work against the mania of innovation, and to persecute severely, but justly, everybody who was trying to get on by dishonest means, for honest work only, should be crowned with success. The secret of the last clause, which the editorial staff had principally at heart, was not difficult to discover. The staff consisted entirely of people whose hopes had been disappointed in one way or another, in most cases by their own fault, through drinking and recklessness. Some of them were college geniuses, who in the past had enjoyed a great reputation as singers, speakers, poets, or wits, and had then justly, or, according to them, unjustly, been forgotten. During a number of years it had been their business to praise and promote, frequently against their own inclination, everything that was new, all the enterprises started by reformers. It was, therefore, not strange that now they seized the opportunity to attack, under the most honorable pretext, everything new, good, or bad. The chief editor in particular was great in tracking humbug and dishonesty. Whenever a delegate opposed a bill which tended to injure the interests of the country for the sake of the party, he was immediately taken to task and called a humbug, trying to be original, longing for a ministerial dress coat. He did not say portfolio, for he always thought of clothes first. Politics, however, was not his strong, or rather his weak point, but literature. In days long past, on the occasion of the Old Norse Festival at Uppsala, he had proposed a toast in a verse on woman, and thereby furnished an important contribution to the literature of the world. It was printed in as many provincial papers as the author considered necessary for his immortality. This had made him a poet, and when he had taken his degrees, he bought a second-class ticket to Stockholm in order to make his debut in the world and receive his due. Unfortunately, the Stockholmers do not read provincial papers. The young man was unknown, and his talent was not appreciated. As he was a shrewd man, his small brain had never been exuberantly imaginative. He concealed his wound and allowed it to become the secret of his life. The bitterness engendered by the fact that his honest work, as he called it, remained unrewarded, specially qualified him for the post of a literary censor. But he did not write himself. His position did not allow him to indulge in efforts of his own, and he preferred leaving it to the reviewer who criticized everybody's work justly and with inflexible severity. The reviewer had written poetry for the last sixteen years under a pseudonym. Nobody had ever read his verses, and nobody had taken the trouble to discover the author's real name. But every Christmas his verses were exhumed and praised in the gray bonnet by a third party, of course, who signed his articles so that the public should not suspect that the author had written it himself. It was taken for granted that the author was known to the public. In the seventeenth year, the author considered it advisable to put his name to a new book, a new edition of an old one. As misfortune would have it, the red cap, the whole staff of which was composed of young people who had never heard the real name, treated the author as a beginner and expressed astonishment not only that a young writer should put his name to his first book, but also that a young man's book could be so monotonous and old-fashioned. This was a hard blow. The old synonymous fell ill with fever, but recovered after having been brilliantly rehabilitated by the gray bonnet. The latter went for the whole reading public in a lump, charging it with being immoral and dishonest, unable to appreciate an honest, sound, and moral book which could safely be put in the hands of a child. A comic paper made fun of the last point, so that the pseudonymous had a relapse, and on his second recovery vowed annihilation to all native literature which might appear in the future. It did, 
however, not applied to quite all native literature, for a shrewd observer would have noticed that the grey bonnet frequently praised bad books. True, it was often done lamely and in terms which could be read in two ways. The same shrewd observer could have noticed that the miserable stuff in question was always published by the same firm, but this did not necessarily imply that the reviewer was influenced by extraneous circumstances, such as little lunches, for instance. He and the whole editorial staff were upright men who would surely not have dared to judge others with so much severity if they themselves had not been men of irreproachable character. Another important member of the staff was the dramatic critic. He had received his education and qualified at a recruiting bureau in ex Chiping, had fallen in love with a star who was only a star in ex Chiping, as he was not sufficiently enlightened to differentiate between a private opinion and a universal verdict, it happened to him, when he was for the first time let loose in the columns of the Grey Bonnet, that he slated the greatest actress in Sweden, and maintained that she copied Miss hyphen hyphen, whatever her name was. That it was done very clumsily goes without saying, and also that it happened before the Grey Bonnet was veered round. All this made his name detested and despised, but still he had a name, and that compensated him for the indignation he excited. One of his cardinal points, although not at once appreciated, was his deafness. For years went by before it was discovered, and even then nobody could tell whether or no it had any connection with a certain encounter caused by one of his notices in the foyer of the opera house one evening after the lights had been turned down. After this encounter he tested the strength of his arm only on a quite young people, and anybody familiar with the circumstances could tell by his critique when he had had an accident in the wings, for the conceited provincial had read somewhere the unreliable statement that Stockholm was another Paris and had believed it. The art critic was an old academician who had never held a brush in his hand, but as a member of the brilliant artist club Minerva, a fact which enabled him to describe works of art in the columns of his paper before they were finished, thereby saving the reader the trouble of forming an opinion of his own. He was invariably kind to his acquaintances, and in criticizing an exhibition never forgot to mention every single one of them. His practice of many years standing of saying something pretty about everybody, and how would he have dared to do otherwise, made it child's play to him to mention twenty names in half a column. In reading his reviews one could not help thinking of the popular game, pictures, and devices, but the young artists he always conscientiously forgot so that the public, which for ten years had heard none but the old names, began to despair of the future of art. One exception, however, he had made, and made quite recently, in an unpropitious hour, and in consequence of this exception, there was great excitement one morning in the editorial office of the Grey Bonnet. What occurred was this. Sowen, the reader, may remember this insignificant name, mentioned on a former, and not a particularly important occasion, had arrived with his picture at the exhibition at the very last moment. When it had been hung in the worst possible place, for the artist was neither a member of the academy, nor did he possess the royal medal, the professor of Charles IX arrived. He had been given this nickname because he never painted anything but scenes from the life of Charles IX. The reason again for this was that a long time ago he had bought at an auction a wine glass a tablecloth, a chair, and a parchment from the period of Charles IX. These objects he had painted for twenty years, sometimes with and sometimes without the king. But he was a professor now, and a knight of many orders, and so there was no help for it. He was the academician when his eye fell on the silent man of the opposition in his picture. Here again, sir, he put up his penez. And this, then, is the new style? Hmm. Let me tell you, sir. Believe the word of an old man. Take that picture away. Take it away. It makes me sick to look at it. You do yourself the greatest service if you take it away. What do you say, old fellow? The old fellow said that the exhibition of such a picture was an impertinence, and that if the gentleman would take his kindly meant advice, he would change his profession and become a signboard painter. Sowen replied mildly, but shrewdly, 
that there were so many able people in that profession that he had chosen an artistic career where success could be obtained far more easily, as had been proved. The professor was furious at his insolence. He turned his back on the contrite Selwyn with a threat which the academician translated into a promise. The enlightened committee of purchases had met behind closed doors. When the doors were open again, six pictures had been bought for the money subscribed by the public for the purpose of encouraging native artists. The excerpt from the minutes which found its way into the columns of the newspaper was worded as follows. The art union yesterday bought the following pictures. Number one, water with oxen, landscape by the wholesale merchant K. Two, Gustavus Adolphus at the fire of Magdeburg, historical painting by the linen draper L. Three, a child blowing its nose, genre picture by Lieutenant M. Four, S. S. Bohr in the harbor, marine picture by the ship broker N. Five, Sylvan scene with women, landscape by the royal secretary O. Six, chicken with mushrooms, still life by the actor P. These works of art which cost a thousand pounds each on an average, were afterwards praised in the grey bonnet in two three-quarter columns at fifteen crowns each. That was nothing extraordinary, but the critic, partly in order to fill up the space, and partly in order to seize the right moment for suppressing a growing evil, attacked a bad custom which was beginning to creep in. He referred to the fact that young, unknown adventurers who had run away from the academy without study were trying to pervert the sound judgment of the public by a mere running after effect, and then Selwyn was taken by the ears and flogged, so that even his enemies found that his treatment was unfair, and that means a great deal. Not only was he denied every trace of talent and his art called humbug, even his private circumstances were dragged before the public. The article hinted at cheap restaurants where he was obliged to dine, at the shabby clothes he was forced to wear at his loose morals, his idleness, it concluded by prophesying in the name of religion and morality that he would end his days in a public institution unless he mended his ways while there was yet time. It was a disgraceful act committed in indifference and selfishness, and it was little less than a miracle that a soul was not lost on the night of the publication of that particular number of the Grey Bonnet. Twenty-four hours later, the incorruptible appeared. It reflected on the way in which public monies were administered by a certain clique, and mentioned the fact that at the last purchase of pictures not a single one had been bought which had been painted by an artist, but that the perpetrators had been officials and tradesmen, impudent enough to compete with the artist, although the latter had no other market. It went on to say that these pirates lowered the standard and demoralized the artist whose sole endeavor would have been to paint as badly as they did if they did not want to starve. Then Selwyn's name was mentioned. His picture was the first soulfully conceived work within the last ten years. For ten years art had been a mere affair of colors and brushes. Selwyn's picture was an honest piece of work, full of inspiration and devotion and entirely original, a picture which could only have been produced by an artist who had met the spirit of nature face to face. The critic enjoined the young artist to fight against the ancients, whom he had already left a long way behind, and exhorted him to have faith and hope, because he had a mission to fulfill, etc. The Grey Bonnet foamed with rage. "'You'll see that the fellow will have success!' exclaimed the chief editor. "'Why the devil did we slate him quite so much? Supposing he became a success now!' We should cover ourselves with ridicule. The academician vowed that he should not have any success, went home with a troubled heart, referred to his books, and wrote an essay in which he proved that Selwyn's art was a humbug, and that the incorruptible had been corrupted. The gray bonnet drew a breath of relief, but immediately afterwards it received a fresh blow. On the following day, the morning papers announced the fact that His Majesty had bought Selwyn's, quote, masterly landscape which for days had drawn a large public to the exhibition." End quote. The gray bonnet 
received the full fury of the gale. It was tossed hither and thither and fluttered like a rag on a pole. Should they veer around or steer ahead? Both paper and critic were involved. The chief editor decided, by order of the managing director, to sacrifice the critic and save the paper. But how was it to be done? In their extremity they remembered Struve. He was a man completely at home in the maze of publicity. He was sent for. The situation was clear to him in a moment, and he promised that in a very few days the barge should be able to tack. To understand Struve's scheme, it is necessary to know the most important data of his biography. He was a born student, driven to journalism by sheer poverty. He started his career as editor of the socialist People's Flag. Next, he belonged to the conservative Peasant's Scourge. But when the latter removed to the provinces with inventory, printing plant and editor, the name was changed into Peasant's Friend, and its politics changed accordingly. Struve was sold to the Red Cap, where his knowledge of all the conservative tricks stood him in good stead. In the same way, his greatest merit in the eyes of the Grey Bonnet was his knowledge of all the secrets of their deadly foe, the Red Cap, and his readiness to abuse his knowledge of them. Struve began the work of whitewashing by starting a correspondence in the People's Flag. A few lines of this, mentioning the rush of visitors to the exhibition, were reprinted in the Grey Bonnet. Next, there appeared in the Grey Bonnet an attack on the Academian. This attack was followed by a few reassuring words, signed the Ed, which read as follows, quote, Although we never shared the opinion of our art critic with regard to Mr. Sellen's justly praised landscape, yet we cannot altogether agree with our judgment of our respected correspondent, but as, on principle, we open our columns to all opinions, we unhesitatingly printed the above article, End quote. The ice was broken. Struve, who had the reputation of having written on every subject, except Cufic coins, now wrote a brilliant critique of Selwyn's picture and signed it very characteristically, Dixie. The gray bonnet was saved, and so, of course, was Selwyn, but the latter was of minor importance. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Happy People It was seven o'clock in the evening. The band at Burns was playing the wedding march from A Midsummer Night's Dream, when to the accompaniment of its inspiring strains Ollie Montanus made his entry into the Red Room. None of the members had yet arrived. Ollie looked imposing. For the first time since his confirmation, he was wearing a high hat. He was dressed in a new suit, and his boots were without holes. He had had a bath, had been newly shaved, and his hair was waved as if he were going to a wedding. A heavy brass chain ornamented his waistcoat, and his left waistcoat pocket bulged visibly. A sunny smile lit up his features. He radiated kindness. One might have thought that he wanted to help all the world with little loans. Taking off his overcoat, no longer cautiously buttoned up, he took the center of the sofa in the background, opened his coat, and tugged at his white shirt front so that it rose with a crackle and stood out like an arch. At every movement, the lining of his waistcoat and trousers creaked. This seemed to give him as much pleasure as the knocking of his boot against the leg of the sofa. He pulled out his watch, his dear old turnip, which for a year and a month's grace had been in the pawnbroker's hands, and the two old friends both seemed to enjoy its liberty. What had happened that this poor fellow should be so inexpressibly happy? We know he had not drawn the winner in a lottery, that he had not inherited a fortune, that he had not been honorably mentioned, that he had not won the sweet happiness which baffles description. What had happened then? Something very commonplace. He had found work. Selwyn was the next to arrive. He wore a velvet jacket and a patent leather boots. He carried a rug, a field glass on a strap, and a cane. A yellow silk handkerchief was knotted round his throat. His hands were covered by flesh-colored gloves and a flower blossom in his buttonhole. 
He was, as usual, cheerful and calm. His lean, intelligent face betrayed no trace of the emotions undergone during the last few days. Sullen was accompanied by Renhelm. The lad was unusually subdued. He knew that his friend and patron was leaving him. "'Hello, Sullen,' said Ollie. "'You are happy at last, aren't you, old chap?' "'Happy? What nonsense are you talking? I've sold a piece of work, the first in five years. Is that so overwhelming?' But you must have read the papers. Your name's made. Oh, I don't care a toss of a button for that. Don't imagine that I care for such trifles. I know exactly how much I still have to learn before I shall be anybody. Let's talk of it again in ten years' time, Ollie. Ollie believed half of what someone said and doubted the rest. His shirt front crackled, and the lining creaked so that someone's attention was aroused. By the Lord Harry! He burst out. You are magnificent. Think so? You look like a lion. Sullen wrapped his patent leather boots with his cane. Shyly smelt the flower in his buttonhole and looked indifferent. Ollie pulled out his watch to see whether it was not yet time for Lundell to arrive, which gave Sullen an opportunity of sweeping the galleries with his field glass. Ollie was permitted to feel the soft texture of the velvet coat while Sullen assured him that it was an exceptionally good quality at the price. Ollie could not resist asking the cost. Sullen told him and admired Ollie's studs, which were made of shells. Presently Lundell appeared. He, too, had been given a bone at the great banquet. He was commissioned to paint the altarpiece for the church of Troscola for a small sum, but this had not visibly affected his outward appearance, unless, indeed, his fat cheeks and beaming face hinted at a more generous diet. Falk was with Lundell. He was grave, but he rejoiced, in the name of the whole world, sincerely rejoiced, that merit had found its just reward. "'Congratulations, Sullen,' he said. "'But it's no more than you do,' Sullen agreed. "'I have been painting just as well these last five years, and all the world has jeered. They were still jeering the day before yesterday, but now it's disgusting.' Look at this letter which I received from the idiot, the professor of Charles IX. All eyes opened wide and became keen, for it is gratifying to examine the oppressor closely, have him, on paper at least, in one's hands, at one's mercy. My dear Mr. Sowen, fancy that. Let me welcome you among us. He's afraid of me, the blackguard. I have always appreciated your talent, the liar. Let's tear up the rag and forget all about him. Sullen invited his friends to drink. He drank to Falk and hoped that his pen would soon bring him to the front. Falk became self-conscious, blushed, and promised to do his best when his time came. But he was afraid that his apprenticeship would be a long one, and he begged his friends not to lose patience with him if he tarried. He thanked Sullen for his friendship, which had taught him endurance and renunciation. Sullen begged him not to talk nonsense, where was the merit of endurance when there was no other alternative? And where was the virtue in renouncing what one had no chance of obtaining? But Ollie smiled a kindly smile, and his shirt front swelled with pleasure, so that the red braces could be plainly seen. He drank to Lundell and implored him to take an example from Sullen, and not forget the land of promise in lingering over the flesh pots of Egypt. He assured him that his friend Ollie believed in his talent, that was to say, when he was himself and painted according to his own light. But whenever he humbugged and painted to please others, he was worse than the rest. Therefore he should look upon the altarpiece as a pot-boiler, which would put him into a position to follow his own inspiration in art. Falk tried to seize the opportunity of finding out what Ollie thought of himself and his own art a puzzle which he had long vainly attempted to solve, when Yigberg walked into the Red Room. Everybody eagerly invited him to be his guest, for he had been forgotten during the last hot days, and everyone was anxious to show him that he had not been out of selfishness. But Ali searched in his right waistcoat pocket, and with a movement which he was anxious to hide from all eyes, he slipped the rolled-up banknote into Yigberg's coat pocket. The latter understood and acknowledged it by a grateful look. Yigberg drank to Sullen. He said that one might consider, in one way, that Sullen's fortune was made. 
but on the other hand one might consider with equal justification that it was not so Selwyn was not sufficiently developed he still wanted many years study for art was long as he Yigberg, had himself experience he had had nothing but ill luck therefore nobody could suspect him of envying a man of Selwyn's reputation the envy which peered through Yigberg's words slightly clouded the sunny sky but it was only for a moment for everybody realized that the bitterness of a long wasted life must be held responsible for it all the more gladly Yigberg handed Falk a small newly printed essay on the cover of which he beheld with consternation the black portrait of Ulrica Eleonora. Yigberg stated that he had delivered the manuscript on the day stipulated. Smith had taken Falk's refusal with the greatest calm and was now printing Falk's poems. To Falk's eyes the gas jets lost their brilliancy. He sat plunged in deep thought. His heart was too full to find vent in words. His poems were to be printed at Smith's expense. This was proof that they were not without merit. The thought was sufficient food for the whole evening. The evening passed quickly for the happy circle. The band ceased playing, and the light was turned out. They were obliged to leave, but finding the night far too young for breaking up, they strolled along the quays, amid endless conversation and philosophical discussions, until they were tired and thirsty. Lundell offered to take his friends to see Marie, where they could have some beer. They turned towards the north and came to a street which gave on a fence. The fence enclosed a tobacco field bordering on the open country. They stopped before a two-story brick house with a gable facing the street. From above the door grinned two sandstone faces whose ears and shins were lost in fantastic scrolls. Between the heads hung a sword and an axe. It was formerly the house of the executioner. Lundell, apparently quite familiar with the neighborhood, gave a signal before one of the windows on the ground floor. The blind was drawn up. The window opened, and a woman's head looked out. A voice asked whether the caller was Albert. No sooner had Lundell owned to this, his nom de guerre, than a girl opened the door and, on the promise of silence, admitted the party. As the promise was readily given, the Red Room was soon in her apartment and introduced to her under fictitious names. The room was not a large one. It had once been the kitchen, and the range was still standing in its place. The furniture consisted of a chest of drawers, of a pattern usually found in servants' rooms. On the drawers stood a looking-glass, swathed in a piece of white muslin. Above the glass hung a colored lithograph, representing the Savior on the cross. The chest was littered with small china figures, scent bottles, a prayer book, and an ashtray, and with its looking-glass and two lighted tallow candles seemed to form a little house altar. Charles the Fifteenth, surrounded by newspaper cuttings, mostly representing police constables, those enemies of the Magdalens, was riding on horseback on the wall above the folding sofa, which had not yet been converted into a bed. On the window sill stood a stunted fuchsia, a geranium, and a myrtle, the proud tree of Aphrodite in the poor dwelling. A photograph album lay on the work table. On the first leaf was a picture of the king. On the second and third, papa and mama, poor country folk. On the fourth, a student, the seducer. On the fifth, a baby. And on the sixth, the fiancé, a journeyman. This was her history, so like the history of most of them. On a nail close to the range hung an elegant dress, a velvet cloak, and a hat with feathers, the fairy disguise in which she went out to catch young men. The fairy herself was a tall, ordinary-looking young woman of twenty-four. Recklessness and vigils had given her face that white transparency which as a rule distinguishes the untoiling rich, but her hands still showed traces of hard work. In her pretty dressing gown, with her flowing hair down her back, she was the picture of a Magdalen. Her manner was comparatively shy, but she was merry and courteous and on her best behavior. The party split up into groups, continued the interrupted discussions, and started fresh ones. Falk, who now looked upon himself as a poet, and was determined to be interested in everything, be it ever so banal, 
began a sentimental conversation with Marie, which she greatly enjoyed, for she appreciated the honor of being treated like a human being. As usual, the talk drifted to her story and the motives which had shaped her career. She did not lay stress on her first slip. That was hardly worth speaking about. But all the blacker was her account of the time she had spent as a servant, leading the life of a slave, made miserable by the whims and scoldings of an indolent mistress, a life of never-ending toil. No, the free life she was leading now was far preferable. But when are you tired of it? Then I shall marry Vestergren. Does he want you? He's looking forward to the day. Moreover, I am going to open a little shop with the money I have saved. But so many have asked me that question. Have you got any cigars? Oh, yes, here you are. But do you mind my talking about it? He took the album and pointed out the student. It is always a student with a white handkerchief round his neck, a white student's hat on his knees, and a gauche manner who plays Mephisto. Who is this? He was a nice fellow. The seducer? What? Oh, let it alone. I was every bit as much to blame and is always so, my dear. Both are to blame. Look, this is my baby. The Lord took it, and I dare say it was for the best. But now, let's talk about something else. Who is that gay dog whom Albert has brought here tonight? The one closest to the stove, by the side of the tall one, whose head reaches up to the chimney. Ollie, very much flattered by her attention, patted his wavy hair, which, after many libations, was beginning to stand up again. That is assistant preacher Monson, said Lundell. Ugh, a clergyman? I might have known it from the cunning look in his eyes. Do you know that a clergyman came here last week? Come here, Monsoon, and let me look at you. Ollie descended from his seat, where he and Yigberg had been criticizing Kant's categorical imperative. He was so accustomed to exciting curiosity of the sex that he immediately felt younger. He lurched towards the lady whom he had already ogled and found charming. Twirling his mustache, he asked in an affected voice, with a bow which he had not learned at a dancing class, Do you really think, miss, that I look like a clergyman? No, I see now that you have a mustache. Your clothes are too clean for an artisan. May I see your hand? Oh, you are a smith. Ollie was deeply hurt. Am I so very ugly, miss? He asked pathetically. Marie examined him for a moment. You are very plain, she said, but you look nice. Oh, dear lady, if you only knew how you are hurting me. I have never yet found a woman ready to love me, and yet I have met so many who found happiness, although they were plainer than I am. But woman is a curse riddle, which nobody can solve. I detest her. That's right, Ollie, came a voice from the chimney where Yigberg's head was. That's all right. Ollie was going back to the stove, but he had touched on a topic which interested Marie too much to allow it to drop. He had played on a string the sound of which she knew. She sat down by his side, and soon they were deep in a long-winded and grave discussion on love and women. Renhelm, who during the whole evening had been more quiet and restrained than usual, and of whom nobody could make anything, suddenly revived and was now sitting in the corner of the sofa near Falk. Obviously something was troubling him, something which he could not make up his mind to mention. He seized his beer glass, rapped on the table as if he wanted to make a speech, and when those nearest to him looked up, ready to listen to him, he said in a tremulous and indifferent voice, "'Gentlemen, you think I am a beast. I know. Falk, I know you think me a fool. But you shall see, friends. The devil take me. You shall see.' He raised his voice and put his beer glass down with such determination that it broke into pieces after which he sank back on the sofa and fell asleep. This scene, although not an uncommon one, had attracted Marie's attention. She dropped the conversation with Ollie, who, moreover, had begun to stray from the purely abstract point of the question and rose. "'Oh, what a pretty boy!' she exclaimed. "'How does he come to be with you? Poor little chap! How sleepy he is! 
I hadn't seen him before. She pushed the cushion under his head and covered him with a shawl. How small his hands are, far smaller than yours, you country louts. And what a face, how innocent he looks. Albert, did you make him drink so much? Whether it had been Lundell or another was a matter of no importance now. The man was drunk. But it was also a fact that he did not need any urging to drink. He was consumed by a constant longing to still an inner restlessness which seemed to drive him away from his work. The remarks made by his pretty friend had not perturbed Lundell, but now his increasing intoxication excited his religious feelings, which had been blunted by a luxurious supper. And as the intoxication began to be general, he felt it incumbent on him to remind his companions of the significance of the day and the impending leave-taking. He rose, filled his glass, steadied himself against the chest of drawers, and claimed the attention of the party. Gentlemen, he remembered Magdalen's presence. And ladies, we have eaten and drunk tonight with, to come to the point, an intent, which, if we set aside the material, which is nothing but the low, central, animal component of our nature, that in a moment like this, when the hour of parting is imminent, we have here a distressing example of the vice which we call drunkenness. Doubtless it rouses one's religious emotion, if, after an evening spent in a circle of friends, one feels moved to propose a glass to him who has shown more than ordinary talent. I am speaking of Sowen. One should think that self-respect should to a certain extent prevail. Such an example, I maintain, has been manifested here in a higher potency, and therefore I am reminded of the beautiful words which will never cease ringing in my ears as long as I am able to think, and I am convinced they are now in the mind of each one of us, although this spot is anything but suitable. This young man, who has fallen a victim to the vice which we call drunkenness, has unfortunately crept into our circle, and, to cut my speech short, matured a sadder result than anybody could have expected. Your health, noble friend Selwyn. I wish you all the happiness which your noble heart deserves. Your health, Ali Montanus. Falk, too, has a noble heart, and will come to the front when his religious sense has acquired the vigor which his character foreshadows. I won't mention Yigberg, for he has at last come to a decision, and we wish him luck in the career upon which he has so splendidly entered, the philosophical career. It is a difficult one, and I repeat the words of the psalmist, who can tell? At the same time, we have every reason to hope for the best in the future, and I believe that we can count on it as long as our sentiments are noble and our hearts are not striving for worldly gain. For gentlemen, a man without religion is a beast. I therefore ask every gentleman here present to raise his glass and empty it to all that is noble, beautiful, and splendid, and for which we are striving. Your health, gentlemen! Religious emotion now overwhelmed Lundell to such a degree that it was thought best to break up the party. Daylight had been shining through the window blind for some time, and the landscape with the castle and the maiden stood out brilliantly in the first radiance of the morning sun. When the blind was drawn up, day rushed in and illuminated the faces of those nearest the window. They were deadly pale. The red light of the tallow candles fell with magnificent effect on the face of Yigberg, who was sitting on the stove clutching his glass. Ollie was proposing toast to women. The spring, the sun, the universe, throwing open the window, to give vent to his feelings. The sleepers were roused, the party took their leave of Marie and filed through the front door. When they had reached the street, Falk turned around. Magdalen was leaning out of the window. The rays of the sun fell on her pale face. Her long, black hair, which shone deep red in the sunlight, seemed to trickle down her throat and over her shoulders, and to be falling on the street in little streams. Above her head hung the sword and axe and the two grinning faces, but in an apple tree on the other side of the road perched a black and white flycatcher, and sang its frenzied song of joy that the night was over. End of chapter 11
Recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Marine Insurance Society, Triton. Levi was a young man born and educated for business and on the point of establishing himself with the assistance of his wealthy father when the latter died, leaving nothing but a family totally unprovided for. This was a great disappointment to the young man. He had reached an age when he considered that he might stop working altogether and let others toil for him. He was twenty-five and of good appearance, broad-shouldered and lean in the flank. His body seemed specially adapted for wearing a frock coat in the manner which he had much admired in certain foreign diplomatists. Nature had arched his chest in the most elegant fashion, so that he was capable of setting off to the fullest advantage a four-button shirt-front, even in the very act of sinking into an easy chair at the foot of a long board-table occupied by the whole administrative committee. A beautiful beard, parted in the middle, gave his young face a sympathetic and trustworthy expression. His small feet were made for walking on the Brussels carpet of a boardroom, and his carefully manicured hands were particularly suitable for very light work, such as the signing of his name, preferably on a printed circular. In the days which are now called the good days, although in reality they were very bad ones for a good many people, the greatest discovery of a great century was made, namely, that one could live more cheaply and better on other people's money than on the results of one's own efforts. Many, a great many, people had taken advantage of the discovery, and as no patent law protected it, it was not surprising that Levi should be anxious to profit by it too, more particularly as he had no money himself and no inclination to work for a family which was not his own. He therefore put on his best suit one day and called on his Uncle Smith. "'Oh, indeed, you have an idea?' said Smith. "'Let's hear it. It's a good thing to have ideas. I have been thinking of floating a joint stock company.' "'Very good. Aaron will be treasurer, Simon secretary, Isaac cashier, and the other boys bookkeepers. It's a good idea. Go on. What sort of company is it going to be?' I'm thinking of a marine insurance society. Indeed. So far, so good. Everybody has to insure his property when he goes on a voyage. But your idea? This is my idea. I don't think much of it. We have the big society, Neptune. It's a good society. Yours would have to be better if you intend to compete with it. What would be the novelty in your society? Oh, I understand. I should reduce the premiums, and all the patrons of the Neptune would come to me. That's better. Very well, then. The prospectus which I would print would begin in this way. As the crying need of reducing the marine insurance premiums has long been felt, and it is only owing to the want of competition that it has not yet been done, we, the undersigned, beg to invite the public to take up shares in the new society. What name? Triton? Triton? What sort of chap was he? He was a sea god. All right, Triton. It will make a good poster. You can order it from Ranch in Berlin, and we will reproduce it in my almanac, Our Country. Now, for the undersign. First, of course, my name. We must have big, well-sounding names. Give me the official almanac. Smith turned over the leaves for some time. A marine insurance company must have a naval officer of high rank. Let me see. An admiral. Oh, those sort of people have no money. Bless me. You don't know much about business, my boy. They are only wanted to subscribe, not to pay up. And they receive their dividends for attending the meetings and being present at the director's dinners. Here we have two admirals. One of them has the commander's ribbon of the Polar Star and the other one has the Russian order of Anna. What shall we do? I think we had better take the Russian, for there is splendid marine insurance ground in Russia. There! But is it such a simple matter to get hold of these people? Tut-tut! Next we want a retired minister of state. Yes. Well, they are called Your Excellency. Yes. Good. And a count. That's more difficult. Counts have lots of money, and we must have a professor. They have no money. Is there such a thing as a professor of navigation? 
That would be a capital thing for our venture. Isn't there a school of navigation somewhere near the South Theatre? Yes. Very well. Everything is as clear as possible to me. Oh, I nearly forgot. The most important point. We must have a legal man, a counselor of a high court. Here he is. But we have no money yet. Money? What's the use of money in company promoting? Doesn't the man who insures his good pay us money? What? Or do we pay him? No. Well, then, he pays with his premiums. But the original capital? One issues debentures. True, but there must be some cash. One pays cash in debentures. Isn't that paying? Supposing I gave you a check for a sum. Any bank would cash it for you. Therefore, a check is money. Very well. And is there a law which ordains that cash shall mean banknotes? If there were, what about private banknotes? How large should the capital be? Very small. It's bad business to tie up large sums. A million. Three hundred thousand in cash and the remainder in debentures. But, 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 the three hundred thousand crowns surely must be in banknotes. Good Lord in heaven. Banknotes? Notes are money. If you have notes, well and good. If you haven't, it comes to the same thing. Therefore, we must interest the small capitalists who have nothing but banknotes. And the big ones, how do they pay? In shares, debenture guarantees, of course. But that will be a matter for later on. Get them to subscribe and we'll see to the rest. And only 300,000? One single great steamer costs as much. Supposing we insured a thousand steamers. A thousand? Last year, the Neptune issued 48,000 insurance policies and did well out of it. All the worst, I say. But if, but if, matters should go wrong? One goes into liquidation. Liquidation? Declares oneself insolvent. That's the proper term. And what does it matter if the society becomes insolvent? It isn't you, or I, or he. But one can also increase the number of shares, or issue debentures which the government may buy up in hard times at a good price. There is no risk, then. Not the slightest. Besides, what have you got to lose? Do you possess one farthing? No. Very well, then. What do I risk? Five hundred crowns. I shall only take five shares, you see, and five hundred is as much as this to me. He took a pinch of snuff, and the matter was settled. The society was floated, and during the first ten years of its activity, it paid six, ten, ten, eleven, twenty, eleven, five, ten, thirty-six, and twenty percent. The shares were eagerly brought up, and in order to enlarge the business, more shares were issued. The new issue of shares was followed by a general meeting of shareholders. Falk was sent to report it for the Red Cap, whose assistant reporter he was. When, on a Sunday afternoon in June, he entered the exchange, the hall was already crowded with people. It was a brilliant assembly. Statesmen, geniuses, men of letters, officers, and civil servicemen of high rank, uniforms, dress coats, orders, and ribbons, all those here assembled had one big general interest. The advancement of the philanthropic institution called marine insurance. It required a great love to risk one's money for the benefit of the suffering neighbor whom misfortune had befallen. But here was love. Falk had never seen such an accumulation of it in one spot. Although not yet an entirely disillusioned man, he could not suppress a feeling of amazement. But he was even more amazed when he noticed the little blackguard Struve, the former socialist, creeping through the crowd like a reptile, greeted, and sometimes addressed by distinguished people with a familiar nod, a pressure of the hand, or a friendly slap on the shoulder. He saw a middle-aged man, wearing a ribbon belonging to a high order, nodding to him, and he noticed that Struve blushed, and concealed himself behind an embroidered coat. This brought him into Falk's vicinity and the latter immediately accosted him and asked him who the man was. Struve's embarrassment increased, but summoning up all his impudence, he replied, You ought to know that. He's the president of the Board of Payment of Employees' Salaries. No sooner had the words left his lips than he pretended to be called to the other side of the room, but he was in so great a hurry that Falk wondered whether he felt uncomfortable in his society. A blackguard in the company of an honorable man. 
the brilliant assembly began to be seated, but the president's chair was still vacant. Falk was looking for the reporter's table, and when he discovered Struve and the reporter for the conservative sitting at a table on the right-hand side of the secretary, he took his courage into his hands and marched through the distinguished crowd. Just as he had reached the table, the secretary stopped him with a question. "'For which paper?' he asked. A momentary silence ensued. "'For the red cap,' answered Falk, with a slight tremor in his voice. He had recognized in the secretary the actuary of the Board of Payment of Employees' Salaries. A half-stifled murmur ran through the room. Presently the secretary said in a loud voice, "'Your place is at the back, over there.' He pointed to the door and a small table standing close to it. Falk realized in a moment the significance of the word conservative, and also what it meant to be a journalist who was not a conservative. Boiling inwardly, he retraced his footsteps, walking to his appointed place through the sneering crowd. He stared at the grinning faces, challenging them with burning eyes. When his glance met another glance, quite in the background, close to the wall, the eyes, bearing a strong resemblance to a pair of eyes now closed in death, which used to rest on his face full of love, were green with malice and pierced him like a needle. He could have shed tears of sorrow at the thought that a brother could thus look at a brother. He took his modest place near the door, for he was determined not to beat a retreat. Very soon he was roused from his apparent calm by a newcomer who prodded him in the back as he took off his coat and shoved a pair of rubber overshoes underneath his chair. The newcomer was greeted by the whole assembly, which rose from their seats as one man. He was the chairman of the Marine Insurance Society Limited, Triton. But he was something else besides this. He was a retired district marshal, a baron, one of the eighteen of the Swedish Academy, an excellency, a knight of many orders, etc., etc., a rap with the hammer, and amid dead silence, the president whispered the following oration, just delivered by him at a meeting of the Coal Company Limited in the hall of the Polytechnic. Gentlemen, amongst all the patriotic and philanthropic enterprises, there are few, if any, of such a noble and beneficial nature as an insurance society. This statement was received with a unanimous, Hear, hear! which, however, made no impression on the district marshal. What else is but a life struggle, a life and death struggle, one might say, with the forces of nature? There will be few among us who do not sooner or later come into conflict with them. The crowd shouted, Hear! Hear! For long ages man, more especially primitive man, has been the sport of the elements. A ball tossed hither and thither, a glove blown here and there by the wind like a reed. There is no longer the case. I'm correct in saying it is not. Man has determined to rebel. It is a bloodless rebellion, though, and very different to the revolutions which dishonorable traitors to their country have now and again stirred up against their lawful rulers. No, gentlemen, I'm speaking of a revolution against nature." Man has declared war to the natural forces. He has said, Thus far shalt thou go, and no farther. The crowd shouted, Hear, hear, and clapping of hands. The merchant sends out his steamer, his brig, his schooner, his barge, his yacht, and so forth. The gale breaks the vessel to pieces. Break away, says the merchant, for he loses nothing. This is the great aspect of the insurance idea. Imagine the position, gentlemen. The merchant has declared war upon the storms of heaven, and the merchant has won the day. A storm of applause brought a triumphant smile to the face of the great man. He seemed thoroughly to enjoy this storm. But, gentlemen, do not let us call an insurance institution a business. It is not a business. We are not businessmen. Far from it. We have collected a sum of money, and we are ready to risk it. Is this not so, gentlemen? The crowd shouted, Yes, yes. We have collected a sum of money so as to have it ready to hand over to him whom misfortune has befallen. His percentage, I think he pays one per cent, cannot be called a contribution. It is called a premium, and rightfully so. Not that we want any sort of reward. Premium means reward. 
for our little services, which we merely render because we are interested, as far as I am concerned, it is purely for this reason. I repeat, I don't think there can be any question that anyone in our midst would hesitate. I don't think that one of us would mind seeing his contribution, if I may be allowed to call the shares by that name, used for the furtherance of the idea. The crowd shouted, No! No! I will now ask the managing director to read the annual report. The director rose. He looked as pale as if he had been through a storm. His big cuffs, with the onyx studs, could hardly hide the slight trembling of his hand. His cunning eyes sought comfort and strength in Smith's bearded face. He opened his coat, and his expansive shirt front swelled as if it were ready to receive a shower of arrows, and read, Truly strange and unexpected are the ways of providence. At the word providence a considerable number of faces blanched, but the district marshal raised his eyes towards the ceiling as if he were preparing for the worse. A loss of two hundred crowns. The year which we have just completed will long stand in our annals like a cross on the grave of the accidents which have brought to scorn the foresight of the wisest and the calculations of the most cautious. The district marshal buried his face in his hands as if he were praying. Struve, believing that the white wall dazzled his eyes, jumped up to pull down the blind, but the secretary had already forestalled him. The reader drank a glass of water. This caused an outburst of impatience. The crowd shouted, To business! Figures! The district marshal removed his hand from his eyes and was taken aback when he found out that it was so much darker than it had been before. There was a momentary embarrassment, and the storm gathered. All respect was forgotten. The crowd shouted, To business! Go on! The director skipped the preliminary banalities and plunged right into the heart of the matter. Very well, gentlemen, I will cut my speech short. The crowd shouted, Go on! Go on! Why the devil don't you? The hammer fell. Gentlemen! There was so much dignity in this brief, gentlemen, that the assembly immediately remembered their self-respect. The society has been responsible during the year for one hundred and sixty-nine millions. The crowd shouted, Hear, hear! And has received a million and a half in premiums. The crowd shouted, Hear, hear! Falk made a hasty calculation and found that at the full receipts in premiums, namely one million and a half, and the total original capital, one million, were deducted, there remain about 160 millions for which the society was responsible. He realized what the ways of providence meant. Unfortunately, the amount paid on policies was 1,728,670 crowns and eight or. The crowd shouted, Shame! As you see, gentlemen, providence, the crowd shouted, Leave providence alone! Figures! Figures! Dividends! Under the circumstances, I can only propose, in my capacity as managing director, a dividend of 5% on the paid-up capital. Now a storm burst out which no merchant in the world could have weathered. The crowd shouted, Shame! Impudence! Swindler! 5%! Disgusting! It's throwing one's money away! But there were also a few more philanthropic utterances such as what about the poor small capitalists who have nothing but their dividends to live on how will they manage mercy on us what a misfortune the state ought to help and without delay oh dear oh dear when the storm had subsided a little and the director could make his voice heard he read out the high praise given by the supervisory committee to the managing director and all the employees who without sparing themselves and with indefatigable seal had done the thankless work. The statement was received with open scorn. The report of the accountants was then read. They stated, after again censoring Providence, that they had found all the books in good, not to say excellent, order, and in checking the inventory all debentures on the reserve fund had been found correct. They therefore called upon the shareholders to discharge the directors and acknowledge their honest and unremitting labor. The directors were, of course, discharged. The managing director then declared that under the circumstances he could not think of accepting his bonus, a hundred crowns, and handed it to the reserve fund. This declaration was received with applause and laughter. 
after a short evening prayer, that is to say a humble petition to Providence, that next year's dividend might be 20%, the district marshal closed the proceedings. End of chapter 12「with which she was eager to arouse the envy of Mrs. Homan, who lived in the house opposite. Nothing was easier or more simple. All she had to do was to show herself every now and then at the window while she supervised the preparations in her room, intended to crush her guests, whom she expected at seven. The administrative committee of the Creche Bethlehem was to meet and examine the first monthly report, it consisted of Mrs. Homan, whose husband, the controller, Mrs. Falk, suspected of pride because he was a government official, Lady Renhelm, whom she suspected of the same failing because of her title, and the Reverend Scorey, who was private chaplain of all the great families. The whole committee was to be crushed, and crushed in the sweetest possible manner. The new setting for the scene had already been displayed at the big party. All the old pieces, which were neither antique nor possessed of any artistic value had been replaced by brand new furniture mrs falk intended to manage the actors in this little play until the close of the proceedings when her husband would arrive upon the scene with an admiral he had promised his wife at least an admiral in full dress uniform both were to crave admission to the society falk was to enlarge the funds of the society on the spot by handing over to it a part of the sum which he had been earning so easily as a shareholder of the Triton. Mrs. Falk had finished with the window and was now arranging the rosewood table, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, on which the proofs of the monthly report were to be laid. She dusted the agate inkstand, placed the silver penholder on the tortoise-shell rack, turned up the seal of the chrysophrase handle so as to hide her commoner's name, cautiously shook the cash box made of the finest steel wire so that the value of the few banknotes it contained could be plainly read. Finally, having given her last orders to the footman dressed up for the parade, she sat down in her drawing room in the careless attitude in which she desired that the announcement of her friend, the controller's wife, should discover her. Mrs. Holman would be sure to be the first to arrive. She did arrive first. Mrs. Falk embraced Evelyn and kissed her on the cheek, and Mrs. Holman embraced Eugenia, who received her in the dining-room and retained her there for a few moments in order to ask her opinion of the new furniture. Mrs. Holman wasted no time in the solid oak sideboard, dating from the time of Charles the Twelfth, with the tall Japanese vases, because she felt small by the side of it. She looked at the chandelier, which she found too modern, and the dining-table, which she said, was not in keeping with the prevailing style. In addition to this, she considered that the oleographs were out of place among the old family portraits, and took quite a long time to explain the difference between an oil painting and an oleograph. Mrs. Falk's new silk-lined velvet dress swished against every corner within reach without succeeding in attracting her friend's attention. She asked her whether she liked the new Brussels carpet in the drawing-room. Mrs. Holman thought it contrasted too crudely with the curtains. At last Mrs. Falk felt annoyed with her and dropped her questions. They sat down at the drawing-room table, clutching at little life buoys in the guise of photographs, unreadable volumes of verse, and so on. A little pamphlet fell into Mrs. Holman's hands. It was printed on gold-edged pink paper and bore the title to the wholesale merchant Nicholas Falk on his fortieth birthday. Ah! These are the verses which were read at your party. Who wrote them? A very clever man, a friend of my husband's. His name's Nystrom. Hum, huh. how queer that his name should be quite unknown. Such a clever man, but why wasn't he at your party? Unfortunately, he was ill, my dear, so he couldn't come. 
I see. But, my dear Eugenia, isn't it awfully sad about your brother-in-law? I hear he's so very badly off. Don't mention him. He's a disgrace and a grief to the whole family. It's terrible. Yes, it was quite unpleasant when everybody asked about him at your party. I was so sorry for you, dear. This is for the oak sideboard, dating from the time of Charles the Twelfth, and the Japanese vases, thought the controller's wife. For me? Oh, please don't. You mean for my husband, interrupted Mrs. Falk. Surely that's the same thing. Not at all. I can't be held responsible for all the black sheep in his family. What a pity it was that your parents also were ill and couldn't come. How's your dear father? Thanks. He's quite well again. How kind of you to think of everybody. Well, one shouldn't think of oneself only. Is he delicate? The old what is his title? Captain, if you like. Captain, I was under the impression that my husband said he was one of the crew of the flagship, but very likely it's the same thing. But where were the girls? That's for the Brussels carpet, mentally reflected the controller's wife. They are so full of whims, they can never be depended on. Mrs. Falk turned over the leaves in her photograph album. The binding cracked. She was in a towering rage. I say, dear, who was the disagreeable individual who read the verses on the night of your party? You mean Mr. Levin, the royal secretary. He's my husband's most intimate friend. Is he really? Hmm, how strange. My husband's controller in the same office where he's a secretary. I don't want to vex you or say something unpleasant. I never do, but my husband says that Levin's in such bad circumstances that it's not wise for your husband to associate with him. Does he? That's a matter of which I know nothing, and in which I don't interfere. And let me tell you, my dear Mrs. Homan, I never interfere in my husband's affairs, though I've heard of people who do. I beg your pardon, dear? I thought I was doing you a service by telling you. That's for the chandelier and the dining table. There only remains the velvet dress. Well, the controller's wife took up the thread again. I hear that your brother-in-law. Spare my feelings and don't talk of the creature. Is he really such a bad lot? I've been told that he associates with the worst characters in town. At this juncture, Mrs. Falk was reprieved. The footman announced Lady Renhelm. Oh, how welcome she was! How kind of her it was to come! And Mrs. Falk really was pleased to see the old lady with the kindly expression in her eyes, an expression only found in the eyes of those who have weathered the storms of life with true courage. My dear Mrs. Falk, said her ladyship, taking a seat, I have all sorts of kind messages for you from your brother-in-law. Mrs. Falk wondered what she had done to the old woman that she, too, evidently wanted to annoy her. Indeed, she said a little stiffly. He's a charming young man. He came to see my nephew today at my house. They are great friends. He really is an excellent young man. Isn't he? joined in Mrs. Homan, always ready for a change of front. We were just talking about him. Indeed. What I most admire in him is his courage and venturing on a course where one easily runs aground. But we need have no apprehension so far as he is concerned. He's a man of character and principle. Don't you agree with me, Mrs. Falk? I've always said so, but my husband thinks differently. Oh, your husband has always had peculiar views, interposed Mrs. Homan. Is he a friend of your nephew's, Lady Renhelm? asked Mrs. Falk eagerly. Yes, they both belong to a small circle, some of the members of which are artists. You must have heard about young Sullen, whose picture was bought by His Majesty. Oh, of course I have. We went to the exhibition on purpose to have a look at it. Is he one of them? Yes, they're often very hard up, these young fellows. But that's nothing new in the case of young men who have to fight their way in the world. They say your brother-in-law's a poet, went on Mrs. Homan. Oh, rather, 
He writes excellent verse. The Academy gave him a prize. The world will hear of him in time, replied Mrs. Falk with conviction. Haven't I always said so? agreed Mrs. Homan. And Arvid Falk's talents were enlarged upon, so that he had arrived in the temple of fame when the footman announced the Reverend Nathaniel Scorey. The latter entered hastily and hurriedly shook hands with the ladies. "'I must ask your indulgence for being so late,' he said. "'But I'm a very busy man. I have to be at a meeting at Countess Fabricant's at half-past nine, and I have come straight from my work.' "'Are you in a hurry, then, dear pastor?' "'Yes, my wide activities give me no leisure. Hadn't we better begin business at once?' The footman handed round refreshments. "'Won't you take a cup of tea, pastor, before we begin?' asked the hostess, smarting under the unpleasantness of a small disappointment. The pastor glanced at the tray. "'Thank you, no. I'll take a glass of punch, if I may. I've made it a rule, ladies, never to differ from my fellow creatures in externals. Everybody drinks punch. I don't like it, but I don't want the world to say that I'm better than anybody else. Boasting is a failing which I detest. May I now begin with the proceedings?' He sat down at the writing-table dipped the pen into the ink, and read, Account of the presents received by the Administrative Committee of the Creche Bethlehem during the month of May. Sign, Eugenia Falk. Nee, if I may ask? Oh, never mind about that, said Mrs. Falk. Mrs. Holman? Holman? Nee, if I may make so bold. Von Barr, dear pastor. Antoinette Renhelm? Nee, madame? Renhelm, pastor. All true. You married your cousin. Husband dead. No children. But to continue, presents? There was a general, almost general, consternation. But won't you sign too, pastor? asked Mrs. Homan. I dislike boasting, ladies. But if it's your wish, here goes. Nathaniel Scorey. Your health, pastor. Won't you drink a glass of punch before we begin? asked the hostess with a charming smile which died on her lips when she looked at the pastor's glass. It was empty. She quickly filled it. Thank you, Mrs. Falk, but we mustn't be immoderate. May I begin now? Please check me by the manuscript. Presence. H. M. The Queen, 40 crowns. Countess Fabercrantz, 5 crowns and a pair of woolen stockings. Wholesale Merchant Chalen, 2 crowns, a packet of envelopes, 6 steel nibs, and a bottle of ink. Miss Amanda Liebert, a bottle of eau de cologne. Miss Anna Fief, a pair of cuffs. Charlie, two pence half penny from his money box. Johanna Peterson, half dozen towels. Miss Emily Bjorn, a New Testament. Grocer Pearson, a bag of oatmeal, a quart of potatoes, and a bottle of pickled onions. Draper Shiky. Two pairs of woolen under. May I ask the meeting whether all this is to be printed? Interrupted her ladyship. Well, of course, answered the pastor. Then I must resign my post on the administrative committee. But do you imagine, Lady Renholm, that the society could exist on voluntary contributions if the names of the donors did not appear in print? Impossible. Is charity to shed its radiance on petty vanity? No, no, don't say that. Vanity is an evil, certainly. We turn the evil into good by transforming it into charity. Isn't that praiseworthy? Oh, yes, but we mustn't call petty things by high-sounding names. If we do, we are boastful. You are severe, Lady Renhelm. Scripture exhorts us to pardon others. You should pardon their vanity. I'm ready to pardon it in others, but not in myself. It's pardonable and good that ladies who have nothing else to do should find pleasure in charity, but it's disgraceful if they call it good action seeing that it is only their pleasure and a greater pleasure than most others on account of the wide publicity given to it by printing. Oh, began Mrs. Falk with the full force of her terrible logic, do you mean to say that doing good is disgraceful, Lady Renhelm? No, my dear, but in my opinion it is disgraceful to print the fact that one has given a pair of woolen stockings. But to give a pair of woolen stockings is doing good. Therefore it must be disgraceful to do good. 
No, but to have it printed, my child. You aren't listening to what I'm saying, replied her ladyship, reproving her stubborn hostess who would not give in, but went on. I see. It's the printing which is disgraceful. But the Bible is printed. Consequently, it is disgraceful to print the Bible. Please go on, Pastor, interrupted her ladyship, a little annoyed by the tactless manner in which her hostess defended her inanities, but the latter did not yet count the battle as lost. Do you think it beneath your dignity, Lady Rinhelm, to exchange views with so unimportant a person as I am? No, my child, but keep your views to yourself. I don't want to exchange. Do you call this discussing a question, may I ask? Won't you enlighten us on the point, Pastor? Can it be called discussing a question if one party refuses to reply to the argument of the other? Of course it can't, my dear Mrs. Falk, replied the pastor with an ambiguous smile, which nearly reduced Mrs. Falk to tears. But don't let us spoil a splendid enterprise by quarreling over trifles, ladies. We'll postpone the printing until the funds are larger. We have seen the young enterprise shooting up like a seed, and we have seen that powerful hands are willing to attend to the young plant. But we must think of the future. The society has a fund. The fund must be administered. In other words, we must look round for administrator, a practical man, able to transform these presents into hard cash. We must elect a treasurer. I'm afraid we shall not find one without a sacrifice of money. Does one ever get anything without such a sacrifice? Have the ladies anybody in view? No, the ladies had not thought of it. Then may I propose a young man of steady character who, in my opinion, is just the right person for the work. Has the administrative committee any objection to appointing Secretary Eklund to the post of treasurer at a suitable salary? The ladies had no objection to make, especially as the young man was recommended by the Reverend Nathaniel Scorey, and the pastor felt more qualified to recommend them because he was a near relative of his, and so the creche had a treasure with a salary of six hundred crowns. Ladies, began the pastor again, have we worked long enough in the vineyard for one day? There was silence. Mrs. Falk stared at the door, wondering where her husband was. My time is short, and I'm prevented from staying any longer. Has anybody any further suggestion to make? No? In calling down the blessing of the Lord on our enterprise, which has begun so auspiciously, I commend all of us to his loving mercy. I cannot do it in a better way than by repeating the words which he himself has taught us when he prayed, Abba, Father, our Father. He was silent as if he were afraid of the sound of his own voice, and the committee covered their faces with their hands as if they were ashamed of looking at each other in the eyes. The ensuing pause grew long, unbearably long, yet no one dared to break it. Everyone looked through the fingers, hoping that someone else would make the first move, when a violent pull at the front doorbell brought the party down to earth. The pastor took his hat and emptied his glass. There was something about him of a man who was trying to steal away. Mrs. Falk beamed, for here was the crushing, the vengeance, the rehabilitation. Revenge was there, and the crushing, too, for the footman handed her a letter from her husband which contained... The guests were not enlightened as to its contents, but they saw enough to make them declare at once they had pressing engagements. Lady Renhelm would have liked to stay and comfort her young hostess, whose appearance betrayed a high degree of consternation and unhappiness. The latter, however, did not encourage her, but on the contrary was so exceedingly eager to help her visitors with their hats and coats that it looked as if she wanted to be rid of them as quickly as possible. They parted in great embarrassment. The footsteps died away on the staircase, and a departing guest could tell, from the nervous haste with which the hostess shut the door behind him, that she longed for solitude in order to be able to give vent to her feelings. It was quite true. Left by herself in the large rooms, Mrs. Falk burst into violent sobs, but her tears were not the tears which fall like a May shower on a wizened old heart. They were the tears of wrath and rage which darken the mirror of the soul and fall like an acid on the roses of health and youth and wither them. End of chapter 13
Chapter 14 of The Red Room by August Strindberg. Translated by Ellie Schlesner. Recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Absent. A hot afternoon was scorching the pavements of the provincial town ex Cheeping. The large vaults of the town hall were still deserted. Fir branches were scattered all over the floor, and it smelt of a funeral. The graduated liquor bottles stood on the shelves, having an afternoon nap, opposite the brandy bottles which wore the collars of their orders round their necks, and were on leave until the evening. The clock, which could never take a nap, stood against the wall like a tall peasant, whiling away the time by contemplating, apparently, a huge playbill, impaled on a clothes peg close by. The vault was very long and narrow. Both of the long walls were furnished with birchwood tables, jutting out from the wall, giving it the appearance of a stable, in which the four-legged tables represented the horses tied with their heads to the wall, and turning their hind quarters towards the room. At the present moment all of them were asleep. One of them lifted its hind leg a little off the ground, for the floor was very uneven. One could see that they were fast asleep, for the flies were calmly walking up and down their backs. The sixteen-year-old waiter, who was leaning against the tall clock close to the poster, was not asleep. He was incessantly waving his white apron at the flies, which had just finished their dinner in the kitchen and were now playing about the vaults. Every now and then he leaned back and put his ear to the chest of the clock, as if he were sounding it or wanting to find out what it had for dinner. He was soon to be enlightened. The tall creature gave a sob, and exactly four minutes later it sobbed again. A groaning and rumbling in its inside made the lad jump. Rattling terribly, it struck six times, after which it continued its silent work. The boy, too, began to work. He walked round his stable, grooming his horses with his apron and putting everything in order as if he were expecting visitors. On one of the tables, in the background from which a spectator could view the whole long room, he placed matches, a bottle of absinthe, and two glasses a liqueur glass, and a tumbler. Then he fetched the bottle of water from the pump and put it on the table by the side of the inflammables. When everything was ready, he paced up and down the room, occasionally striking quite unexpected attitudes, as if he were imitating somebody. Now he stood, with arms folded across his chest, his head bowed, staring fiercely at the faded paper on the old walls. Now he stood with legs crossed, the knuckles of his right hand touching the edge of the table, holding in his left a lorgnette, made of a piece of wire from a beer bottle through which he sarcastically scanned the mouldings on the ceiling. The door flew open, and a man of thirty-five entered with assurance, as if he were coming into his own house. His beardless face had the sharply cut features, which are the result of much exercise of the facial muscles, characteristic of actors and one other class. Every muscle and ligament was plainly visible under the skin with its bluish shadows on upper lip and chin. But the miserable wirework which set these fine tangents in motion was invisible, for he was not like a common piano which requires a pedal. A high, rather narrow forehead with hollow temples rose like a true Corinthian capital. Black, untidy locks of hair climbed round it like wild creepers from which small, straight snakes darted, trying to reach the sockets of his eyes, but ever failing to do so. In calm moments his large, dark eyes looked gentle and sad, but there were times when they blazed, and then the pupils looked like the muzzles of a revolver. He took a seat at the table which the boy had prepared and looked sadly at the water bottle. "'Why do you always give me a bottle of water, Gustav?' "'So that you won't be burned to death, sir.' "'What does it matter to you whether I am or not? "'Can I burn if I like?' "'Don't be a nihilist today, sir.' "'Nihilist? "'Who talked to you of nihilist? "'When did you hear that word? "'Are you mad, boy? "'Speak!' "'He rose to his feet "'and fired a few shots from his dark revolvers. "'Fear and consternation at the expression in the actor's face "'kept Gustav tongue-tied. "'Answer, boy. "'When did you hear this word?' "'Mr. Montana said it a few days ago when he came here from his church,' answered the boy timidly. "'Montanus, indeed,' said the Malakawi man, sitting down again. "'Montanus is my man. He has a large understanding. 
I say, Gustav, what's the name, I mean the nickname by which these theatrical blackguards call me? Tell me, you needn't be afraid. I'd rather not, sir. It's very ugly. Why not, if you can please me by doing so? Don't you think I could do with a little cheering up? Do I look so frightfully gay? Out with it. What do they say when they ask you whether I have been here? Don't they say, has... The devil? Ah, the devil. They hate me, don't they? Yes, they do. Good. But why? Have I done them any harm? No, they can't say that, sir. No, I don't think they can. But they say that you ruin people, sir. Ruin? Yes, they say that you ruin me, sir, because I find there's nothing new in the world. Hmm. Hmm. I suppose you tell them that their jokes are stale. Yes, everything they say is stale. They are so stale themselves that they make me sick. Indeed. And don't you think that being a waiter is stale? Yes, I do. Life and death and everything is an old story. No, to be an actor would be something new. No, my friend, that is the stalest of all stale stories. But shut up now. I want to forget myself. He drank his absinthe and rested his head against the wall with its long brown streak, the track on which the smoke of his cigar had ascended during the six long years he had been sitting there smoking. The rays of the sun fell through the window, passing through the sieve of the great aspens outside, whose light foliage, dancing in the evening breeze, threw a tremendous net on the long wall. The shadow of the melancholy man's head, with its untidy locks of hair, fell on the lowest corner of the net and looked very much like a huge spider. Gustav had returned to the clock, where he sat plunged in nihilistic silence, watching the flies dancing round the hanging lamp. Gustav! came a voice from the spider's web. Yes, sir, was the prompt response from the clock. Are your parents still alive? No, sir, you know they aren't. Good for you. A long pause. Gustav? Yes, sir. Can you sleep at night? What do you mean, sir? Answered Gustav, blushing. What I say? Of course I can. Why shouldn't I? Why do you want to be an actor? I don't know. I believe I should be happy. Aren't you happy now? I don't know. I don't think so. Has Mr. Runhelm been here again? No, sir, but he said he would come here to meet you about this time. A long pause, the door opened, and a shadow fell into the spider's net. It trembled, and the spider in the corner made a quick movement. Mr. Runhelm, said the melancholy head. Mr. Flander. Glad to meet you. You came here before? Yes. I arrived this afternoon and called at once. You'll guess my purpose. I want to go on the stage. Do you really? You amaze me. Amaze you? Yes, but why do you come to me first? Because I know that you are one of the finest actors, and because a mutual friend, Mr. Montanus, the sculptor, told me that you were in every way to be trusted. Did he? Well, what can I do for you? I want advice. Won't you sit down? If I may act as a host, I couldn't think of such a thing. Then, as my own guest, if you don't mind. As you like. You want advice? Hmm. Shall I give you my candid opinion? Yes, of course. Then listen to me. Take what I'm going to say seriously, and never forget that I said such and such a thing on such and such an evening. I'll be responsible for my words. Give me your candid opinion. I'm prepared for anything. Have you ordered your horses? No? Then do so and go home. Do you think me incapable of being an actor? By no means. I don't think anybody in all the world incapable of that. On the contrary, everybody has more or less talent for acting. Very well, then. Oh, the reality is so different from your dream. You're young, your blood flows quickly through your veins. A thousand pictures, bright and beautiful, like the pictures in a fairy tale, throng your brain. You want to bring them to the light, show them to the world, and in doing so experience a great joy. Isn't that so? Yes, yes, you're expressing my very thoughts. I only suppose quite a common case. I don't suspect bad motives behind everything, although I have a bad opinion of most things. Well then, this desire of yours is so strong that you would rather suffer want, humiliate yourself, allow yourself to be sucked dry by vampires, lose your social reputation, become bankrupt, 
Go to the dogs, then turn back. Am I right? Yes. How well you know me. I once knew a young man. I know him no longer. He is so changed. He was fifteen years old when he left the penitentiary, which every community keeps for the children who commit the outrageous crime of being born, and where the innocent little ones are made to atone for their parents' fall from grace, for what should otherwise become a society. Please remind me to keep to the subject. On leaving it, he went for five years to Uppsala and read a terrible number of books. His brain was divided into six pigeonholes in which six kinds of information, dates, names, a whole warehouse full of ready-made opinions, conclusions, theories, ideas, and nonsense of every description were stored like a general cargo. This might have been allowed to pass, for there's plenty of room in a brain, but he was also supposed to accept foreign thoughts, rotten old thoughts, which others had chewed for a long time, and which they now vomited. It filled him with nausea, and he was twenty years old. He went on the stage. Look at my watch. Look at the second hand. It makes sixty little steps before a minute has passed. Sixty times sixty before it is an hour. Twenty-four times the number, and it is a day. Three hundred and sixty-five times, and it is only a year. Now imagine ten years. Did you ever wait for a friend outside his house? The first quarter of an hour passes like a flash. The second quarter, oh, one doesn't mind waiting for a person one's fond of. The third quarter, he's not coming. The fourth, hope and fear. The fifth, one goes away but hurries back. The sixth, damn it all, I've wasted my time for nothing. The seventh, having waited so long, I might just as well wait a little longer. The eighth, raging and cursing. The ninth, one goes home, lies down on one's sofa, and feels as calm as if one were walking arm in arm with death. He waited for ten years. Ten years! Isn't my hair standing on end when I say ten years? Look at it. Ten years had passed before he was allowed to play a part. When he did, he had a tremendous success at once. But his ten wasted years had brought him to the verge of insanity. He was mad that it hadn't happened ten years before. And he was amazed to find that happiness, when at last he held it within his grasp, didn't make him happy. And so he was unhappy. But don't you think he required the ten years for the study of his art? How could he study it when he was never allowed to play? He was a laughing stock, the scum of the playbill. The management said he was no good. And whenever he tried to find an engagement at another theater, he was told that he had no repertoire. But why couldn't he be happy when his luck had turned? Do you think an immortal soul is content with happiness? But why speak about it? Your resolution is irrevocable. My advice is superfluous. There is but one teacher. Experience, and experience is as capricious or as calculating as a schoolmaster. Some of the pupils are always praised. Others are always beaten. You are born to be praised. Don't think I'm saying this because you belong to a good family. I'm sufficiently enlightened not to make that fact responsible for good or evil. In this case, it is a particularly negligible quantity, for on the stage a man stands or falls by his own merit. I hope you'll have an early success, so that you won't be enlightened too soon. I believe you deserve it. But have you no respect for your art, the greatest and most sublime of all arts? It's overrated like everything about which men write books. It's full of danger and can do much harm, a beautifully told lie can impress like a truth. It's like a mass meeting where the uncultured majority turns the scale. The more superficial, the better. The worse, the better. I don't mean to say that it is superfluous. That can't be your opinion. That is my opinion. But all the same, I may be mistaken. But have you really no respect for your art? For mine? Why should I have more respect for my art than for anybody else's? And yet you've played the greatest parts. You've played Shakespeare. You've played Hamlet. Have you never been touched in your inmost soul when speaking that tremendous monologue, to be or not to be? What do you mean by tremendous? Full of profound thought. Do explain yourself. Is it so full of profound thought to say, shall I take my life or not? I should do so if I knew what comes hereafter, and everybody else would do the same thing. But as we don't know, we don't take our lives. Is that so very profound? Not if expressed in those words. There you are. You surely contemplated suicide at one time or another. 
haven't you? Yes, I suppose most people have. And why didn't you do it? Because, like Hamlet, you hadn't the courage, not knowing what comes after. Were you very profound then? Of course I wasn't. Therefore, it's nothing but a banality. Or, express in one word, it is... What is it? Gustav? Stale! came a voice from the clock, a voice which seemed to have waited for its cue. It's stale! But supposing the poet had given us an acceptable supposition of a future life that would have been something new. Is everything new excellent? asked Rinhelm. Under the pressure of all the new ideas to which he had been listening, his courage was fast ebbing away. New ideas have one great merit. They are new. Try to think your own thoughts, and you will always find them new. Will you believe me when I say that I knew what you wanted before you walked in that door, and that I know what you are going to say next, seeing that we are discussing Shakespeare? You are a strange man. I can't help confessing that you're right in what you're saying, although I don't agree with you. What do you say to Anthony's speech over the body of Caesar? Isn't it remarkable? That's exactly what I was going to speak about. You seem to be able to read my thoughts. Exactly what I was telling you just now. And is it so wonderful, considering that all men think the same, or at any rate say the same thing? Well, what do you find in it, of any great depth? I can't explain in words. Don't you think it is a very commonplace piece of sarcastic oratory? One expresses exactly the reverse of one's meaning, and if the points are sharpened, they are bound to sting. But have you ever come across anything more beautiful than the dialogue between Juliet and Romeo after their wedding night? Ah, you mean where he says, It is the nightingale and not the lark? What other passage could I mean? Doesn't everyone quote that? It is a wonderful poetical conception on which the effect depends. Do you think Shakespeare's greatness depends on poetical conceptions? Why do you break up everything I admire? Why do you take away my supports? I am throwing away your crutches so that you may learn to walk without them. But let me ask you to keep to the point. You are not asking. You are compelling me to do so. Then you should steer clear of me. Your parents are against your taking this step. Yes. How do you know? Parents always are. Why overrate my judgment? You should never exaggerate anything. Do you think we should be happier if we didn't? Happier? Hmm. Do you know anybody who is happy? Give me your own opinion, not the conventional one. No. If you don't believe anybody is happy, how can you postulate such a condition as being happier? Your parents are alive, then? It's a mistake to have parents. Why? What do you mean? Don't you think it unfair of an older generation to bring up a younger one in its antiquated inanities? Your parents expect gratitude from you, I suppose. And doesn't one owe it to one's parents? For what? For the fact that with the connivance of the law they have brought us into this world of misery? have half-starved us, beaten us, oppressed us, humiliated us, opposed all our wishes? Believe me, a revolution is needed. Two revolutions. Why don't you take some absinthe? Are you afraid of it? Look at the bottle. It's marked with the Geneva Cross. It heals those who have been wounded on the battlefield, friends and foes alike. It lulls all pain, blunts the keen edge of thought, blots out memories, stifles all the nobler emotions which beguile humanity into folly, and finally extinguishes the light of reason. Do you know what the light of reason is? First, it is a phrase. Secondly, it is a willow, the wisp. One of those flames, you know, which play about spots, which decaying fish have engendered phosphoretted hydrogen. The light of reason is phosphoretted hydrogen engendered by the gray brain substance. It is a strange thing. Everything good on this earth perishes and is forgotten. During my ten years touring and my apparent idleness, I have read through all the libraries one finds in small towns, and I find that all the twaddle and nonsense contained in the books is popular and constantly quoted, but the wisdom is neglected and pushed aside. Do remind me to keep to the point. The clock went through its diabolical tricks and thundered seven. The door was flung open and a man lurched noisily into the room. He was a man of about fifty, with a huge, heavy head, fixed between a pair of lumpy shoulders like a mortar on a gun carriage, with a permanent elevation of forty-five degrees, looking as if it were going to throw bombs at the stars. To judge from the face, the owner was capable of all possible crimes and impossible vices. 
but too great a coward to commit any. He immediately threw a bombshell at the melancholy man and harshly ordered a glass of grog made of rum, in grammatical, uncouth language, and in the voice of a corporal. "'This is the man who holds your fate in his hands,' whispered the melancholy man to Runhelm. "'This is the tragedian, actor-manager, and my deadly foe.' Renhelm could not suppress a shudder of disgust as he looked at the terrible individual, who, after having exchanged a look of hatred with Philander, now closed the passage of arms by repeated expectorations. The door opened again, and in glided the almost elegant figure of a middle-aged man with oily hair and a wax moustache. He familiarly took his place by the side of the actor-manager, who gave him his middle finger on which shone a ring with a large cornelian. "'This is the editor of the conservative paper, the defender of throne and altar. He has the run of the theater and tries to seduce all the girls on whom the actor-manager hasn't cast his eye. He started his career as a government official, but had to resign his post. I'm ashamed to tell you why,' explained Flander. "'But I'm also ashamed to remain in the same room with these gentlemen. And moreover, I have asked a few friends here tonight to a little supper in celebration of my recent benefit. If you care to spend the evening in bad company, among the most unimportant actors, two notorious ladies and an old blackguard, you are welcome at eight. Renhelm hesitated a moment before he accepted the invitation. The spider on the wall climbed through his net as if to examine it and disappeared. The fly remained in its place a little longer. The sun sank behind the cathedral. The meshes of the net were undone as if they had never existed and the aspens outside the window shivered. The great man and stage director raised his voice and shouted he had forgotten how to speak. Did you see the attack on me in the weekly? Don't take any notice of such piffle. Take no notice of it? What the devil do you mean? Doesn't everybody read it? Of course the whole town does. I should like to give him a horsewhipping. The impertinent rascal calls me affected and exaggerated. Bribe him. Don't make a fuss. Bribe him? Haven't I tried it? But these liberal journalists are damn queer. If you are on friendly terms with them, they'll give you a nice enough notice, but they won't be bribed, however poor they may be. Oh, you don't go about it the right way. You shouldn't do it openly. You could send them presents, which they can turn into cash, or cash, if you like, but anonymously, and never refer to it. As I do in your case? No, old chap, the trick doesn't work in their case. I've tried it. It's hell to reckon with people with opinions. Who do you think was the victim in the devil's clutches? To change the subject, that's nothing to do with me. Oh, but I think it has. Gustav, who was the gentleman with Mr. Flander? His name's Renhelm. He wants to go on the stage. What do you say? He wants to go on the stage? He? shouted the actor-manager. Yes, that's it, replied Gustav. And, of course, act tragedy parts? And be Flander's protege? and not come to me, and take away my parts, and honor us by playing here, and I know nothing about the whole matter. I? I? I'm sorry for him. It's a pity. Bad prospects for him. Of course, I shall patronize him. I'll take him under my wing. The strength of my wings may be felt even when I don't fly. They have a way of pinching now and then. He was a nice-looking lad, smart lad, beautiful as in tenuous. What a pity he didn't come to me first. I should have given him Philander's parts, every one of them. Oh, 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 but it isn't too late yet. Ha! Let the devil corrupt him first. He's still a little too fresh. He really looked quite an innocent boy. Poor little chap. I'll only say, God help him. The sound of the last sentence was drowned in the noise made by the grog drinkers of the whole town who were now beginning to arrive. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of the Red Room》by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Chapter Fifteen: The Theatrical Company, Phoenix*. On the following day, Renhelm awoke late in the morning in his hotel bed. Memories of the previous night arose like phantoms and crowded round him. He saw again the pretty, closely shuttered room, richly decorated with flowers, in which the orgy had been held. 
He saw the actress, a lady of thirty-five, who, thanks to a younger rival, had to play the parts of old women. He saw her entering the room, in a frenzy of rage and despair at the fresh humiliations heaped upon her, throwing herself full length on the sofa, drinking glass after glass of wine, and, when the temperature of the room rose, opening her bodice as a man opens his waistcoat after too plentiful a dinner. He saw again the old comedian who, after a very short career, had been degraded from playing lead to taking servants' parts. He now entertained the tradespeople of the town with his songs, and above all with the stories of his short glory. But in the very heart of the clouds of smoke and his drunken visions, Renhelm saw the picture of a young girl of sixteen, who had arrived with tears in her eyes, and told the melancholy philander that the great actor-manager had again been persecuting her with insulting proposals, vowing that in future, unless she would accede to them, she would play only the very smallest parts. And he saw Philander, listening to everybody's troubles and complaints, breathing on them until they vanished. He watched him, reducing insults, humiliations, kicks, accidents, want, misery, and grief to nothing, watched him teaching his friends, and warning them never to exaggerate anything, least of all their troubles. But again and again his thoughts reverted to the little girl of sixteen, with the innocent face, with whom he had made friends, and who had kissed him when they parted, hungrily, passionately. To be quite candid, her kiss had taken him by surprise. But what was her name? He rose, and stretching out his hand for the water-bottle, he seized a tiny handkerchief spotted with wine. Ah, here was her name, ineffaceable, written in marking ink. Agnes. He kissed the handkerchief twice on the cleanest spot, and put it into his box. When he had carefully dressed himself, he went out to see the actor-manager, whom he confidently expected to find at the theater between twelve and three. To be on the safe side, he arrived at the office at twelve o'clock. He found no one there but a porter, who asked him what he wanted, and put himself at his service. Renhelm did not think that he would need his help, and asked to see the actor-manager. He was told that the actor-manager was at the present moment at the factory, but would no doubt come to the office in the course of the afternoon. Renhelm supposed factory to be a slang expression for theater, but the porter explained to him that the actor-manager was also a match manufacturer. His brother-in-law, the cashier, was a post office employee, and never came to the theater before two o'clock. His son, the secretary, had a post in the telegraph office, and his presence could never be safely relied upon. But the porter, who seemed to guess the object of Renhelm's visit, handed him, on his own responsibility and in the name of the theatre, a copy of the statues. The young gentleman was at liberty to amuse himself with it until one of the managerial staff arrived. Renhelm possessed his soul in patience, and sat down on the sofa to study the documents. It was half-past twelve when he had finished reading them. He talked to the porter until quarter to one and then set himself to fathom the meaning of paragraph one of the statues. The theater is a moral institution, it ran. Therefore, the members of the company should endeavor to live in the fear of God and to lead a virtuous and moral life. He turned and twisted the sentence about, trying to throw light upon it without succeeding. If the theater is a moral institution, he mused, the members who, in addition to the manager, the cashier, the secretary, the machinist, and scene shifters, form the institution, need not endeavor to practice all these beautiful things. If it said, the theater is an immoral institution, and therefore there would be some sense in it, but that, surely, the management does not intend to convey. He thought of Hamlet's words, words, but immediately remembered that to quote Hamlet was stale and that one ought to clothe one's thought in one's own words. He chose his own term, and called the regulations nonsense, but discarded the expression again, because it was not original. But then the original was not original either. Paragraph 2 helped him to while away a quarter of an hour in meditation on the text. The theater is not a place for amusement. It does not merely exist to give pleasure. In one place it said the theater is not a place for amusement, and in another the theater does not merely exist to give pleasure. Therefore it did exist to give pleasure, to a certain extent. 
he reflected under what circumstances the theatre ministered to one's pleasure. It was amusing to see children, especially sons, defrauding their parents, more particularly when the parents were thrifty, good-hearted, and sensible. It was amusing to see wives deceiving their husbands, especially when the husband was old and required his wife's care. Besides this, he remembered having laughed very heartily at two old men who nearly died of starvation, because their business was on the decline, and that to this day all the world laughed at it in a piece written by a classical author. He also recollected having been much amused by the misfortune of an elderly man who had become deaf, and that together with six hundred other men and women he had shouted with laughter at a priest who tried by natural means to cure his insanity, the result of self-restraint. His mirth had been particularly stimulated by the hypocrisy displayed by the wily priest in order to gain the object of his desire. Why does one laugh? he wondered, and as he had nothing else to do, he tried to find an answer. One laughed at misfortune, want, misery, vice, virtue, the defeat of good, the victory of evil. This conclusion, which was partly new to him, put him into a good temper. He found a great deal of amusement in playing with his thoughts. As the management still remained invisible, he went on playing, and, before the lapse of five minutes, he had come to the following conclusion. In a tragedy, one weeps at just those things which in comedy make one laugh. At this point, his thoughts were arrested. The great actor-manager burst into the room, brushed past Renhelm without apparently being aware of his presence, and entered a room on the left, whither, a moment afterwards, the violent ringing of a bell summoned the porter. In less than half a minute, he had gone in and come out again, announcing that his highness was ready to receive the visitor. As Renhelm entered, the director had already fired his shot, and his mortar was fixed at an angle which quite prevented him from perceiving the nervous mortal who was timidly coming into the room. But he had no doubt heard him, for he asked him immediately, in an offensive manner, what he wanted. Renhelm stammered that he was anxious to make his debut on the stage. What? A debut? Have you a repertory, sir? Have you played Hamlet, Lear, Richard Sheridan, been called ten times before the curtain after the third act? What? I've never played a part. Oh, I see. That's quite another thing. He sat down in an easy chair painted with silver paint and covered with blue brocade. His face had become a mask. He might have been sitting for a portrait for one of the biographies of Suetonius. Shall I give you my candid opinion? What? Leave the theatrical profession alone. Impossible. I repeat, leave it alone. It's the worst of all professions, full of humiliations, unpleasantness, little annoyances, and thorns which will embitter your life so that you'll wish you had never been born. He looked as if he were speaking the truth, but Renhelm's resolution was not to be shaken. I beg you to take my advice. I solemnly adjure you to drop this idea. I tell you that the prospects are so bad that for years to come you'll have simply to walk on. Think of it, and don't come to me with complaints when it's too late. The theatrical career is so infernally difficult, sir, that you would not dream of taking it up if you had the least knowledge of it. It's a hell. Believe me, I have spoken. It was a waste of breath. Well, wouldn't you prefer an engagement without a debut? The risk is less great. I shall be only too pleased. I never expected more. Then you better sign this agreement. A salary of twelve hundred crowns and two years' engagement. Do you agree? He pulled a filled-up agreement signed by the management from underneath the blotting pad and gave it to Renhelm. The latter's brain was whirling at the thought of the twelve hundred crowns, and he signed it without a look at the contents. When he had signed, the actor-manager held out his large middle finger with the cornelian ring and said, Be welcome. He flashed at him with the gums of his upper jaw and the yellow and bloodshot whites of his eyes with their green irises. The audience was over, but Renhelm, in whose opinion the whole business had been hurried through far too quickly, instead of moving, took the liberty of asking whether he had not better wait until all the members of the management were assembled. The management? shouted the great tragedian. 
I end the management. If you have any questions to ask, address yourself to me. If you want advice, come to me. To me, sir. To nobody else. That's all. You can go now. The skirt of Renhelm's coat must have caught on a nail, for he turned on the threshold to see what the last words looked like. But he saw only the red gums, which had the appearance of an instrument of torture, and the bloodshot eyes. He felt no desire to ask for an explanation, but went straight to the vaults of the town hall to have some dinner and meet Philander. Philander was sitting at one of the tables, calm and indifferent, as if he were prepared for the worst. He was not surprised to hear that Renhelm had been engaged, although this news considerably increased his gloom. "'And what did you think of the manager?' he asked. "'I wanted to box his ears, but I hadn't the courage.' "'Nor has the management, and therefore he rules autocratically. Brutality always rules. Perhaps you know that he is a playwright as well as all the rest.' "'I've heard about it. He writes a sort of historical play which is always successful. The reason is that he writes parts instead of creating characters.' He manipulates the applause at the exits and trades on so-called patriotism. His characters never talk, they quarrel. Men and women, old and young, all of them. For this reason his popular piece, The Sons of King Gustavus, is rightly called a historical quarrel in five acts. It contains no action, nothing but quarrels, family rows, street brawls, scenes in Parliament, and so on. Questions are answered by sly cuts which do not provoke scenes but the most terrible scuffles. There is no dialogue, nothing but squabbling, in which the characters insult each other, and the highest dramatic effect is attained by blows. The critic call his characterization great. What has he made of Gustavus Vasa in the play I just mentioned? A broad-shouldered, long-bearded, bragging, untenable fellow of enormous strength. At the meeting of Parliament at Vasteros, he breaks a table with his fist, and at Vestina he kicks a door panel to pieces. On one occasion, however, the critics said there was no meaning in his plays. It made him angry, and he resolved to write comedies with plenty of meaning. He had a boy at school, the blackguards married, who had been playing pranks and got a thrashing. Immediately his father wrote a comedy in which he drew the masters and exposed the inhuman treatment boys receive at school in these days. On another occasion he was criticized by an honest reviewer, and immediately he wrote a comedy, libeling the liberal journalists of the town. But I'll say no more about him. Why does he hate you? Because I said, at a rehearsal, Don Pasquale, in spite of his maintaining that the proper pronunciation was Pascal. Result? I was ordered, on penalty of a fine, to pronounce the word in his way. It was immaterial to him, he said, how the rest of the world pronounced the word, at Excheeping, it was to be pronounced Pascal, because it was his wish. Where does he come from? What was he before? Can't you guess that he was a wheelwright? He'd poison you if he thought you knew it. But let us change the subject. How do you feel after last night's revels? Splendid! I quite forgot to thank you. Don't mention it. Are you fond of the girl? I mean, Agnes? Yes, I'm very fond of her. And she loves you? That's all right, then. Take her. What nonsense you talk. We couldn't be married for a long time. Who told you to be married? What are you driving at? You're eighteen. She's sixteen. You're in love with each other. If you're agreed, only the most private detail is wanting. I don't understand what you mean. Are you trying to encourage me to behave like a scoundrel towards her? I am trying to encourage you to obey the great voice of nature and snap your fingers at the petty commands of men. It's only envy if men condemn your conduct. Their much talked of morality is nothing but malice in a suitable, presentable guise. Hasn't nature called you for some time to her great banquet, the delight of the gods, and the horror of society, afraid of having to pay alimony? Why don't you advise me to marry her? Because that's quite another thing. One doesn't bind oneself for life after having spent one evening together. It doesn't follow that he who has enjoyed the rapture must also undergo the pain. Matrimony is an affair of souls. There can be no question of this in your case. However, there's no need for me to spur you on. The inevitable is bound to happen. Love each other while you're young, before it's too late. Love each other as birds love, without worrying about how to furnish a home. Love as the flowers of the species Daesia. 
You've no right to talk disrespectfully of the girl. She is good, innocent, and to be pitied, and whoever denies it is a liar. Have you ever seen more innocent eyes than hers? Doesn't truth proclaim itself in the sound of her voice? She is worthy of a great and pure love, not merely of the passion you speak of. Don't ever talk to me about her in this way again. You can tell her that I shall look upon it as the greatest happiness and the highest honor to ask her to marry me when I'm worthy of her. Philander shook his head so violently that the snakes on his foreheads wriggled. Worthy of her? Marriage? What stuff? I mean it. Dreadful! And if I should tell you that the girl does not only lack all the qualities which you ascribe to her, but possesses all the reverse ones, you wouldn't believe me, but would deprive me of your friendship? Yes, the world is so full of lies that nobody will believe a man when he speaks the truth. How can a man believe you, who have no morals? That word again! What an extraordinary word it is! It answers all questions, cuts off all discussions, excuses all failings, one's own, not those of others, strikes down all adversaries, pleads for or against the cause, just like a lawyer. For the moment you have defeated me with it, next time I shall defeat you. I must be off. I have a lesson at three. Goodbye. Good luck. And he left Runhelm to his dinner and his reflections. When Philander arrived home, he put on a dressing gown and slippers, as if he were expecting no visitors. But he seemed full of an uncontrollable restlessness. He walked up and down the room, stopping every now and then at the window and gazing at the street from behind the curtain. After a while he stopped before the looking-glass, took his collar off, and laid it on the sofa-table. For a few more minutes he continued his promenade, but suddenly, coming to a standstill before a card-tray, he took up the photograph of a lady, placed it under a strong magnifying glass, and examined it as if it were a microscopic slide. He lingered a long time over his examination. Presently he heard the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Quickly concealing the photograph in the place from where he had taken it, he jumped up and went and sat at his writing table, turning his back to the door. He was apparently absorbed in writing when a knocking, two short, gentle raps, broke the silence. "'Come in!' he called, in a voice which was anything but inviting. A young girl, small but well-proportioned, entered the room. She had a delicate, oval face, surrounded by an aureole of hair, which might have been bleached by the sun, for it was of a less pronounced tint than the usual natural blonde. The constant play of the small nose and exquisitely cut mouth produced roguish curves which were incessantly changing, like the figures in a kaleidoscope. When, for instance, she moved the wings of her nose so that the bright red cartilage showed like the leaf of a liverwort, her lips fell apart and disclosed the edges of a very small, straight teeth which, although her own, were too white and even to inspire confidence. Her eyes were drawn up at the root of the nose and slanted towards the temples. This gave them a pleading, pathetic expression, which stood in bewitching contrast to the lower, roguish parts of her face. She had restless pupils, small like the point of a needle at one moment, and distended at the next, like the objective of a night telescope. On entering the room, she removed the key from the lock and shot the bolt. Philander remained sitting at his table, writing. "'You are late today, Agnes,' he said. "'Yes, I know,' she replied defiantly, taking off her hat. "'We were up late last night. "'Why don't you get up and say how do you do to me? "'You can't be tired as all that.' "'I beg your pardon. I forgot all about it.' "'You forgot? "'I have noticed for some time that you've been forgetting yourself in many ways.' "'Indeed. Since when have you noticed it?' "'Since when? What do you mean? "'Please change your dressing gown and slippers.' This is the first time you have found me in them, and you said for some time, isn't that funny? Don't you think it is? You are laughing at me? What's the matter with you? You've been strange for some time. For some time? There you are at it again. Why do you say for some time? Is it because lies have got to be told? Why should it be necessary to tell lies? Are you accusing me of telling lies? Oh, no, I'm only teasing you. Do you think I can't see that you are tired of me? Do you think I didn't see last night how attentive you were to that stupid Jenny? You hadn't a word for me. Do you mean to say you're jealous? Jealous? No, my dear, not in the least. If you prefer her to me, well and good. I don't care a toss. Really? 
You're not jealous. Under ordinary circumstances this would be an unpleasant fact. Under ordinary circumstances? What do you mean by that? I mean, quite plainly, that I'm tired of you, as you just suggested. It's a lie. You're not. The wings of her nose trembled. She showed her teeth and stabbed him with the needles. Let's talk of something else, he said. What do you think of Renhelm? I like him very much. He's a dear boy. He's fallen in love with you. Nonsense. And the worst of it is he wants to marry you. Please spare me these inanities. But as he's not twenty, he's going to wait until he's worthy of you, so he said. The little idiot. By worthy he means when he's made a name as an actor, and he can't succeed in that until he's allowed to play parts. Can't you manage it for him? Agnes blushed threw herself back on the sofa cushions and exhibited a pair of elegant boots with gold tassels. I? I can't manage it for myself. You're making fun of me. Yes, I am. You're a friend, Gustav. You really are. Perhaps I am, perhaps I'm not. It's difficult to say, but as a sensible girl... Oh, shut up! She took up a keen-edged paper knife and threatened him in fun, but it looked very much as if she were in earnest. You are very beautiful today, Agnes, said Philander. Today? Why today? Has it never struck you before? Of course it has. Why are you sighing? Too much drink last night. Let me look at you. What's the matter with your eyes? No sleep last night, my dear. I'll go. Then you can take a nap. Don't go. I can't sleep anyhow. I must be off. I really only came to tell you that. Her voice softened. Her eyelids dropped slowly, like the curtain after a death scene. "'It was kind of you to come and tell me that it's all over,' said Philander. She rose and pinned on her hat before the glass. "'Have you any scent?' she asked. "'Not here, at the theatre. "'You should stop smoking a pipe. "'The smell hangs about one's clothes. "'I will.' She stooped and fastened her garter. "'I beg your pardon,' she said, looking at Philander pleadingly. "'What for?' he asked absentmindedly. As she made no reply, he took courage and drew a deep breath. "'Where are you going?' he said. "'To be fitted for a dress. You needn't be afraid,' she replied innocently, as she thought. Philander could easily tell that it was an excuse. "'Good-bye, then,' he said. She went to him to be kissed. He took her in his arms and pressed her against him as if he wanted to crush her. Then he kissed her on the forehead, led her to the door, pushed her outside, and said briefly, "'Good-bye!' End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of The Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 in the White Mountains. One afternoon in August, Falk was again sitting in the garden on Moses Height, but he was alone, and he had been alone during the whole summer. He was turning over in his mind all that had happened to him during the three months which had passed since his last visit, when his heart was brimful of hope, courage, and strength. He felt old, tired, indifferent. He had seen the houses at his feet from the inside and on every occasion his expectations had been disappointed. He had seen humanity under many aspects, aspects which are only revealed to the eye of the poor man's doctor or the journalist, with the only difference that the journalist generally sees men as they wish to appear, and the doctor as they are. He had every opportunity of studying man as a social animal in all possible guises. He had been present at parliamentary meetings, church councils, general meetings of shareholders, philanthropic meetings, police court proceedings, festivals, funerals, public meetings of working men. Everywhere he had heard big words and many words, words never used in daily intercourse, a particular species of words which mean nothing, at least not what they ought to mean. This had given him a one-sided conception of humanity. He could see in man nothing but the deceitful social animal a creature he is bound to be because civilization forbids open war. His aloofness blinded him to the existence of another animal, an animal which, between glass and wall, 
is exceedingly amiable as long as it is not exasperated and which is ready to come out with all its failings and weaknesses when there are no witnesses he was blind to it and that was the reason why he had become embittered but the worst of it all was he had lost his self-respect and that had happened without his having committed a single action of which he need have been ashamed he had been robbed of it by his fellow creatures and it had not been a very difficult thing to do he had been slighted everywhere and how could he whose self-confidence had been destroyed in his early youth respect the person whom everybody despised with many a bitter pang he saw that the conservative journalists that was to say men who defended and upheld everything that was wrong or if they could not defend it or at least left it untouched were treated with the utmost courtesy he was despised not so much as a pressman as in his character of advocate of all those who were downtrodden and hardly dealt with he had lived through times of cruel doubt for instance in reporting the general meeting of shareholders of the marine insurance society triton he had used the word swindle in replying to his report the gray bonnet had published a long article proving so clearly that the society was a national patriotic philanthropic institution that he had almost felt convinced of having been wrong and the thought of having recklessly played with the reputation of his fellow citizens was a nightmare to him for many days to come he was now in a state of mind which alternated between fanaticism and callousness his next impulse would decide the direction his development was to take his life had been so dreary during the summer that he welcomed with malicious pleasure every rainy day and it was a comparatively pleasant sensation to watch leaves rustling along the garden paths he sat absorbed in grimly humorous meditations on life and its purposes when one lean bony hand was laid on his shoulder and another clutched his arm he felt as if death had come to take him at his word he looked up and started before him stood yigberg pale as a corpse emaciated and looking at him with those peculiarly washed out eyes which only starvation produces good morning falk he whispered almost inaudibly and his whole body seemed to rattle good morning yigberg replied falk suddenly brightening up sit down and have a cup of coffee with me how are you you look as if you've been lying under the ice oh i've been so ill so ill you seem to have had as jolly a summer as i had have you had a hard time too asked yigberg a faint hope that it had been the case brightening his yellow face i can only say thank god that the cursed summer is over it might be winter all year round for all i care not only that one is suffering all the time but one also has to watch others enjoying themselves i never put a foot out of town did you i haven't seen a pine tree since lundell left lillian's in june and why should one want to see pine trees it isn't absolutely essential nor is a pine tree anything extraordinary but that one can't have the pleasure that's where the sting comes in oh well never mind it's clouding over in the east therefore it will rain tomorrow and when the sun shines again it will be autumn your health yigberg looked at the punch as if it were poison but he drank it nevertheless but you wrote that beautiful story of the guardian angel or the marine insurance society triton for smith remarked falk didn't it go against your convictions convictions i have no convictions haven't you no only fools have convictions have you no morals yigberg no whenever a fool has an idea it comes to the same thing whether it is original or not he calls it his conviction clings to it and boasts of it not because it is a conviction but because it is his conviction so far as the marine insurance society is concerned i believe it's a swindle i'm sure it injures many men the shareholders at all events but it's a splendid thing for others the directors and employees for instance so it does a fair amount of good after all have you lost all sense of honor old friend one must sacrifice everything on the altar of duty i admit that the first and foremost duty of man is to live 
to live at any price. Divine as well as human law demands it. One must never sacrifice honor. Both laws, as I said, demand a sacrifice of everything. They compel a poor man to sacrifice his so-called honor. It's cruel, but you can't blame the poor man for it. Your theory of life is anything but cheerful. How could it be otherwise? That's true. But to talk of something else, I had a letter from Renhelm. I'll read it to you if you like. I heard he had gone on the stage. Yes, and he doesn't seem to be having a good time of it. Yigberg took a letter from his breast pocket, put a piece of sugar into his mouth, and began to read. If there is a hell in a life after this, which is very doubtful, the lads become a free thinker. It cannot be a worse place than this. I've been engaged for two months, but it seems to me like two years. A devil, formerly a wheelwright, now theatrical manager, holds my fate in his hand and treats me in such a way that three times a day I feel tempted to run away. But he has so carefully drafted the penal clauses in the agreement that my flight would dishonor my parents' name. I have walked on every single night, but I've never been allowed to open my lips yet. For twenty consecutive evenings I've had to smear my face with umber and wear a gypsy's costume, not a single piece of which fits me. The tights are too long, the shoes too large, the jacket is too short. An underdevil, called the prompter, takes good care that I don't exchange my costume for one more suitable, and, whenever I try to hide myself behind the crowd, which is made up of the director manufacturer's factory hands, it opens and pushes me forward to the footlights. If I look into the wings, my eyes fall on the underdevil, standing there, grinning, and if I look at the house, I see Satan himself, sitting in a box, laughing. I seem to have been engaged for his amusement, not for the purpose of playing any parts. On one occasion I ventured to draw his attention to the fact that I ought to have practice in speaking parts, if I was ever going to be an actor. He lost his temper, and said that one must learn to crawl before one can learn to walk. I replied that I could walk. He said it was a lie, and asked me whether I imagined that the art of acting, the most beautiful and difficult of all arts, required no training. When I said that that was exactly what I did imagine, and that I was impatiently waiting for the beginning of my training, he told me I was an ignorant puppy, and he would kick me out. When I remonstrated, he asked me whether I looked upon the stage as a refuge for impecunious use. My reply was a frank, unconditional glad yes he roared that he would kill me this is the present state of my affairs i feel that my soul is flickering out like a towel candle in a drought and i shall soon believe that evil will be victorious even though it be concealed in clouds as the catechism has it but the worst of all is that i have lost all respect for this art which was the dream and the love of my boyhood can I help it when I see that men and women without education or culture, spurred on by vanity and recklessness, completely lacking in enthusiasm and intelligence, are able to play in a few months' time character parts, historical parts, fairly well, without having a glimmer of knowledge of the time in which they move or the important part which the person they represent played in history? It is a slow murder, and the association with this mob which keeps me down some of the members of the company have come into collision with various paragraphs of the penal code, is making of me what I've never been, an aristocrat. The pressure of the cultured can never weigh as heavily on the uncultured. There is but one ray of light in this darkness. I am in love. She is pure as gold among all this dross. Of course she too is persecuted and slowly murdered, just as I am, since she refused the stage manager's infamous proposals. She is the only woman with a living spirit among all these beasts, wallowing in filth, and she loves me with all her soul. We are secretly engaged. I am only waiting for the day when I shall have one success to make her my wife. But when will that be? We have often thought of dying together, but hope, treacherous hope, has always beguiled us into continuing this misery. To see my innocent love burning with shame when she is forced to wear improper costumes is more than I can bear. But I will drop this unpleasant subject. Ollie and Lundell wish to be remembered. Ollie is very much changed. He has drifted into a new kind of philosophy, 
which tears down everything and turns all things upside down. It sounds very jolly and sometimes seems true, but it must be a dangerous doctrine if carried out. I believe he owes these ideas to one of the actors here, an intelligent and well-informed man who lives a very immoral life. I like and hate him at the same time. He is a queer chap, fundamentally good, noble, and generous, a man who will sacrifice himself for his friends. I cannot fix on any special vice, but he is immoral, and a man without morality is a blackguard, don't you think so? I must stop, my angel, my good spirit, is coming. There is a happy hour in store for me. All evil spirits will flee, and I shall be a better man. Remember me to Falk, and tell him to think of me when life is hard on him. Your friend, R. Well, what do you think of that? It is the old story of the struggle of the wild beast. I'll tell you what, Yigberg, I believe one has to be very unscrupulous if one wants to get on in the world. Try it. You may not find it so easy. Are you still doing business with Smith? No, unfortunately not. And you? I've seen him on the subject of my poems. He has bought them ten crowns to folio, and he can now murder me in the same way as the wheelwright is murdering Renhelm. And I'm afraid something of the sort is going to happen, for I haven't heard a word about them. He was so exceedingly friendly that I expect the worst. If only I knew what's going on. But what's the matter with you? You're as white as a sheet. The truth is, replied Yigberg, clutching the railings, all I've had to eat these last two days has been five lumps of sugar. I'm afraid I'm going to faint. If food will set you right, I can help you. Fortunately, I have some money. Of course it will set me right, whispered Yigberg faintly. But it was not so. When they were sitting in the dining room and food was served to them, Yigberg grew worse, and Falk had to take him to his room, which fortunately was not very far off. The house was an old, one-story house built of wood. It had climbed onto a rock and looked as if it had suffered from hip disease. It was spotted like a leper. A long time ago it was going to be painted, but when the old paint had been burned off, nothing more was done to it. It looked in every respect miserable, and it was hard to believe the legend of the sign of the fire insurance office rusting on the wall, namely, that a phoenix should rise from the ashes. At the base of the house grew dandelions, nettles, and roadweed, the faithful companions of poverty. Sparrows were bathing in the scorching sand and scattering it about. Pale-faced children with big stomachs, looking as if they were being brought up on 90% water, were making dandelion chains and trying to embitter their sad lives by annoying and insulting each other. Falk and Yigberg climbed a rotten, creaking staircase and came to a large room. It was divided into three parts by chalk lines. The first and second divisions served a joiner and a cobbler as workshops. The third was exclusively devoted to the more intimate pursuits of family life. Whenever the children screamed, which happened once in every quarter of an hour, the joiner flew into a rage and burst out scolding and swearing. The cobbler remonstrated with quotations from the Bible. The joiner's nerves were so shattered by these constant screams, the uneasing punishments and scoldings, that five minutes after partaking of the snuff of reconciliation offered by the cobbler, he flew into a fresh temper in spite of his firm resolve to be patient. Consequently, he was nearly all day long in a red-hot fury. But the worst passages were when he asked the woman, Why these internal females need to bring so many children into the world? Then the woman in question came on the tapis, and his antagonist gave him as good as he brought. Falk and Yigberg had to pass this room to gain the latter's garret, and although both of them went on tiptoe, they wakened two of the children. Immediately the mother began humming a lullaby, thereby interrupting a discussion between cobbler and joiner. Naturally, the latter had a fit. Hold your tongue, woman. Hold your tongue yourself. Can't you let the children sleep? To hell with the children. Are they my children? Am I to suffer for other people's immorality? Am I an immoral man? What? Have I any children? Hold your tongue, I say, or I'll throw my plane at your head. I say, master, master, began the cobbler. You shouldn't talk like that of the children. God sends the little ones into the world. 
That's a lie, cobbler. The devil sends them. The devil. And then the dissolute parents blame God. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. Master, master, you shouldn't use such language. Scripture tells us that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the children. Oh, indeed. They have them in the kingdom of heaven, have they? How dare you talk like that, shrilled the furious mother. If you ever have any children of your own, I shall pray that they may be lame and diseased. I shall pray that they shall be blind and deaf and dumb. I shall pray that they shall be sent to the reformatory and end on the gallows. See if I won't. Do so for all I care, you good-for-nothing hussy. I'm not going to bring children in the world to see them living a dog's life. You ought to be sent to the house of correction for bringing the poor things into this misery. You are married, you say? Well, need you be immoral because you are married? Master, master, God sends the children. It's a lie, cobbler. I read in a paper the other day that the damn potato is to blame for the large families of the poor. Don't you see? The potato consists of two substances, called oxygen and nitrogen. Whenever these substances occur in a certain quantity and proportion, women become prolific. But what is one to do? asked the angry mother, whom this interesting explanation had calmed down a little. One should eat potatoes. Can't you see that? But what is one to eat if not potatoes? Beefsteak, woman. Steak and onions. What? Isn't that good? Or steak a la Chateaubriand? Do you know what that is? What? I saw in the fatherland the other day that a woman who had taken womb grain very nearly died as well as the baby. What's that? asked the mother, pricking up her ears. You'd like to know, would you? Is it true that what you said about the womb grain? asked the cobbler, blinking his eyes. Ho, ho! That brings up your lungs and liver, but there's a heavy penalty on it, and that's as it should be. Is it as it should be? asked the cobbler dully. Of course it is. Immorality must be punished, and it's immoral to murder one's children. Children? Surely there's a difference, replied the angry mother resignedly. But where does the stuff you just spoke about come from, master? Ha, ha. You want more children, you hussy, although you are a widow with five? Beware of the devil of a cobbler. He's hard on women, in spite of his piety. A pinch of snuff, cobbler? There is really a herb, then? Who said it was a herb? Did I say so? No, it's an organic substance. Let me tell you, all substances, nature contains about 60, are divided into organic and inorganic substances. This one's Latin name is Cornuticus Sicalius. It comes from abroad, for instance, from the Calabrian Peninsula. Is it very expensive, master? asked the cobbler. Expensive? ejaculated the joiner, manipulating his plane as if it were a carbine. It's awfully expensive. Falk had listened to the conversation with great interest. Now he started. He had heard a carriage stopping underneath the window, and the sound of two women's voices which seemed familiar to him. This house looks all right. Does it? said an older voice. I think it looks dreadful. I meant it looks all right for our purpose. Do you know, driver, whether any poor people are living in this house? I don't know, replied the driver, but I'd stake my oath on it. Swearing is a sin, so you had better not. Wait for us here while we go upstairs to do our duty. I say, Eugenia, hadn't we better first talk a little to the children down here? said Mrs. Holman to Mrs. Falk lagging behind. Perhaps it would be just as well. Come here, little boy. What's your name? Albert, answered a pale-faced little lad of six. Do you know Jesus, my laddie? No, answered the child with a laugh and put a finger into his mouth. Terrible, said Mrs. Falk, taking out her notebook. I better say, parish of St. Catharines, white mountains, profound spiritual darkness in the minds of the young. I suppose darkness is the right word. She turned to the little fellow. And don't you want to know him? No. Would you like a penny? Yes. You should say please. Indescribably neglected. But I succeeded by gentleness in awakening their better feelings. What a horrible smell. Let's go, Eugenia, implored Mrs. Homan. They went upstairs and entered the large room without knocking. The joiner seized his plane and began planing a knotty board, so that the ladies had to shout to make themselves heard. Is anybody here thirsting for salvation? shouted Mrs. Homan, while Mrs. Falk worked her scent spray so vigorously that the children began to cry with the smarting of their eyes. Are you offering us salvation, lady? 
asked the joiner, interrupting his work. Where did you get it from? Perhaps there is charity to be had, too, and humiliation and pride? You are a ruffian. You will be damned, answered Mrs. Holman. Mrs. Falk made notes in her notebook. He's all right, she remarked. Is there anything else you'd like to say? asked Mrs. Holman. We know the sort you are. Perhaps you'd like to talk to me about religion, ladies. I can talk on any subject. Have you ever heard of anything about the councils held at Nicaea, or the Smalkotic Articles? We know nothing about that, my good man. Why do you call me good? Scripture says nobody is good but God alone. So you know nothing about the Nicene Council, ladies? How can you dare to teach others when you know nothing yourselves? And if you want to dispense charity, do it while I turn my back to you, for true charity is given secretly. Practice on the children, if you like. They can't defend themselves, but leave us in peace. Give us work and pay us a just wage, and then you needn't run about like this. A pinch of snuff, cobbler. Shall I write great unbelief, quite hardened, Evelyn? Asked Mrs. Falk. I should put impenitent, dear. What are you writing down, ladies? Our sins? Surely your book's too small for that. The outcome of the so-called working men's unions. Very good, said Mrs. Holman. Beware of working men's unions, said the joiner. For hundreds of years, war has been made upon the kings. But now we've discovered that the kings are not to blame. The next campaign will be against all idlers who live on the work of others. Then we shall see something. That's enough, said the cobbler. The angry mother, whose eyes had been riveted on Mrs. Falk during the whole scene, took the opportunity of putting in a word. Excuse me, but aren't you Mrs. Falk? she asked. No, answered the lady with an assurance that took even Mrs. Holman's breath away. But you're as like her as it's possible to be. I knew her father, Roanoke, who's now on the flagship. That's all very nice, but it doesn't concern us. Are there any other people in this house who need salvation? No, said the joiner. They don't need salvation. They need food and clothes. Or better still, work, much work and well-paid work. But the ladies had better not go and see them, for one of them is down with smallpox. Smallpox, screamed Mrs. Homan, and nobody said a word about it? Come along, Eugenia. Let's at once inform the police. What a disgusting set of people they are. But the children, whose children are these? Answer, said Mrs. Falk, holding up her pencil threateningly. They're mine, lady, answered the mother. But your husband, where's your husband? Disappeared, said the joiner. We'll set the police on his track. He shall be sent to the penitentiary. Things must be changed here. I said it was a good house, Evelyn. Won't the lady sit down? Asked the joiner. It's so much easier to keep up a conversation sitting down. We've no chairs, but that doesn't matter. We've no beds either. They went for taxes, for the lighting of the street, so that you need not go home from the theater in the dark. We've no gas, as you can see for yourselves. They went in payment of the water rate, so that your servants should be safe running up and down stairs. The water's not laid on here. They went towards the keeping up of the hospitals, so that your sons will not be laid up at home when... Come away, Eugenia, for God's sakes. This is unbearable. I agree with you, ladies. It is unbearable, said the joiner. And a day will come when things will be worse. On that day we shall come down from the White Mountains with a great noise like a waterfall and ask for the return of our beds. Ask? We shall take them. And you shall lie on wooden benches, as I've had to do, and eat potatoes until your stomachs are as tight as a drum, and you feel as if you had undergone the torture by water as we. But the ladies had fled leaving behind them a pile of pamphlets. Ugh! What a beastly smell of eau de cologne! It smells of prostitutes, said the joiner. A pinch of snuff, cobbler! He wiped his forehead with his blue apron and took up his plane while the others reflected silently. Yigberg, who had been asleep during the whole of the scene, now awoke and made ready to go out again with Falk. Once more, Mrs. Holman's voice floated through the open window. What did she mean when she said your father was on the flagship? Your father's a captain, isn't he? That's what he's called. It's the same thing. Weren't they an insolent crowd? I'll never go there again, but it will make a fine report. To the restaurant, Hasselback and Driver. End of chapter 16《ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・ハッピー・
Recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Natura. Philander was at home studying a part one afternoon when he was disturbed by a gentle tapping, two double raps at his door. He jumped up, hastily donned the coat, and opened. Agnes, this is a rare visit. I had to come and see you. It's so damn slow. What dreadful language. Let me curse. It relieves my feelings. Hmm, hmm. Give me a cigar. I haven't had a smoke these last six weeks. This education makes me frantic. Is he so severe? Curse him. For shame, Agnes. I've been forbidden to smoke, to curse, to drink punch, to go out in the evening. But wait until we are married. I'll let him see. Is he really serious about it? Absolutely. Look at this handkerchief. A. R. With a crown and nine balls. Our initials are the same. And he's making me use his design. Isn't it lovely? Yes, very nice. It's gone as far as that, has it? The angel, dressed in blue, threw herself on the sofa and puffed at her cigar. Philander looked at her body as if he were making an estimate and said, Will you have a glass of punch? Rather. Are you in love with your fiance? He doesn't belong to the class of men with whom one can really be in love. But I don't know. Love? What is love? Yes, what is it? Oh, you know what I mean. He's very respectable, awfully respectable, but, but, but. But? He's so proper. She looked at Philander with a smile, which would have saved the absent fiance, if he could have seen it. He isn't demonstrative enough? Asked Philander curiously in an unsteady voice. She drank her glass of punch, paused, shook her head, and said with a theatrical sigh, No. The reply seemed to satisfy Philander. It obviously relieved him. He continued his cross-examination. It may be a long time before you can get married. He's never played a single part yet. No, I know. Won't you find the waiting dull? One must be patient. I must use the thumbscrew, thought Philander. I suppose you know that Jenny and I are lovers. The ugly old hag? A whole shower of white northern lights flamed across her face, and every muscle twitched, as if she were under the influence of a galvanic battery. She isn't as old as all that, said Philander coldly. Have you heard that the waiter Gustav is going to play Don Diego in the new piece, and that Renhelm has been given the part of his servant? The waiter is bound to have a success, for the part plays itself, but poor Renhelm will die with shame. Good heavens, is it true? It's true enough. It shan't happen. Who's to prevent it? She jumped up from the sofa, emptied her glass, and began to sob wildly. Oh, how bitter the world is! How bitter! She sobbed. It's just as if an evil power were spying on us, finding out our wishes, merely to cross them, discerning our hopes so as to shatter them, anticipating our thoughts so as to paralyze them. If it were possible to long for evil to happen to oneself, one ought to do it just for the sake of making a fool of that power. Quite true, my dear. Therefore, one should always be prepared for a bad ending. But that's not the worst. I'll give you a thought which will comfort you. You know that every success you obtain entails someone else's failure. If you are given a part to play, some other woman is disappointed. It makes her writhe like a worm trodden underfoot, and without knowing it, you have committed a wrong. Therefore, even happiness is poison. Be comforted in misfortune by the thought that every piece of ill luck which falls to your share is equivalent to a good action, even though it be a good action committed without your knowing it. And the thought of a good action is the only pure enjoyment which is given to us mortals. I don't want to do any good actions. I don't want to do any pure joys. I have the same right to success as everybody else, and I will be successful. At any price? I won't play your mistress's maid at any price. You're jealous. Learn to bear failure gracefully. That's greater and much more interesting. Tell me one thing. Is she in love with you? I'm afraid she loves me only too well. And you? I? I shall never love any woman but you. He seized her hand. She jumped up from the sofa, showing her stockings. Do you believe in what is called love? She asked, gazing at him with distended pupils. I believe there are several kinds of love. She crossed the room towards the door. Do you love me wholly and entirely? She put her hand on the door handle. He pondered for two seconds. Then he replied, Your soul is evil, and I don't love evil. 
I don't care a fig for my soul. Do you love me? Me? Yes. So deeply. Why did you send me, Renhelm? Because I wanted to find out what life without you would be like. Did you lie when you said you were tired of me? Yes, I lied. Oh, you old devil! She took the key out of the lock, and he drew down the blind. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen, Nihilism. As Falk was walking home one rainy September evening and turning into Count Magni Street, he saw to his amazement that his windows were lit up. When he was near enough to be able to cast a glance into his room from below, he noticed on the ceiling the shadow of a man which seemed familiar. Although he could not place it, it was a despondent-looking shadow, and the nearer he came, the more despondent it looked. On entering his room, he saw Struve sitting at his writing-table with his head on his hands. His clothes were soaked with rain and clung heavily to his body. There were little puddles on the floor which slowly drained off through the chinks. His hair hung in damp strands from his head, and his usually English whiskers fell like stalacites on his damp coat collar. He had placed his black hat beside him on the table. It had collapsed under its own weight, and the wide crepe band which it was wearing suggested that it was mourning for its lost youth. "'Good evening,' said Falk. "'This is an unexpected honor. "'Don't jeer at me,' begged Struve. "'And why not? "'I see no reason why I should spare you.' I see. You're done? Yes. I shall turn conservative, too, before long. You're in mourning, I see. I hope I may congratulate you. I've lost a little son. Then I'll congratulate him. But what do you want here? You know I despise you. I expect you do yourself, don't you? Of course I do. But isn't life bitter enough without our unnecessarily embittering it still further? If God or Providence is amused at it, need it follow that man should equally degrade himself? That sounds reasonable. And does your honor? Won't you put on my dressing gown while you are drying your clothes? You must be cold. Thank you, but I mustn't stay. Oh, stay a little while. It will give us a chance of having things out. I don't like talking about my misfortunes. Then talk about your crimes. I haven't committed any. Oh, yes, you have. You have committed great crimes. You have put your heavy hand on the oppressed. You have kicked the wounded. You have sneered at the wretched. Do you remember the last strike when you were on the side of power? The side of law, brother. Ha! The law? Who has dictated the law which governs the life of the poor man, you fool? The rich man? That is to say, the master made the law for the slave? The law was dictated by the whole nation and a universal sense of right. God gave the law. Save your big words when you talk to me. Who wrote the law of 1734? Mr. Cronstedt. Who is responsible for the law of corporal punishment? Colonel Sableman. It was his bill and his friends who formed the majority at that time, pushed it through. Colonel Sableman is not the nation, and his friends are not the universal sense of right. Who is responsible for the law concerning joint stock companies? Judge Svindelgren. Who is responsible for the new parliamentary laws? Assessor Valonius. Who has written the law of legal protection? That is to say, the protection of the rich from the just claims of the poor. Wholesale merchant grocer. Don't talk to me. I know your claptrap. Who has written the new law of succession? Criminals. The forest laws? Thieves. The law relating to bills of private banks? Swindlers. And you maintain that God has done it? Poor God. May I give you a piece of advice, but with my own experience, advice which will be useful to you all your life? If you want to escape self-immolation, a fate which in your fanaticism you are fast approaching, change your point of view as soon as possible. Take a bird's-eye view of the world, and you will see how small and insignificant everything is. Start with the conviction that the whole world is a rubbish heap, that men are the refuge, no better than eggshells, carrot stalks, cabbage leaves, rags. Then nothing will take you by surprise. You will never lose an illusion. But, on the contrary, you will be filled with a great joy whenever 
you come across a fine thought, a good action. Try to acquire a calm contempt of the world. You needn't be afraid of growing callous. I have not yet attained to that point of view, it's true, but I have a contempt for the world. But that is my misfortune, for directly I hear of a single act of generosity or kindness, I love humanity again, and overrate my fellow men, only to be deceived afresh. Be more selfish. Let the devil take your fellow men. I'm afraid I can't. Try another profession. Join your brother. He seems to get on in this world. I saw him yesterday at the church council of the parish of St. Nicholas. At the church council? Yes. The man has a future. The pastor primarius nodded to him. He'll soon be an alderman, like all landed proprietors. What about the Triton? They work with debentures now, but your brother hasn't lost anything by it, even though he hasn't made anything. No, he's other fish to fry. Don't let us talk of that man. But he's your brother. That isn't his merit. But now tell me what you want. My boy's funeral is tomorrow and I have no dress coat. I'll lend you mine. Thank you, brother. You're extricating me from an awkward position. That was one thing, but there is something else of a rather more delicate nature. Why come to me, your enemy, with your delicate confidences? I'm surprised. Because you are a man of heart. Don't build on that any longer, but go on. How irritable you've grown. You're not the same, man. You used to be so gentle. We discussed that before. Speak up. I want to ask you whether you would come with me to the churchyard. I? Why don't you ask one of your colleagues from the gray bonnet? There are reasons. I don't see why I shouldn't tell you. I'm not married. Not married? You? The defender of religion and morality have broken the sacred bonds? Poverty, the force of circumstances. But I'm just as happy as if I were married. I love my wife, and she loves me, and that's all. But there's another reason. The child has not been baptized. It was three weeks old when it died, and therefore no clergyman will bury it. I don't dare to tell this to my wife, because she would fret. I've told her the clergyman would meet us in the churchyard. I'm telling you this to prevent a possible scene. She, of course, will remain at home. You only meet two other fellows. One of them, Levi, is a younger brother of the director of the Triton, and one of the employees of that society. He's a decent sort, with an unusually good head and a still better heart. Don't laugh. I can see that you think I borrow money from him, and so I have. He's a man you'll like. The other one is my old friend, Dr. Borg, who treated the little one. He's a very broad-minded, a man without any prejudices. You'll get on with him. I can count on you, can I? There'll be four of us in the coach, and the little coffin, of course. Very well, I'll come. There's one more thing. My wife has religious scruples and is afraid that the little one won't go to heaven because he died without baptism. She asks everybody's opinion on the subject so as to ease her mind. But what about the Augsburg Confession? It's not a question of confessions. But in writing to your paper, you always uphold the official faith. The paper is the affair of the syndicate. If it likes to cling to Christianity, it may do so for I care. My work for the syndicate is a matter of part. Please agree with my wife if she tells you that she believes that her child will go to heaven. I don't mind denying the faith in order to make a human heart happy, particularly as I don't hold it. But you haven't told me yet where you live. Do you know where the White Mountains are? Yes. Are you living in the spotted house in the mountain rock? Do you know it? I've been there once. Then perhaps you know Yigberg, the socialist, who leads the people astray. I am the landlord's deputy. Smith owns the property. I live rent-free on condition that I collect the rents. Whenever the rents are not forthcoming, the people talk nonsense which he has put into their heads about capital and labor, and other things which fill the columns of the socialistic press. Fogg did not reply. Do you know Yigberg? Yes, I do. But won't you try on my dress coat now? Struve tried it on, put his own damp coat over it, buttoned it up to the chin, lit the chewed-up end of his cigar, impaled on a match, and went. Falk lighted him downstairs. You've a long way to go, he said, merely to say something. The Lord knows it, and I have no umbrella. And no overcoat. Would you like my winter coat? Many thanks. It's very kind of you. You can return it to me by and by. He went back to his room, fetched the overcoat, and gave it to Struve, who was waiting in the entrance hall. After a brief good night, they parted. 
Falk found the atmosphere in his room stifling. He opened the window. The rain was coming down in torrents, splashing on the tiles and running down into the dirty street. Tattoos sounded in the barracks opposite. Vespers were being sung in the lodgement. Fragments of the verses floated through the open window. Falk felt lonely and tired. He had been longing to fight a battle with a representative of all he regarded as inimical to progress. But the enemy, after having to some extent beaten him, had fled. He tried to understand clearly what the quarrel was about, but failed in his effort. He was unable to say who was right. He asked himself whether the cause he served, namely the cause of the oppressed, had any existence. But at the next moment he reproached himself with cowardice, and the steady fanaticism which glowed in him burst into fresh flames. He condemned the weakness which again and again had induced him to yield. Just now he had held the enemy in his hand, and not only had he not shown him his profound repugnance, but he had even treated him with kindness and sympathy. What would he think of him? There was no merit in this good nature, as it prevented him from coming to a firm decision. It was nothing but moral laxity, making him incapable of taking up a fight which seemed more and more beyond him. He realized he must extinguish the fire under the boilers, which would not be able to stand the pressure as no steam was being used. He pondered over Strew's advice and brooded until his mind was chaos in which truth and lies, right and wrong, danced together in complete harmony. His brain, in which, owing to his academic training, all conceptions had been so neatly pigeonholed, would soon resemble a pack of well-shuffled cards. He succeeded beyond expectation in working himself into a state of complete indifference. He looked for fine motives in the actions of his enemies, and gradually it appeared to him that he had all along been in the wrong. He felt reconciled to the existing order of things, and ultimately came to the fine conclusion that it was quite immaterial whether the whole was black or white. Whatever was, had to be. He was not entitled to criticize it. He found this mood pleasant. It gave him a feeling of restfulness to which he had been a stranger all those years during which he had made the troubles of humanity his own. He was enjoying this calm and a pipe of strong tobacco when a maidservant brought him a letter just delivered by the postman. It was from Maui Montanus and very long. Parts of it seemed to impress Falk greatly. My dear fellow, it ran, although Lundell and I have now finished our work and will soon be back in Stockholm, I yet feel the need of writing down my impressions because they have been of great importance to myself and my spiritual development. I have come to a conclusion, and I am as full of amazement as a chicken which has just been hatched and stares at the world with its newly opened eyes, trampling on the eggshell which had shut out the light for so long. The conclusion, of course, is not a new one. Plato propounded it before Christianity was. The world, the visible world, is but a delusion, the reflection of the ideas. That is to say, reality is something low, insignificant, secondary, and accidental. Yes, but I will proceed synthetically, begin with the particular, and pass on from it to the general. I will speak of my work first, in which both government and parliament have been interested. On the altar of the church at Trascola, two wooden figures used to stand. One of them was broken, but the other one was whole. The whole one, the figure of a woman, held a cross in her hand. Two sacks of fragments of the broken one were preserved in the sacristy. A learned archaeologist had examined the contents of the two sacks in order to determine the appearance of the broken figure, but the result had been mere conjecture. But he had been very thorough. He had taken a specimen of the white paint with which the figure had been grounded and sent it to the Pharmaceutical Institute. The latter had reported that it contained lead and not zinc. Therefore, the figure must date from before 1844, because zinc white did not come into use until after that date. What can one say to such a conclusion, seeing that the figure might have been painted over? Next, he sent a sample of the wood to the Stockholm Timber Office. He was informed that it was birch. The figure was therefore made of birch wood and dated from before 1844. But that was not all he was striving for. He had a reason, in plain words, he wished for his own aggrandizement, that the carved figures should be proved to date from the 16th century, and he would have preferred that they should be the work of the great, of course great, because his name had been so deeply carved in oak that it had been preserved to our time. Bouchard von Schiedenhan, who had carved the seats in the choir of the Cathedral of Festeros, 
The learned research was carried on. The professor stole a little plaster from the figures in Festeros and sent it, together with a specimen from the sacristy of Trascola, to the École Polytechnique. I can't spell it. The reply completely crushed the scoffers. The analysis proved that the two specimens of plaster were identical. Both contained 77% of chalk and 35 of sulfuric acid. Therefore, the figures must date from the same period. The age of the figures had now been settled. A sketch was made of the whole one and sent in. What a terrible passion these learned men have for sending things in to the academy. The only thing which remained to be done was to determine and reconstruct the broken one. For two whole years, the two sacks traveled up and down between Uppsala and Lund. The two professors differed and carried on a lively dispute. The professor of Lund, who had just been made director, took the figure as a subject of his inaugural address and crushed the professor of Uppsala. The latter replied in a brochure. Fortunately, at the very moment a professor of the Stockholm Academy of Art appeared with a totally new opinion. Then Herod and Pilate compromised, as is always the case, and attacked the man from the capital, rending him the unbridled fury of provincials. This was their compromise. The broken figure had represented unbelief, because the other one must have been meant for faith, whose symbol is the cross. The supposition, advanced by the professor of Lund, that the broken figure had been intended to represent hope, arrived that because one of the sacks contained an anchor, was rejected, because that would have postulated a third figure, love, of which there had been no trace, and for which there could have been no room. Moreover, it was proved, by specimens from the rich collection of arrowheads in the historical museum, that the fragment in question was not an anchor, but an arrowhead, which forms a part of the weapons belonging to the symbols of unbelief. The shape of the arrowhead, which resembled in every detail those from the period of the vice-regent Sturry, removed the last doubt as to the age of the figure. It was my task to make a statue of unbelief as a companion to the figure of faith in accordance with the directions of the professors. I was given my instructions, and I did not hesitate. I looked for a male model, for the figure was to be a man. I had to look for a long time, but I found him in the end. I really believe I met the personification of unbelief, and I succeeded brilliantly. And there he now stands, Philander, the actor, to the left of the altar, with the Mexican bow, using the drama Ferdinand Cortez, and a robber's cloak from Fra Diablo. But the people say that is unbelief, throwing down his arms before faith, and the deputy superintendent, who preached the inaugural sermon, spoke of the splendid gifts which God sometimes gives to man, and which in this case he had given to me. And the Count, who gave the inaugural dinner, declared that I had created a masterpiece, fit to stand side by side with the antiques. He's been in Italy, and a student who occupies some post in the Count's household, seized the opportunity to write and circulate some verses, in which he developed the conception of the sublimely beautiful, and gave a history of the myth of the devil. Up to now, I have, like a true egoist, spoken only of myself. What am I to say about Lundell's altarpiece? I will try to describe it to you. Christ, Renhelm, hangs on the cross in the background. To the left is the impenitent thief. I, and the rascal, has made me worse looking than I am. To the right, the repenting thief. Lundell himself, squinting with hypocritical eyes at Renhelm. At the foot of the cross, Mary Magdalene. You remember Marie? in a very low dress, and a Roman centurion, Philander, on horseback, stallion belonging to Alderman Olson. I cannot describe the awful impression made on me when, after the sermon, the picture was unveiled, and I saw all these well-known faces staring from the wall above the altar at the community, rapturously listening to the words of the preacher on the great importance of art, particularly art in the service of religion. As far as I am concerned, a veil has been lifted from many things. I will tell you by and by my thoughts on faith and unbelief. I'm going to embody my views of art and its high mission in an essay and read it at some public hall as soon as I am back in town. It goes without saying that Lundell's religious sense has tremendously developed during those dear days. He is, comparatively speaking, happy in his colossal self-deception and has no idea what a rascal he really is. I think I have told you everything now, anything else verbally when we meet. Until then, goodbye. I hope you are in good health and spirits. Your friend, Ollie Montanus. P.S. 
I must not forget to tell you the result of an antiquarian research. The end of it all was that an old Jan, an inmate of the almhouses, remembered having seen the figures when he was a child. He said there had been three, faith, hope, and love, and as love was the greatest of these, it had stood above the altar. In the first decade of this century, a flash of lightning had struck love and faith. The figures had been the work of his father, who was a carver of figureheads in the naval port Karlskrona. O. M. When Falk had read the letters, he sat down at his writing table, examined his lamp to see whether there was plenty of oil in it, lit his pipe, took a manuscript from his table drawer, and began to write. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the Red Room by August Strindberg, translated by Ellie Schlesner, recording by William Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen From Churchyard to Public House. The September afternoon lay gray and warm and still over the capital as Falk climbed the hills in the south. When he had arrived at the churchyard of St. Catherine's, he sat down to rest. He noticed with a feeling of genuine pleasure that the maples had turned color during the recent cold nights, and he welcomed autumn with its darkness, its gray clouds, and falling leaves. Not a breath stirred. It was as if nature were resting, tired after the work of the short summer. Everything was asleep. The dead were lying beneath the sod, calm and peaceful, as if they had never been alive. He wished that he had all men there, and that he himself was with them. The clock on the tower chimed the hour, and he rose and continued his walk. He went down Garden Street, turned into New Street, which looked as if it had been new a hundred years ago at least, crossed the New Market, and came to the White Mountains. He stood still before the spotted house, listening to the children's chatter, for as usual there were children playing about the street. They talked loudly and unreservedly, while they were busy polishing little pieces of brick, presently to be used in a game of hopscotch. "'What did you have for dinner, Jan?' "'That's my business.' "'Your business? Did you say it was your business? Mind what you're about, you'll get a hiding. Don't brag, you with your eyes. Who shoved you into the lake the other day? Oh, shut up.' Jane received a thrashing, and peace was restored. "'I say, you stole Cress in the churchyard the other day, didn't you, Jan?' That cripple Ollie split on me. And you were nabbed by the police, weren't you? Who cares for the police? I don't. Don't you? Come along with us tonight, then. We're going to pinch some pears. There's a savage dog behind the fence. Garn! Chimney sweeps Peter will climb over, and kick will do for the dog. The polishing was interrupted by a maidservant, who came out of the house and began to scatter pine branches on the grass-grown street. Who's going to be buried? The deputy's wife's baby. He's proper old Satan, the deputy, isn't he? Instead of replying, the other began whistling an unknown and very peculiar tune. Let's thrash his red-haired cubs when they come home from school. I say, doesn't his old woman fancy herself? The old she-devil locked us out in the snow the other night because we couldn't pay the rent, and we had to spend the night in the barn. The conversation flickered out. The last item of conversation had not made the smallest impression on Jan's friend. After this introduction to the status of the tenants by the two urchins, Falk entered the house, not with the pleasantest of sensations. He was received at the door by Struve, who looked distressed, and took Falk's arm as if he were going to confide a secret to him, or suppress a tear. He had to do something, so he embraced him. Falk found himself in a big room with a dining table, a sideboard, six chairs, and a coffin. White sheets were hanging before the windows, through which daylight filtered and broke at the red glow of the tallow candles. On the table stood a tray with green wine glasses and a soup tureen filled with delias, stocks, and white asters. Struve seized Falk's hand and led him to the coffin where the baby lay bedded on shavings, covered with tully and strewn with fuchsia. There, he said, there. Falk felt nothing but the quiet commonplace emotion the living always feel in the presence of the dead. He could think of nothing suitable to say, and therefore confined himself to pressing the father's hand. "'Thank you, thank you,' stammered Struve, 
and disappeared in an adjoining room. Falk was left alone. He could hear excited whispering behind the door through which Struve had vanished. Then it grew still for a while, but presently a murmur from the other end of the room penetrated the matchboard wall. A strident treble seemed to be reaching long verses with incredible volubility. Bee 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 boo bee 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 boo bee 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 ba boo boo. It sounded. An angry man's voice answered to the accompaniment of a plane, which said, "Witch you, witch you, witch, 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 itch," and a long drawn rumbling. Mm -hmm. Replied, seeming anxious to calm the storm, but the plane spat and sneezed against its witch, witch, and immediately after a storm of. Babble, 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 broke out with fresh fury. Falk guessed the subject under discussion, and a certain intonation gave him the idea that the dead baby was involved in the argument. The whispering, occasionally interrupted by loud sobs, began again behind the door through which Struve had disappeared. Finally, it was pushed open, and Struve appeared, leading by the hand a woman who looked like a laundress. She was dressed in black and her eyelids were red and swollen with weeping. Struve introduced her with all the dignity of a father of a family. My wife, Mr. Falk, my old friend. Falk clasped the hand, hard as a beetle, and received a vinegary smile. He cast about for a few platitudes containing the words wife and grief, and as he was fairly successful, he was rewarded by Struve with an embrace. Mrs. Struve, anxious not to be left out in the cold, began brushing the back of her husband's coat. "'It's dreadful how you seem to pick up every bit of dirt, Kristen,' she said. "'Your back's always dusty. Don't you think that my husband always looks like a pig, Mr. Falk?' There was no need for poor Falk to reply to this tender remark. Behind the mother's back now appeared two heads, regarding the visitor with a grin. The mother patted them affectionately. "'Have you ever seen plainer boys before, Mr. Falk?' she asked. "'Don't they look exactly like young foxes?' This statement was so undeniably accurate that Falk felt compelled to deny it eagerly. The opening of the hall door and the entrance of two men stopped all further civilities. The first of the newcomers was a man of thirty, broad-shouldered, with a square head, the front of which was supposed to represent the face. The skin looked like the half-rotten plank of a bridge in which worms have ploughed their labyrinths. The wide mouth, always slightly open, showed the four shining eye-teeth. Whenever he smiled, his face seemed to split into two parts, his mouth open as far back as the fourth back tooth. Not a single hair grew in the barren soil. The nose was so badly put on that one could see through it far into the head. On the upper part of the skull grew something which looked like coconut matting. Struve, who possessed the faculty of ennobling his environment, introduced Candidate Borg as Dr. Borg. The latter, without a sign of either pleasure or annoyance, held out his arm to his companion, who pulled off the coat and hung it on a hinge of the front door, an act which drew from Mrs. Struve the remark that the old house was in such bad repair that there was not even a hall stand. The man who had helped Borg off with his overcoat was introduced as Mr. Levi. He was a tall, overgrown youth. The skull seemed but a backward development of the nasal bone, and the trunk, which reached to the knees, looked as if it had been drawn through a wire plate, in the way in which wire is drawn. The shoulders slanted like eaves. There was no trace of hips. The shanks ran up into the thighs. The feet were worn out of shape like a pair of old shoes. The instep had given way. The legs curved outward and downward, like the legs of a working man who had carried heavy loads or stood for the greater part of his life. He was a pure slave type. The candidate had remained at the door. He had taken off his gloves put down his stick, blown his nose, and put back the handkerchief into his pocket without taking the least notice of Struve's repeated attempts to introduce him. He believed that he was still in the entrance hall, but now he took his hat, scraped the floor with his foot, and made a step into the room. "'Good morning, Jenny. How are you?' he said, seizing Mrs. Struve's hand with as much eagerness as if it were a matter of life and death. He bowed, hardly perceptibly, to Falk with the snarl of a dog who sees a strange dog in his yard. Young Mr. Levi followed at the heels of the candidate, responding to his smiles, applauding his sarcasms, and generally cowtailing to his superiority. Mrs. Struve opened a bottle of hock and filled the glasses. Struve raised his glass and welcomed his guests. The candidate opened his mouth, 
made a canal of his tongue, poured the contents of the glass on it, grinned as if it were physic, and swallowed it. "'It's awfully sour and nasty,' said Mrs. Struve. "'Would you prefer a glass of punch, Henrik?' "'Yes, it is very nasty,' agreed the candidate, and Levi eagerly seconded him. The punch was brought in. Borg's face brightened. He looked for a chair, and immediately Levi brought him one. The party sat down round the dining table. The strong scent of the stocks mingled with the smell of the wine. The candles were reflected in the glasses. The conversation became lively, and soon a column of smoke stood above the candidate's chair. Mrs. Struve glanced uneasily at the little sleeper near the window, but nobody saw her look. Presently a coach stopped in the street outside the house. Everybody rose except the candidate. Struve coughed, and in a low voice, as if he had something unpleasant to say, he whispered, "'Shall we get ready now?' Mrs. Struve went to the coffin and stooped over it, weeping bitterly. When in the drawing back, she saw her husband standing behind her with the coffin lid. She burst into loud sobs. "'There, there, compose yourself,' said Struve, hastening to screw down the lid as if he wanted to hide something. Borg, looking like a yawning horse, gulped down another glass of punch. Mr. Levi helped Struve to screw down the lid, displaying quite extraordinary skill. He seemed to be packing a bale of goods. The men shook hands with Mrs. Struve, put on their overcoats, and went. The woman warned them to be careful in going downstairs. The stairs were old and rotten. Struve marched in front, carrying the coffin. When he stepped into the street and became aware of the little crowd which had collected before the house, he felt flattered, and the devil of pride took possession of him. He scolded the driver who had admitted to open the door and let down the steps. To heighten the effect of his words, he spoke with contemptuous familiarity to the tall man in the livery, who, hat in hand, hastened to carry out his commands. From the center of the crowd, where the boy Jan was standing, came a short, scornful cough. But when the boy saw that he was attracting universal attention, he raised his eyes towards the chimneys and seemed to be eagerly looking for the sweep. The door of the coach slammed behind the four men. A lively conversation broke out between some of the younger members of the mass meeting, who now felt more at their ease. I say, what a swell coffin! Did you see it? Yes. But did you see that there was no name on it? Wasn't there? No. Didn't you see it? It was quite plain. Why was that, then? Don't you know? Because he was a bastard. The whip cracked, and the coach rumbled off. Falk's eyes strayed to the window. He caught a glimpse of Mrs. Struve, who had already removed some of the sheets, blowing out the candles, and he saw the two cubs standing by the side of her, each with a glass of wine in his hand. The coach rattled along, through street after street. Nobody attempted to speak. Struve, sitting with the coffin on his knees, looked embarrassed. It was still daylight. He longed to make himself invisible. It was a long journey to the churchyard, but it finally came to an end. They arrived. A row of coaches stood before the gate. They brought wreaths, and the gravedigger took possession of the coffin. After a lengthy walk, the small procession stopped quite at the back on the north side of the churchyard, close to a new sandfield. The gravedigger placed the coffin in position. Borg commanded, Hold tight! Ease off! Let go! And the little nameless child was lowered three yards into the ground. There was a pause. All heads were bowed, and all eyes looking into the grave, as if they were waiting for something. A leaden sky gloomed dismally over the large, deserted sandfield, the white poles of which looked like the shadows of little children who had lost their way. The dark wood might have been the background in a magic lantern show. The wind was hushed. All of a sudden a voice rose, tremulous at first, but growing in clearness and intensity, as if it were speaking from an inner conviction. Levi was standing on the paw, bareheaded. In the safe keeping of the Most High, resting in the shadow of His omnipotence, I say to the Eternal, O thou, my stronghold, my defense in all eternity, my God in whom I trust, Kadesh, Lord Almighty God, let thy holy name be worshipped and sanctified in the whole world. Thou wilt in thy own time renew the world. Thou wilt awaken the dead and call them to a new life. Everlasting peace reigns in thy kingdom. Give us all, and Israel, thy peace. Amen. Sleep soundly, little one, to whom no name had been given. He who knoweth his own will give you a name. Sleep soundly in the autumn night. No evil spirits will trouble you. Although you never receive the holy water, rejoice that you are spared the battle of life. 
you can dispense with its pleasures. Count yourself happy that you were permitted to go, before you knew the world. Pure and stainless your soul left its delicate tenement. Therefore we will not throw earth on your coffin, for earth is an emblem of dissolution. We will bed you in flowers, for as a flower pierces the soil, so your soul shall rise from the dark grave to the light. From spirit you came, to spirit you will return. He dropped his reef into the little grave and covered his head. Struve took a few steps towards him, seized his hand, and shook it warmly. Tears rolled down his cheeks, and he begged Levi for the loan of his handkerchief. Borg, after throwing his reef into the grave, turned to go, and the others followed slowly. Falk stood gazing into the open grave, plunged in deep thought. At first he saw only a square of darkness, but gradually a bright spot appeared, which grew and took shape. It looked like a disk, and shone with the whiteness of a mirror. It was the blank shield on which the life of the child should have been recorded. It gleamed brightly in the darkness, reflecting the unbroken daylight. He dropped his reef. There was a faint, dull thud, and the light went out. He turned and followed the others. Arrived at the coach, there was a brief discussion. Borg cut it short. To the restaurant Norbaka, he said briefly. A few minutes later, the party was standing in the large room on the first floor. They were received by a girl whom Borg embraced and kissed. This done, he pushed his hat underneath the sofa, commanded Levi to help him off with his overcoat, and ordered a quart of punch, twenty-five cigars, half a pint of brandy, and a sugar loaf. Finally, he took off his coat and sat down in shirt sleeves on the only sofa in the room. Strew's face beamed when he saw the preparations for an orgy, and he shouted for music. Levi went to the piano and strummed a waltz, while Struve put his arm into Falk's and walked with him up and down the room. He touched lightly on life in general, on grief and joy, the inconstant nature of man, and so on, all of which went to prove that it was a sin to mourn what the gods, he said gods, because he had already said sin and did not wish to be taken for a pious, had given and taken. This reflection was apparently made by way of an introduction to the waltz, which he immediately after danced with the girl who brought the bowl. Borg filled the glasses, called Levi, nodded towards the glass, and said, Let's drink to our brotherly love now. Later on we can be as rude as we like. Levi expressed his appreciation of the honor. Your health, Isaac, said Borg. My name's not Isaac. What the dickens do I care what your name is? I call you Isaac, my Isaac. You're a jolly devil. Devil? Shame on you, Jew. We were going to be as rude as we liked. We? I was, as far as you are concerned. Struve thought he had better interfere. Thank you, Brother Levi, for your beautiful words, he said. What prayer was that? Our funeral prayer. It was beautiful. Nothing but empty words, interposed Borg. The infidel dog prayed only for Israel. Therefore the prayer couldn't have been met for the child. All those who are not baptized are looked upon as belonging to Israel, replied Levi. And then you attack baptism, continued Borg. I don't allow anybody to attack baptism. We can do that ourselves. And furthermore, you attack the doctrine of justification by faith. Leave it alone in future. I don't permit any outsiders to attack our religion. Borg's right there, said Struve. We should draw the line at attacking either baptism or any other of the sacred truths and I must beg of you not to indulge in any frivolous discussion of these things tonight. You must beg of us? sneered Borg. Must you really? All right, I'll forgive you if you'll hold your tongue. Play something, Isaac. Music. Why is music mute at Caesar's feast? Music. But none of your old chestnuts. Play something new. Levi went to the piano and played the overture to The Mute. Now let's talk, said Borg. You are looking depressed, Mr. Falk. Have a glass with me. Fogg, who felt a certain embarrassment in Borg's company, accepted the offer with mental reservations. But conversation languished. Everybody seemed to dread a collision. Struve fluttered about like a moth in search of pleasure, but unable to find it, he again and again returned to the punch table. Every now and then he danced a few steps to keep up the fiction that the meeting was merry and festive. But this was not the case by any means. Levi seesawed between piano and punch, he attempted to sing a cheerful song, but it was so stale that nobody would listen to it. Borg talked at the top of his voice, in order to raise his spirits, as he said, but the party grew more and more silent. One might almost have said uneasy. Falk paced up and down the room, 
taciturn, portentous, like a thundercloud. At Borg's order, a tremendous supper, a sexa, was served. The convives took their seats amidst ominous silence. Struve and Borg drank immoderate quantities of brandy. In the face of the latter, red spots appeared here and there, and the white of the eyes looked yellow. But Struve resembled a varnished Edam cheese. He was uniformly red and greasy. Beside them, Falk and Levi looked like children, eating their last supper in the society of giants. Borg looked at Levi. Hand the salmon to the scandal marger, he commanded, in order to break the monotonous silence. Levi handed the dish to Struve. The latter pushed his spectacles onto his forehead and spat venom. Shame on you, Jew, he foamed, throwing his dinner napkin at Levi's face. Borg laid a heavy hand on Struve's bald pat. Silence, you blackguard, he said. What dreadful company to be mixed up with. Let me tell you, gentlemen, I'm too old to be treated like a schoolboy, said Struve tremulously, forgetting his usual bonhomie. Borg, who had enough to eat, rose from the table. Ugh, he said. What a beastly crowd you are. Pay, Isaac. I'll pay you back later on. I'm going. He put on his overcoat, put his hat on his head, filled a tumbler with punch, added brandy to it, emptied it at one gulp, blew out some of the candles in passing, smashed a few of the glasses, pocketed a handful of cigars and a box of matches, and staggered out of the room. What a pity that such a genius should drink like that, said Levi solemnly. A moment later, Borg re-entered the room, went to the dining table, took the candle of him, lighted his cigar, blew the smoke into Strew's face, put out his tongue, showed his back teeth, extinguished the lights, and departed again. Levi rolled on the floor screaming with laughter. "'To what scum have you introduced me?' asked Falk gravely. "'Oh, my dear fellow, he's intoxicated tonight, but he's the son of Professor Doctor. I didn't ask who his father was. I asked who he was,' said Falk cutting him short. I understand now why you allow such a dog to bully you, but can you tell me why he associates with you? I reserve my reply to all these futilities, answered Struve stiffly. Do reserve it, but reserve it for yourself. What's the matter with you, Brother Levi? asked Struve officiously. You look so grave. It's a great pity that a genius like Borg should drink so much, replied Levi. How and when does he show his genius? asked Falk. A man can be a genius without writing verse said Struve pointedly. I dare say, writing verse does not presuppose genius, nor is a man a genius if he behaves like a brute, said Falk. Hadn't we better pay and go? remarked Struve, hurrying towards the door. Falk and Levi paid. When they stepped into the street, it rained, and the sky was black. Only the reflection of the gaslit town faintly illuminated the sky. The coach had driven away. There was nothing left for them but to turn up their collars and walk. They had gone as far as the Skittle Alley, when they were startled by terrible yells above their heads. "'Curse you!' screamed a voice, and looking up they saw Borg rocking himself on one of the highest branches of a lime tree. The branch nearly touched the ground, but at the next moment it described a tremendous curve upwards. "'Oh! Isn't it colossal?' screamed Levi. "'Colossal! What a madman!' smiled Struve, proud of his protege. "'Come along, Isaac!' Bellow Borg, high up in the air. Come along, Jew. Let's borrow money from each other. How much do you want? asked Levi, waving his pocketbook. I never borrow less than fifty. At the next moment, Borg had slid to the ground and pocketed the note. Then he took off his overcoat. Put it on again immediately, commanded Struve. What do you say? I'm to put it on again? Who are you to order me about? What? Do you want to fight? He smashed his hat against the tree, took off coat and waistcoat and let the rain beat on his shirt. Come here, you rascal. Let's have a fight. He seized Struve around the waist, and staggering backwards, both of them fell into the ditch. Falk hurried away as fast as he could, and for a long time he could hear behind him outbursts of laughter and shouts of bravo. He could distinguish Levi's voice yelling, It's divine! It's colossal! It's colossal! And Borg's, Traitor! Traitor! End of chapter 19